Section 1 of National Geographic Magazine, Volume 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne Spiegel. Discoverers of America. Annual Address by the President, Honorable Gardiner G. Hubbard. Presented before the Society, January 13, 1893. Part 1. It is appropriate that we should take as the theme of our annual address for the year 1892 the discoverers of America. The discovery of America was the work, not of one explorer, but of many, carried on during a long series of years, beginning with the Northmen, continued by Columbus, Vespucius, Magellan, and Drake, and ending only with the 19th century. Before we speak of the discoverers, let us hastily review the condition of the old world prior to the discovery of the new. Two thousand years ago, philosophers generally believed the world to be round, and the most noted of ancient geographers, Eratosthenes, computed its circumference at 25,200 geographic miles. The true figure is 21,600 geographic miles, or 24,899 English miles. Ptolemy, two hundred years later, estimated it at 18,000 geographic miles, and made a series of 26 maps showing the equator and the zones north of the equator with parallels of latitude and meridians of longitude. As his baseline was too short, and his knowledge of places was generally derived only from seamen who had no accurate means of determining distances, his maps, though showing most of the countries of Europe, Asia, and northern Africa, plate 1, were inaccurate, and unreliable, though vastly superior to those of a later date. These maps were either lost sight of, or so changed by the pictorial extravagances of the map-makers of succeeding ages as to be of little value. Plates 2 and 4. St. Augustine, Thomas Aquinas, and other fathers of the Church believed the earth to be a vast plain. They said with Isaiah that the heaven which embraces the universe is a vault, with Job, that it is joined to the earth, and with Moses, that the length of the earth is greater than its breadth. This, they insisted, was the teaching of the word of God, and must be accepted. Those who believed that the world might be round declared that there could be no inhabitants on the other side, for that Christ said, All tribes of the earth shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven, with power and great glory. The famous bull of Alexander the Sixth, published in 1493, which gave all newly discovered land 100 leagues west of the Azores to the Spaniards and east of that line to Portugal, implied that the earth was a plain. For 1,500 years, science and the church were in opposition as to the shape of the earth, and there were very few, whatever might be their convictions, who dared question the infallibility of the church. Thus all progress in natural science was checked, and geography and map-making practically ceased to exist. Early in the 14th century, Marco Polo's book of travels appeared. This greatly increased geographic knowledge and had a direct and strong bearing on the discovery of America. In the preceding century, the father and uncle of Marco Polo, merchants of Venice, made two journeys to the court of the great Khan Kublai in eastern China. On the second journey, Marco Polo accompanied his father and uncle. They went by Persia, over the Pamir Mountains, through Turkestan, across the great desert of Gobi, and through Mongolia to China. There they resided for many years, sent by the Khan on several missions, and occupying important positions. On their return they sailed through the China Sea and Indian Ocean to India, stopping at the Philippine and Spice Islands, Sumatra and Ceylon. From India they traveled by land through Persia and Asia Minor and by the Black and Mediterranean Seas to Venice. Soon after his return, Marco Polo was taken prisoner by the Genoese, and during his captivity wrote an accurate description of the countries through which he traveled, and in which he had lived so many years, and of the islands of Sipango, or Japan, with its inexhaustible riches of gold and pearls, 500 miles east of China. He also described the voyages of the Chinese to the islands of the Pacific, to Ceylon, and to India, and of the rich trade carried on by the Mohammedans between the Spice Islands, 
India, and the Mediterranean. These travels became gradually known to geographers, and in the 15th century gave a new impulse to geographic study. About the same time the old maps of Ptolemy, which had been hopelessly obscured by the graphic fancies of the cosmographers of the Dark Ages, were, with his writings, brought from the east to Italy. The maps of the Dark Ages showed the Mediterranean and the countries around it, Arabia, Persia, Media, Gog and Magog, and a little of northern Africa, but so vaguely and incorrectly that today one would scarcely recognize these countries on existing maps. Toscanelli, an Italian, prepared a map about 1474, taking the travels of Marco Polo as his guide. On other maps, Cathay, or China, had been delineated as east of Europe. Toscanelli's transferred it to the west. His map shows the Atlantic Ocean, Sipango, 100 degrees west of Europe, and still further westward, Cathay. He sent a copy of this map to the King of Portugal, and subsequently another to Columbus, urging him to make his contemplated voyage to the land where the spices are born, where the temples and royal palaces are covered with planks of gold. Plate 3. Let us consider the conditions of Europe at the time of the voyages of the Norsemen to America and the great changes which were gradually preparing the way for the colonization of America. For nearly 1,000 years B.C., the ships of Tyre and Sidon, Alexandria and Greece, sailed through the Mediterranean into the Atlantic Ocean as far as Britain. The early sailors were more adventurous and their ships more seaworthy than those of Columbus. But as the mariner's compass was not known, they rarely ventured out of sight of land. When Rome became the imperial city commerce, as well as dominion and authority, centered in Rome, and with her decline and fall shipping and commerce disappeared from the Mediterranean. Then, far away in the north of the Baltic Sea, the Northmen began to sail the ocean, not for discovery or commerce, but to plunder and ravage richer communities than their own. The Vikings became noted as bold rovers of the sea, pillaging every country they could reach by water. Sailing southwestward, they landed on the coast of France and made a permanent settlement in Normandy. They coasted along the shores of France and Spain, plundering as they went. Passing the Pillars of Hercules into the Mediterranean, they ravaged the coast of Italy and established colonies in southern Italy and Sicily. Sailing westward, they conquered and colonized the eastern coast of England and Scotland, the Shetland, Orkney, and Faroe Islands, and from these islands, in AD 850, they sailed 300 or 400 miles northwestward to Iceland, where they made settlements which have continued until our day. One of the early settlers of Iceland was driven by adverse winds to Greenland, where he was compelled to winter, returning in the spring with an account of his discovery. About 986, Eric the Red, an outlaw, fled from Iceland with a few friends to Greenland. Prevented by the icebergs from landing on the eastern coast, they sailed around Cape Farewell to the western coast, where they founded two small colonies near Juliansburg, which existed for 400 years until, forgotten and neglected by the mother country, overcome by want and hunger, they succumbed to the climate and the attacks of the Eskimo. Shortly after Eric had colonized Greenland, Bjarni, another Northman, sailing for Greenland, was driven by northeasterly winds, continuing for many days far southwestward to a land covered with dense woods. There was every reason to believe that this was America, and that Bjarni was its first discoverer. It was not the land of ice and glaciers he was seeking, so he sailed northeastward again and in ten days reached Greenland. Leif Erikson, one of the Norse Vikings, hearing of this land of woods, about the year 1000, sailed from Greenland in search of it. Passing the barren coasts of Labrador and Newfoundland, which he called Heluland, his party reached Nova Scotia, or Markland, and sailed southward to a place where they found grapes, and hence called it Vinland. They were surprised at the length of the winter days, which were nine hours long. The natives they described resembling our Indians, and not the Eskimo of northern latitudes, and from these statements, and the calculation of latitude from the length of the day, it is believed that it was New England. There they founded the colony of Norumbega, but after a few years it was abandoned, as the settlers were unable to withstand the attacks of the natives. 
all original records of the discovery of Vinland have perished, and our present knowledge is derived from the sagas of the Northmen, written at least one or two generations after Vinland had been abandoned. These legends bear the impress of truth, and there is no reasonable doubt that Leif Erikson was a real character and Vinland his discovery. The sagas were lost, or laid away, and forgotten, in the libraries of Norway and Sweden. In our days some of them have been unearthed, and we know more of the work of Leif Erikson and his Northmen than was ever known before. This discovery was not known beyond Greenland and Iceland, except to a few men in Scandinavia, for this was the darkest age in the history of Europe. When the Northmen were making their settlement in Greenland, Peter the Hermit appeared in southern Europe, mustering his forces for the first of those crusades which, in their ultimate results, accomplished a work of vastly greater importance than the redemption of the holy places from the Mohammedans. The transportation of pilgrims to and from the Holy Land gave employment to the ships of Venice and Genoa, and restored commerce to the Mediterranean. Their vessels brought the treasures of the Orient and the science and art of Greece and Asia Minor to Venice and Genoa, whence they were distributed through Italy and Europe. The feudal system was broken down and the Renaissance brought in. Europe awoke from the long sleep of the Dark Ages to a new life and energy. Progress in art and science became rapid, and the world entered upon an era of invention and discovery. By the middle of the 15th century, Brunelleschi had finished the Duomo at Florence, where Savonarola was preaching, and Michelangelo was studying. Faust and Gutenberg were inventing movable types at Frankfurt, upon which the Bible, the first book ever issued from the printing press, was printed. Gunpowder and the Mariner's Compass were just coming into use in European countries, though both had been discovered earlier. In England, the Wars of the Roses were over. Henry the Seventh was king, and with him the reign of the Tudors, and the prosperity of England commenced. In Spain, Ferdinand and Isabella were preparing for that war with the Moors, which resulted in their expulsion from the Spanish dominion. In Eastern Europe, the Turks had a short time before captured Constantinople and destroyed nearly all the commerce of Venice and Florence, and were now raising an army to ravage Austria and Hungary. In Portugal, Prince Henry the Navigator was making those voyages to the coast of Africa for discovery and trade which made Portugal, for 150 years, the greatest maritime nation of the world. Each year these expeditions sailed further and further southward, passing the Gold Coast, the Equator, the River Congo. They sailed out into the ocean and rediscovered the Azores, Madeira, and the Canary Islands, formerly known to the Phoenicians. In 1442 their ships brought home African Negroes to be sold as slaves in Lisbon, the beginning of the African slave trade. In 1486, Diaz rounded the southern extremity of Africa and called it the Stormy Cape, though Prince Henry named it the Cape of Good Hope. Greater discoveries were made during the lives of men contemporary with Columbus than in all times previous or subsequent. Columbus is for us the principal figure in this new world. He was born in Italy about 1446, although we know with certainty neither the place nor the time of his birth and but little of his early life. He followed the sea for many years, sailing to Africa, England, and probably Iceland. About the year 1470, he is found in Portugal, where some say he was shipwrecked on the coast while on a piratical voyage. Here he married a Portuguese lady, whose father had been governor of one of the islands off the coast of Africa, and there he resided for several years, making maps and pursuing those studies which fitted him for his greatest voyage of discovery. He knew that the spices from the islands of the Indian Ocean, the silks, diamonds, and pearls of India, were carried by the Arabs through the Red Sea or up the Euphrates in boats, and thence by caravans to the Mediterranean and Black Seas, where they were exchanged with the merchants of Venice and Genoa for the goods of Europe. He was convinced, by the study of Marco Polo, not only of the wealth of Sipango and Cathay, and of the great trade between the Orient and the Mediterranean, but also of the possibility of reaching those countries and obtaining that trade for Spain by sailing west, rather than by circumnavigating Africa. The actual distance from Europe in a due west line to Sipango is nearly 12,000 miles. Toscanelli estimated it at 100 degrees, or nearly 5,000 miles, but his map showed islands on the route which would reduce the distance between any two lands to about 2,000 miles. 
Columbus was a devout Catholic, holding to the teachings of the Church. In the book of Esdras, he read that God on the third day of the creation made the earth, six parts of land and one-seventh water. He knew the vast extent of the Atlantic north and south, and reasoning from these facts, he thought it could not be over 2,000 or 25 miles to Sipengo, though he actually sailed 3,230 miles before he reached a new world. After Columbus determined to cross the Atlantic, he applied for help to the king of Portugal. He wrote, They took my charts and writings from me, saying they would ponder them, but secretly they sent out the ships they had denied me. God drove them back on their own coasts and punished their treachery, but I could no longer trust them. He therefore left Portugal for Spain. Las Casas describes him at this time as a man of noble and commanding presence, tall and well-built, with a ruddy complexion, keen, blue-gray eyes that often kindled, while his waving white hair made him quite picturesque, his manner courteous and his conversation charming. He had an indefinable air of authority, as became a man of great heart and lofty thoughts. It was this commanding presence which enabled him to stand before Ferdinand and Isabella as their equal. In 1484 he arrived in Spain, a foreigner, poor and in debt. A stranger and friendless, he appeared at the court of the proudest sovereigns of Europe. Yet such was his bearing, and the effect produced upon the king and queen by his eloquence, that they appointed several learned men to consider his project. Some few believed, many remained in doubt, but most laughed at him as visionary and ridiculed his proposals as the dream of a madman. Those that were convinced by his reasoning became his firm friends. For seven years he waited patiently at the courts, renewing his suit from time to time, until Granada was conquered, when Isabella had promised to listen to him. A man less confident, less in earnest, would have succumbed before the many difficulties and delays he encountered. Again he applied to Isabella, and she agreed to equip a fleet. Columbus demanded that he should be made High Admiral of the Western Seas, and Viceroy and Governor of all the continents and islands which might lay therein, and that he should receive one-eighth of the net profits from all trade with such countries. Isabella refused, but Columbus, knowing that the discovery of a new and shorter route to the Spice Islands would give Spain the control of their trade, and realizing the power and wealth that would accrue to the Spanish throne through such discovery, insisted on his demands, and for this great constancy and loftiness of soul Las Casas commends him. After this refusal, Columbus mounted his mule and started for France, but was soon recalled. He returned to the court which agreed to his demands. A patent was granted appointing Christopher Colon, as soon as he shall have discovered said islands or mainlands in the ocean sea, or any one of them, to be our admirable of the ocean sea, viceroy and governor, in the said islands or mainland. I the queen, I the king. The fleet of Columbus was three small vessels, the largest a single-decked ship ninety feet long, the others with decks only in the stern and prow. His crew was ninety men. On August 6, 1492, they sailed from Palos, and on October 21st they discovered the Indies. Columbus returned to Spain and appeared at the court of Isabella with his train of Indians bearing gold, silver, and precious stones, and other products of the islands he had discovered. It was Cathay, and the shorter route to the Indies he supposed he had found, though he did not find the cities and rich countries of gold and silver, the pearls and jewels that he sought. He thought these treasures lay further westward, and that he must find the Straits of Malacca, and through them sail to the Spice Islands in India, and for that purpose he sailed on his second voyage, and after following the coast of Cuba one thousand miles, believing he had found the continent of Asia, returned to Spain. Ferdinand and Isabella gave many persons the right to visit the newly discovered lands, as was their prerogative, but they also appointed governors over the land and water, contrary to their agreement with Columbus. On his third voyage, in 1498, he reached South America, the first European to discover that continent. He found a large bay and thought he had reached the Straits. But alas, the waters were fresh. It was only the Orinoco River. He coasted for some distance along the shore of the Caribbean Sea, still looking for the Straits, and then set sail for Hispaniola, or Cuba, where he had left his brother governor. On arriving he found his brother deposed and imprisoned. Columbus himself was put in chains and sent home. The captain of the vessel offered to remove his chains, but he refused, 
saying that they had been put on by order of the king and could be removed only by him. While Columbus was vainly searching in the New World for the Orient, Vasco da Gama found it for Portugal in 1497 by sailing around the Cape of Good Hope and crossing the Indian Ocean to India and the Spice Islands. He returned to Lisbon bearing all manner of precious stones, silks and satins, and spices of every kind. Columbus for the time was forgotten, and it was only after a long detention that he was permitted again to sail towards the Western world. On his fourth and last voyage, Columbus landed at Honduras, followed the coast of Nicaragua and the Isthmus of Panama, and then sailed along the Caribbean Sea, vainly searching for the straits that would lead him to the promised land. On his return from this voyage, the queen, his friend, was dead, and their last eighteen months of his life were spent in poverty and sickness at Valladolid, where he died in 1506, so little known that local records of the city, which give many insignificant details, make no mention of his death. After Columbus had opened the way, it was easy for other navigators to follow where he had led. Two other Italians, John Cabot and Sebastian, his son, sailed from England in 1497, nearly due west for Cathay. They discovered Newfoundland, and sailed thence northwestward along the coast of Labrador, and were probably the first discoverers of the continent of America. The next year they made another voyage to Newfoundland, and then followed the coast of North America southward, probably reaching the Carolinas. These voyagers, still seeking Cathay and the Spice Islands, cared little for a land of hills and rocks, where neither gold nor silver was found. Two generations passed before we hear of any further English expeditions to the New World. The most noted of the followers of Columbus was Americus Vespucius, like Columbus and the Cabots, an Italian, a pilot of great reputation, sailing in the service of Portugal. In 1497 he sailed around the Gulf of Mexico, Honduras, Mexico and Florida, and thence along the coast of North America, nearly to Chesapeake Bay. On another voyage he sailed to South America, reaching it a little north of Cape St. Roque. He followed the coast nearly to the mouth of the Rio de la Plata, taking possession of the country for the King of Portugal. Vespucius knew that this country was south of every part of Asia, and therefore could not be a part of the world as then known. He realized that he had discovered a new world. An account of this voyage was published in German, Italian, and French, with the title in the French edition, Novus Mundus. In a map published in 1514, it was called America. Thus the name of Americus Vespucius was given to the New World, and he received the honor due to Columbus. It was said that Columbus had discovered new islands, Vespucius a new world. That world already discovered by Northmen, then by Columbus, the third time by Cabot, and now by Americus Vespucius. End of section 1《Section 2 of National Geographic Magazine, Volume 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne. Discoverers of America by the Honorable Gardiner G. Hubbard. Part 2. After Columbus, Magellan was the greatest of the discoverers of America. Born of a noble Portuguese family, he early entered the naval service and sailed to India, where for seven years he was employed on land and on sea in laying the foundation of the Portuguese empire. He gained a great reputation for his services and returned to Lisbon. Disappointed in an application to the King of Portugal, he went to Spain, where Charles V gladly received him and gave him the command of a fleet of five vessels, in which he set sail for India and the Spice Islands. Magellan, like Columbus and Vespucius, hoped to find a way to India through some strait dividing South America, or, failing in that, by sailing around the mainland. He left Spain in 1518 for Brazil, sailing then southwardly along the coast to about 50 degrees south, where he spent the winter. Three of his captains became discouraged, mutinied, and determined to return. Magellan heard of their treachery. He summoned the leader to his vessel. On his refusal to obey, the officer bearing the summons plunged a dagger into the heart of the mutineer. 
At the same moment, a boat's crew from Magellan's vessel mounted the deck, and the mutiny was over. The other mutineers were either hung or left to perish on the coast of Patagonia. Early in the spring of 1519, the fleet set out again, one vessel having been shipwrecked, and found a channel which proved to be the long-sought passage to India. Three months were spent in exploring the Straits of Magellan before they entered the Pacific Ocean. One of the vessels sent to explore a channel in the Straits deserted and returned to Spain. They sailed along the coast of Patagonia 400 or 500 miles, and then northeastward toward Cathay and the Spice Islands. The wind was light, the ocean was as calm and smooth as an island sea, and they called it the Pacific Ocean. For months their progress was slow, their food failed, scurvy and sickness broke out. Finally they reached the Ladrone Islands and found the food and rest they so much needed. They then sailed for the Philippine Islands, where in a foolish affray with the natives Magellan was killed. But he had finished his work, he had circumnavigated the globe, he had reached the east by sailing west. One of the three vessels which had crossed the Pacific was abandoned and burned in the Philippine Islands, another was lost in the Malaccas. The last, loaded with spice, returned to Spain and finished the most remarkable voyage on record. Of the 280 men who sailed with Magellan in September 1519, only 18 returned in September 1522. The cost of this fleet, with all its equipment, was about $20,000, less than one-half of the cost of the steamer plying between Washington and Mount Vernon. The sale of the spices left a large profit to Charles V, and the merchants who had furnished the funds for the adventure. The King of Spain gave the heirs of Ferdinand Magellan for their coat of arms a terrestrial globe belted with the legend, Primus circumdedisti me, thou first encompassed me. In 1513, Vasco Nunez Balboa, a Spaniard who had married an Indian princess, heard, from the natives, of the Pacific Ocean and of the land of the Incas, where gold, silver, and precious stones abounded. On September 25th, from the top of the mountains, he looked down on the Pacific Ocean, the first European to behold it. He collected a few vessels on the Atlantic coast for a voyage of discovery to Peru, and, taking them to pieces, he carried them across the isthmus and launched them on the Pacific. Two thousand Indians, we are told, perished in this work. When nearly ready to sail, he was recalled by the governor of Darien and beheaded. After the death of Balboa, Francisco Pizarro, one of his followers, returned to Spain with an account of the land of the Incas, and in 1529 was made governor and captain-general of this country, then called the province of New Castile, with leave to fit out at his own expense an expedition to conquer that territory. He left Panama with three ships, 180 men and 27 horses, but it was not until two years later that they landed in Peru, and began that contest which resulted in the overthrow of the Incas, and in loading with riches the meanest of Pizarro's followers. The civilization of the Incas, the highest type in America, was crushed. The Spaniards soon after this conquest sailed still further southward, along the coast of Peru and Chile, even to the Straits of Magellan. Rumors of an El Dorado beyond the Andes came to Pizarro. One of his followers, Orolano, was sent to cross the Andes and descend to the headwaters of the Amazon, but he could not find the promised land. His party, famished and decimated by the fatigue of the journey and unable to return to the Pacific, built a boat and floated down the Amazon River 4,000 miles to its mouth. Before the discovery of Peru by Pizarro, Sebastian Cabot, with a small Spanish fleet, in 1527, sailed up the Rio de la Plata to the great falls of the Parana. He found some silver and gold mines in Brazil, and heard of the civilization and riches of the Incas of Peru, but was unable to cross the mountains to their country. Thus, within fifty years after the discovery of America, South America had been circumnavigated, its great rivers navigated, and the general features of the interior and its treasures of gold and silver made known to the Spaniards and the Portuguese. Some time before the conquest of Peru, the Spaniards heard rumors of the great city of the Montezumas. In March, 1519, Hernando Cortez, one of the most daring and able of the adventurous Spaniards, landed on the coast of Mexico with ten vessels, six hundred to seven hundred soldiers, eighteen horsemen, and some cannon. 
he burnt his ships, thus cutting off all retreat, and then marched toward the city of Mexico. By his courage, address, and strategy, he conquered, or made friends, of several tribes of Indians hostile to Montezuma. He pushed onward to the city of Mexico, where he was received with great pomp by Montezuma and escorted into the city as his friend and guest. Soon after Cortez, learning that Montezuma was preparing to attack the invaders, visited him in his palace, and by persuasion and force took him to the Spanish quarters and kept him a prisoner. Some time later the Indians chose another king and attacked the Spaniards, but after a slight success were defeated with great loss. Then Cortez, having captured and fortified the city of Mexico, defeated the other tribes and subdued the whole country. He subsequently explored it to the Gulf of California and Lower California, on the other side of the Gulf. He then returned to Spain, but was not received by Charles V as he expected. Forcing his way to the royal presence, Cortez replied to Charles, who wished to know who the intruder was, I am the man who has given you more provinces than your father left you cities. There is no tale in the history of the world more marvelous than the conquest of Peru and Mexico, when we consider the high culture and strength of the natives, the small number of Europeans engaged, the extent of the conquests, and the value of the treasures obtained. The Spanish discoverers of America were men of marked ability, capable of enduring privations of every kind, prompt in action, prepared for every emergency, proud, brave, and self-reliant to the verge of rashness, eager for adventures, cruel, unscrupulous, and rapacious, of unbounded greed and ambition. They sought and found gold and silver in Peru and Mexico in such quantities as they had never dreamed of. The new world brought to Spain greater wealth and glory than Columbus ever expected to find in Cathay or the Spice Islands. Spain, it is said, drew from America during the sixteenth century seven hundred millions of dollars in gold and silver, a sum fully equal to ten times as much in purchasing power at the time as it would be today. In the exploration of North America the Spaniards took little interest. What need have we, they said, of things which are common to all the countries of Europe? To the south, to the south of the great and exceeding riches of the equinoctial. They that seek riches must not go into the cold and frozen north. The French, though they made some remarkable journeys in the continent of North America, furnished but one discoverer whom we shall notice. Jacques Cartier, a French navigator who was appointed in 1534 by Francis I to the command of two ships for exploring the district near the fishing grounds of Newfoundland. He sailed up the St. Lawrence and took possession of Canada for France, erecting a wooden cross with the inscription, Viva la Roy de France. In 1541, a settlement was made near Quebec, the commencement of the French colonization in Canada. The English were far behind the Spanish and Portuguese in the exploration of America. Their first great voyagers after the Cabots were slavers, buccaneers, and pirates. Their most noted commanders were John Hawkins and Francis Drake, who carried a cargo of Negro slaves from Africa to the West Indies and sold them at an enormous profit. They there heard of the Spanish galleons bearing the treasures of Peru and Mexico to Spain, and of the cruelties with which English seamen, taken prisoners, had been treated. On their return, fleets were equipped and sent to the Gulf of Mexico to capture the treasure ships and avenge the wrongs of the English sailors. The Queen frequently furnished ships belonging to the Royal Navy. They were equipped by Raleigh and other English noblemen, and the prizes were divided between the crew, officers, nobles, and Queen the Queen obtaining the largest share. Sir Francis Drake, one of the boldest and most successful of these cruisers, on one trip overhauled and plundered over two hundred vessels and pillaged towns and cities. Several times Philip II of Spain demanded his surrender as a pirate, for during all this time the two nations were at peace. The Queen hesitated and delayed, but never yielded to the demand. There and then the foundation was laid of the navy and seamen of Great Britain. In 1577, Drake was summoned to a private audience with the Queen, at which it was agreed that a fleet of five ships would be equipped, nominally for the Mediterranean, but really for the South Seas, as the Pacific Ocean was then called, to capture the great galleons, the treasure ships of Spain, and that the Queen should contribute 1,000 crowns to the cost. On August 20th, 1578, Drake, with this fleet, reached the Straits of Magellan and sailed through them in two weeks into the Pacific. 
There they encountered long and terrific storms, which carried them far south of the straits. One of Drake's vessels had been broken up for firewood, another swamped in his sight, and the third deserted and returned to England. On the fifty-third day of the tempest, Drake found himself south of Cape Horn, where no other vessel had ever sailed. Here, according to all the maps, was the great Austral Continent, which extended an unbroken land area from the Straits of Magellan to the Antarctic Pole. But he found only water. Before him rolled the waters of the Atlantic and Pacific in one great flood. He walked to the end of the farthest island, lay down, and with his arms embraced the southernmost ground of the New World. Then the weather changed, and all went well. He sailed along the coast of South America, captured Valparaiso, took all the treasures he could find, refitted and provisioned his ships, and sailed northward, taking treasure ships and plundering cities, until his vessel could carry no more, although it was ballasted with silver and gold. Instead of returning as he had come, Drake determined to seek and find the fabulous strait so long sought by Columbus, and by that channel find his way home. He followed the coast from Central America northward to the latitude of Vancouver, and took possession of the land for England, calling it New Albion. Then finding the coast still trending to the northwestward, and the weather growing more and more severe, he gave up his attempt, landed at the harbor of San Francisco, refitted his ships, and returned home by the Cape of Good Hope, reaching Plymouth in September 1580, the second man to circumnavigate the world. What his reception would be at home was questionable. The news of his exploits had reached Spain the year before, and the ambassador of Philip demanded that he should be executed as a pirate, and renewed the demand as soon as he heard of the explorer's return. The result of this demand was for some time doubtful, but when it was heard that a Spanish hostile fleet had landed on the Irish coast, the Queen determined to support Drake and receive her share of the spoils. What they were we are not told, but they must have been very great, as Drake's share was ten thousand pounds, equal to four hundred thousand dollars of our money today. This voyage of Drake completed the discovery of America from the northern coast of Labrador, southward around Cape Horn, and northward to forty-eight degrees, the latitude of Vancouver Island. Nearly one hundred years elapsed from the first voyage of Columbus to the voyage of Drake, each of whom vainly sought a way through America, the one from the Atlantic to the Pacific, the other from the Pacific to the Atlantic. Thus, before the end of the sixteenth century, the whole continent of America, save the Arctic border, had been circumnavigated, and the southern part of it colonized, but it was not until after another century and another age that another race found homes for themselves on the coast of North America. The voyages of the discoverers of America gradually became known to the public. It is interesting and instructive to examine the early maps representing these voyages to see how slowly the geography of the New World became known. On the Zeni map of 1400, published in 1558, Greenland is connected with Norway. The same connection is shown in the Claudius Clavis map of 1427, in the Portuguese Mapamonde of 1490, and even in the Ptolemy map by Walt C. Mueller in 1513. While in the map of Europe, at the end of the Chronicon Nurembergensi in 1493, Greenland is shown as an isthmus connecting Norway and Sweden with Russia. One of the first maps drawn after the discovery of America was that made in 1500 by Juan de la Cosa, a celebrated pilot and cartographer who accompanied Columbus on his first and second voyages, and Vespucius on his first voyage. It delineated parts of the eastern coasts of South America and North America, showing by the flags of Spain, England, and Portugal the coast explored by the ships of each country. On that part of the map between North America and South America, Columbus is drawn as St. Columbus bearing the Christ child on his shoulders. The figure thus fulfills a double purpose of honoring Columbus and covering the undiscovered portions of the continent. On the Cantino chart of 1501 to 1502, South America is delineated as surrounded by water from about 30 degrees south to the Isthmus of Darien, then Cuba, the West India Islands, and the coast of North America from 37 degrees to 54 degrees north. There is no land connecting North America and South America. On the Rush map of 1508, two years after the death of Columbus, Greenland and Labrador are connected with Asia the New World appears as an island near the equator. On the Lenox Globe, 
so-called, made about the year 1510, now in the Lenox Library in New York, South America is a large island, while North America is represented by a number of detached islands. On the map attributed to Leonardo da Vinci, 1514, the name America appears for the first time, and is given to a large island on the equator. Florida is the name of another island northwest of America. On the Schoener Globes of 1515 and 1520, North America and South America are two islands, while the southern part of America is separated by straits from the Antarctic continent, and on the globe of 1520 the city of Mexico is identified as Quince of Marco Polo. On the Hauslob globe of 1516 to 1517, the name America is given to South America. Straits connecting the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans separate North America from South America. On the Maiolo map of 1527, South America, including the Isthmus of Panama, appears an island separated by the Strato Cubitoro from North America. On the Munster map of 1532, South America is an island with a strait between it and Cuba, leading to the Pacific Ocean, while on the Munster map of 1540, North America and South America are connected by an isthmus. On the Paris Gilt Globe, about 1525, Greenland is an island, Labrador and Terra Florida form parts of Asia, while the Gulf of Mexico is fairly delineated, with Cathay on its western shore. The Schoener Globe of 1533 is much the same in the middle latitudes, while the Paris Wooden Globe, about 1535, represents Greenland, Labrador, and Florida as belonging to Asia, the Gulf of Mexico as the Mar Catherum, and South America as a peninsular extension of the Asiatic mainland. On the map of Orontius Phineas, 1537, thirty years after the death of Columbus, Greenland is an island, Labrador and the coast of North America are attached to the northern part of Asia, Cathay appears on the Gulf of Mexico, and South America is connected with the southeastern part of Asia. This map was made nearly twenty years after Magellan had circumnavigated the world. On the Gastaldi Carto Marina of 1548, Greenland is connected with Norway on the east, and Labrador with America on the west. North America and South America are connected, and the Austral continent is shown south of the Straits of Magellan. There was no map published until after the 16th century that gave a correct delineation of the seacoast of America. It is no wonder that Columbus never comprehended the nature or extent of his discoveries. The more we study the history and geography of the times, the influence of the church, the difficulty of determining longitude, the ignorance of the movements of the mariner's compass and of the distance to Cipango, the greater will be our admiration for Columbus. Yet a recent writer speaks of the discovery of Columbus as a blunder, and others say, as if in disparagement of his work, that he knew of the discoveries of the Northmen and was only following their track, that the chart of Toscanini which Columbus took on his first voyage indicated clearly his route, that Columbus died in the belief that he had discovered Cipango and Cathay, never realizing that it was the New World, and that Americus Vespucius is entitled to the greater credit. Let us hear the opinion of a contemporary of Columbus, Sebastian Cabot. When news was brought that Don Christopher Colon, the Genoese, had discovered the coasts of India, whereon was great talk in all the court of King Henry the Seventh, who then reigned, all men with great admiration affirmed it to be a thing more divine than humane to sail by the west into the east, where the spices grow, by a chart that was never before known. It is very doubtful if Columbus knew anything of the voyages of the Northmen, nor would such knowledge have been of much value, for Greenland was then believed to be a part of Europe and joined to Norway. If Columbus had known of the discoveries and sought the countries they had found, he would have sailed northwestward instead of westward. Many before Toscanini and Columbus believed the world to be round, and that by sailing westward Asia might be reached, believed but proved it. He made no blunder, for he sought land the other side of the Atlantic, and he found it. This Pusius knew little more than Columbus of the New World, and never realized that North America and South America were one continent. The maps show that learned geographers long after the discoveries of Columbus, Vespucius, Cabot, and Magellan did not understand the geography of the New World. All voyages before that of Columbus had been coasting voyages, the sailors keeping in sight of land. Columbus pushed out into the unknown and trackless ocean, leaving land far behind. 
good seamen were unwilling to undertake so terrible a voyage, so convicts were obtained, liberated from prison on condition of sailing with Columbus. A brave, resolute, and self-contained spirit was necessary to command such a crew on such an expedition. New wonders startled him each day. The magnetic needle, instead of pointing steadily northward, swerved toward the west. The wind for many days blew unvaryingly from the east, and the sailors thought it would prevent them from returning. The Saragossa Sea puzzled them. They daily grew more timid as they sailed further and further into the ocean, though they had sailed much further than they had supposed. No voyage like that was ever made before, and none like it can ever be made again, for the great discoverer solved the problem and reached the east by sailing west. How like a tragedy the life of Columbus! Twelve years of preparation and waiting, five in Portugal and seven at the court of Isabella, his demand, its rejection, his recall, his departure from Palos with three small vessels, his triumphant return after the discovery of America, admiral and governor, sent home in chains, his death, poor, unknown, and forgotten. Contrast this with what has recently taken place at Palos. Last September, 1892, the greatest warships of the world from Spain, Italy, Germany, Great Britain, and the United States, propelled by a power unknown to Columbus, escorted from the harbor of Palos three little ships, two without decks, fashioned after the ships of Columbus. At the time of Columbus's death, none to honor him. Now all Europe and the New World unite in rendering him the greatest homage ever paid to man. End of section 2section three of the national geographic magazine volume five this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the movements of our population by henry gannett presented before the society december nine eighteen ninety two part one the total population by the movement of population is to be understood its numerical increase its geographic distribution over the country and its composition as regards sex race and nativity not only at present but in past times this is a broad subject and in an attempt to compress it within the limits of a single paper it will be impossible to go deeply into details I shall attempt only to develop the principal features and to bring out their mutual relations. The first permanent settlement within the original area of the United States was made at Jamestown, Virginia, in 1607, the next at Plymouth, in 1620. These were followed nine years later by the settlements at Salem and Boston. In 1623, the Dutch settled at New York. From 1631 to 1634, colonies were established on Kent Island and St. Mary's on the shore of Chesapeake Bay, and in 1638 at Wilmington, Delaware. In 1664, settlements were established at Elizabeth, New Jersey, and on Cape Fear River, North Carolina, and six years later on Ashley River, North Carolina. The settlements in Pennsylvania began in 1681. It was not until 1733 that settlement was established in the present state of Georgia, in the neighborhood of what is now the city of Savannah. The early colonies suffered many hardships and dangers and grew but slowly. Bancroft estimates their people at approximately 200,000 in 1688, three quarters of a century from the time of the first settlement. He estimates the population in 1750, nearly a century and a half after the first settlement, at 1,260,000. Ten years later, in 1760, it was 1,695,000. In 1770, it was 2,312,000. And in 1780, 2,945,000. Thus, at the outbreak of the Revolution, the population of the colonies was probably not far from 2,500,000, of which it is estimated that 2 million were whites and 500,000 blacks. 
In 1790, the first census of the United States was taken. From that time to the present, a census has been taken every ten years. For a century, therefore, we have a trustworthy record of our numbers. Starting a century ago with 3,929,214 inhabitants, we have gone ahead by great leaps as shown in the following table and diagram until our country contains today 62,622,250 people. Population of the United States by decades. Census years. Population. Percent of increase. Census year. 1790. Population. 3,929,214. Census year. 1800. Population. 5,308,483, percent of increase, 35.10. Census year, 1810, population, 7,239,881, percent of increase, 36.38. Census year, 1820, population, 9,633,822, Percent of increase, 33.06. Census year, 1830. Population, 12,866,020. Percent of increase, 33.55. Census year, 1840. Population, 17,069,453. Percent of increase, 32.67. Census year, 1850. Population, 23,191,876. Percent of increase, 35.86. Census year, 1860. Population, 31,443,321. Percent of increase, 35.57. Census year, 1870. Population, 38,558,000. 371. Percent of increase, 22.66. Census year, 1880. Population, 50,155,783. Percent of increase, 30.07. Census year, 1890. Population, 62,622,250. Percent of increase, 24.85. The diagram, plate 6, shows by the lengths of the bars the population as returned at each census. The difference between their absolute lengths representing the numerical increase from census to census and their relative lengths the proportional increase. In the first 25 years the population doubled. In the second 25 years it doubled again, the population in 1840 being four times that in 1790. But in recent years, the rate of increase has diminished. Instead of doubling in the last 25 years as it did in the first half century of our history, it has required 30 years, the population in 1890 being almost precisely double that in 1860. In the early decades of our history, the rate of increase ranged from 36 to 32 percent. Between 1840 and 1850, it rose again suddenly to nearly 36%, owing to the first rush of immigration. Between 1860 and 1870, the check due to the Civil War is strongly emphasized. The rates of increase shown by the figures are extremely large as compared with those of European nations, many times larger than that of France, several times larger than that of Great Britain, and greatly in excess of that of Germany. Indeed, in rapidity of growth, no other civilized nation of history has ever approached this country. While in the past 30 years this country has doubled its population, France has increased but 3%, Great Britain and Ireland 29%, and Prussia 62%. Since 1797, Prussia has increased in number from 8,700,000 to 30 million, 
while this country has increased from four or five millions to sixty two million six hundred twenty two thousand two hundred fifty nor is this tremendous increase due in any great degree to immigration since in all probability as shown later the earlier rates of increase would have been nearly maintained by the excess of births over deaths had there been no immigration while in the united states as a whole the population has increased during the century at this marvelous rate individual states show the widest possible range in their rates of increase as a group the thirteen original states have never gained so rapidly as the united states as a whole their rate of increase has always been smaller than that of the country the reason for this is that throughout our history these states have furnished the brain and brawn for the settlement of the west there has been a continuous stream of emigration from the Atlantic border to the Mississippi Valley, the Plains, the Rocky Mountains, and the Pacific Slope. Millions upon millions of young men and women of the East have left their homes to found empires in the West. In the northeastern states, this drain has since 1847 been in large part made up by foreign immigration, and thus has the character of the inhabitants of these states in great measure been changed from the pure English stock of revolutionary times. In the South, there has been no flood of immigration, and the losses which these states have sustained have been repaired only in part by the fecundity of the people. On the other hand, in the newer states where settlement began since we became a nation, the rate of increase of population was at first extremely large, and then diminished down to the present time but it has not diminished uniformly or continuously because of certain disturbing elements. In the progress of settlement of this and perhaps other countries, there is a certain order or sequence in the occupations followed by the majority of the people, an order which accompanies and is closely related to the increasing density of the population. After the pioneers or hunters, trappers, etc., commonly follow herdsmen and ranchmen as the first settlers. The raising of cattle, which requires a wide range of country for pasturage, is the prominent industry of a newly opened territory. Then farmers come and gradually crowd the herdsmen out. The land is occupied in small parcels and affords sustenance to a much larger number, but the time ultimately arrives when the population becomes too dense for profitable farming and a portion of the people, taking the hint given them by the increasing hardness of the times, enter other avocations, and so manufactures and commerce take their beginnings and gradually grow and multiply until the farmer finds himself in the minority. The body of people are engaged in making things instead of raising things. Now, when a nation or state approaches the limit in density of population of successful farming, it does not pass easily and freely into a manufacturing community. There is more or less trouble. There are hard times and a depreciation of values for a while. It is a sort of dead point in the machinery. But when the change is effected, or on the way to be effected, prosperity once more beams upon the community. This is not an ideal case. We have before us in the states of Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, and Iowa, and in parts of adjacent states, examples of communities which are now passing through just such a crisis. The growth of population in these states is at present very slow. The farmers are getting crowded, while other industries are not sufficiently advanced to take their place. A quarter of a century ago, southern New England was in that situation, but has now emerged from it, and having become a manufacturing section, is exceedingly prosperous and the population is increasing again with great rapidity the increase being essentially urban this change involves more than a mere change of avocations to these states it involves a shrinkage of farm values enormous in total amount the gathering of the people together in cities and an enormous increase in values therein the settled area now let us trace the spread of the population over our domain as it has increased in number. Its progress across the continent 
is indicated by the maps, plate 7, representing the status of settlement at the beginning and end of the century. The colored area on each map represents the settled area of the country at each date, it being understood that by the term settled area is meant all that country which contains two or more inhabitants to the square mile, anything less than that being regarded as unsettled. But first a word about our territorial limits. In 1790, our territory was limited on the west by the Mississippi River and on the south by the northern line of Florida. In 1803, the enormous territory of Louisiana was added by purchase, and shortly thereafter, Oregon was acquired by prior settlement. In 1821, Florida was acquired from Spain. In 1845, Texas, having achieved its independence from Mexico, was admitted as a state. In 1848, the southwestern territories were acquired from Mexico by the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, and in 1853, the Gadsden Purchase completed the territory of the United States as it exists at present, with the exception of the detached territory of Alaska. In 1790, we find settlement stretching continuously along the Atlantic coast from Maine to Georgia, and occupying the greater part of the Atlantic plain. At several points, it stretches feebly westward, up the Mohawk River in New York, crossing the mountains in Pennsylvania and Maryland, and stretching down the Appalachian Valley in eastern Tennessee, while in northern Kentucky, in the neighborhood of Cincinnati, quite a body of settlement has appeared, isolated from the rest. Each succeeding decade has seen the frontier line pushed westward, crossing the Appalachians, stretching gradually across the great valley of the Mississippi and climbing the plains. With every succeeding census, we see new isolated bodies of settlement off beyond the frontier at points where the exceeding fertility of the soil, facilities for Indian trading, or valuable mines have attracted the pioneers. These centers have grown and spread until their margins have touched the main frontier line and they have become merged in the great body of population. In two or three instances, bodies of population which have grown up under foreign powers have fallen under our jurisdiction by the acquisition of territory. Among these are the old French-Spanish settlements of southern Louisiana, the American-Spanish settlements in Texas, and the Spanish settlements of New Mexico, Arizona, and California. In 1860, settlements of magnitude first appeared in the Rocky Mountains and on the Pacific coast. Those in California consisted of gold hunters, and those in Utah of Mormons. In 1870, these settlements had spread widely. To the gold hunters of California had been added thousands of farmers who were subduing the broad acres of the Sacramento Valley. The Mormons had increased and multiplied, and gold hunters had spread into Idaho and Montana. The second of these maps, Plate 7, Figure 2, representing the status of settlement in 1890, marks an epoch in the history of our settlement. The frontier line has disappeared. The settlements in the far west have spread and joined one another. The settlements from the east have traveled up the plains and have joined those in the mountains at many points, so that the settled area has become the rule and the unoccupied places the exception. It will soon be useless to advise young men to go west and grow up with the country, for the country is rapidly growing up. Percent of increase of settled area and of population. Census years, area, population. Percent of increase, area, population. Census year, 1790. Area, 239,935. Population, 3,929,214. Census year, 1800. Area, 305,708. Population, 5,308,483. Percent of increase, area, 27.41. Percent of increase, population, 35.10. Census year, 1810. Area, 407,945. 
population seven million two hundred thirty nine thousand eight hundred eighty one percent of increase area thirty three point four four percent of increase population thirty six point three eight census year eighteen twenty area five hundred eight thousand seven hundred seventeen population nine million six hundred thirty three thousand eight hundred twenty two percent of increase area twenty four point seven zero percent of increase population thirty three point oh seven census year eighteen thirty area six hundred thirty two thousand seven hundred seventeen population twelve million eight hundred sixty six thousand twenty percent of increase area twenty four point three eight percent of increase population thirty three point five five census year eighteen forty area eight hundred seven thousand two hundred ninety two population seventeen million sixty nine thousand four hundred fifty three percent of increase area twenty seven point five nine percent of increase population thirty two point six seven census year eighteen fifty area nine hundred seventy nine thousand two hundred forty nine population twenty three million one hundred ninety one thousand eight hundred seventy six percent of increase area twenty one point three zero percent of increase population thirty five point eight seven census year eighteen sixty area one million one hundred ninety four thousand seven hundred fifty four population thirty one million four hundred forty three thousand three hundred twenty one percent of increase area twenty two point oh one percent of increase population thirty five point five eight census year eighteen seventy area one million two hundred seventy two thousand two hundred thirty nine population thirty eight million five hundred fifty eight thousand three hundred seventy one percent of increase area six point four nine percent of increase population twenty two point six three census year eighteen eighty area one million five hundred sixty nine thousand five hundred seventy population fifty million one hundred fifty five thousand seven hundred eighty three percent of increase area twenty three point three seven percent of increase population thirty point zero eight census year eighteen ninety area one million nine hundred forty seven thousand two hundred eighty five population sixty two million six hundred twenty two thousand two hundred fifty percent of increase area twenty four point zero six percent of increase population twenty four point eight six the settled area at each census has been measured and the results compared one with another the table presents the rates of increase of the settled area compared with one another and also with the rate of increase of the population it is seen that while the settled area has increased at a rapid rate the population has increased in each case still more rapidly center of population the distribution of the population is summarized in the position of the center of population and its movements are likewise summarized by the movements of this center the center of population is the center of gravity of all the inhabitants of the country computed under the assumption that each individual is of the same weight and presses downward with a force proportional to his distance from the center in seventeen ninety this center of population was located near baltimore in the northern part of chesapeake bay in the century which has elapsed this center has moved westward decade by decade the stages ranging from thirty six to eighty one miles with an average of about fifty miles per decade now it varies northward a trifle in its western course as the weight of settlement has been attracted northward and again southward perhaps by the addition of texas with its body of americo mexican people but generally keeping a consistent course toward the setting sun in one hundred years it has moved westward 
505 miles. In 1890, it rested for the time in the southern part of Indiana, near Greensburg, still far, however, indeed, many degrees of longitude from the geographic center of the United States, which is in northern Kansas, midway between its eastern and western lines. It will doubtless be centuries before the center of population will approach the center of area of the country. Position of the center of population in each decade. Census years, north latitude, west longitude, approximate location by important towns, westward movement during preceding decade. Census year, 1790, north latitude, 39 degrees, 16.5 minutes, west longitude, 76 degrees, 11.2 minutes, approximate location by important towns, 23 miles east of Baltimore, Maryland. Census year, 1800, north latitude, 39 degrees, 16.1 minutes, west longitude, 76 degrees, 56.5 minutes, approximate location by important towns, 18 miles west of Baltimore, Maryland, westward movement during preceding decade, 41 miles, census year, 1810, north latitude, 39 degrees, 11.5 minutes, west longitude, 77 degrees, 37.2 minutes, approximate location by important towns, 40 miles northwest by west of Washington, District of Columbia, westward movement during preceding decade, 36 miles, census year, 1820, north latitude, 39 degrees, 5.7 minutes, West longitude, 78 degrees, 33.0 minutes. Approximate location by important towns, 16 miles north of Woodstock, Virginia. Westward movement during preceding decade, 50 miles. Census year, 1830. North latitude, 38 degrees, 57.9 minutes. West longitude, 79 degrees, 16.9 minutes. Approximate location by important towns, 19 miles west-southwest of Moorfield, West Virginia. Westward movement during preceding decade, 39 miles. Census year, 1840. North latitude, 39 degrees, 2.0 minutes. West longitude, 80 degrees, 18.0 minutes. Approximate location by important towns, 16 miles south of Clarksburg, West Virginia. Westward movement during preceding decade, 55 miles. Census year, 1850. North latitude, 38 degrees, 59.0 minutes. West longitude, 81 degrees, 19.0 minutes. Approximate location by important towns, 23 miles southeast of Parkersburg, West Virginia. Westward movement during preceding decade, 55 miles. Census year, 1860. North latitude, 39 degrees, 0 0.4 minutes. West longitude, 82 degrees, 48.8 minutes. Approximate location by important towns, 20 miles south of Chillicothe, Ohio. Westward movement during preceding decade, 81 miles. Census year, 1870. North latitude, 39 degrees, 12.0 minutes. West longitude, 83 degrees, 35.7 minutes. Approximate location by important towns, 48 miles east by north of Cincinnati, Ohio. Westward movement during preceding decade, 42 miles. Census year, 1880. North latitude, 39 degrees, 4.1 minutes. West longitude, 84 degrees, 39.7 minutes. Approximate location by important towns, 8 miles west by south of Cincinnati, Ohio. Westward movement during preceding decade, 58 miles. Census year, 1890. North latitude, 39 degrees, 11.9 minutes. West longitude, 85 degrees, 32.9 minutes. 
approximate location by important towns, 20 miles east of Columbus, Indiana. Westward movement during preceding decade, 48 miles. The above table and plate 8 show the position and movement of the center of population during each decade. Density of population. The following table shows the density of the population or the average number of people to the square mile at each census. Density of population by decades. Census years, area, density. Census year, 1790, area, 827,844, density, 4.75. Census year, 1800, area, 827,844, density, 6.41. Census year, 1810, area, 1,999,775, density, 3.62. Census year, 1820, Area, 1,999,775. Density, 4.82. Census year, 1830. Area, 2,059,043. Density, 6.25. Census year, 1840. Area, 2,059,043. Density, 8.29. Census year, 1850. Area, 2,980,959. Density, 7.78. Census year, 1860. Area, 3,026,500. Density, 10.39. Census year, 1870. Area, 3,603,884. Density, 10.70. Census year, 1880. Area, 3,603,884. Density, 13.92. Census year, 1890. Area, 3,603,884. Density, 17.37. The map. Plate 9, Figure 1, shows the density of population in 1890 by states. In southern New England, that is, in Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and Connecticut, the average density of population is as great as in many old European countries. Indeed, in Rhode Island, there are 318 inhabitants to the square mile. In Massachusetts, 278. And in New Jersey, 193. These are all manufacturing states. In the agricultural states of the South, the density ranges up as high as 41 in Virginia and 46 in Kentucky, while in the agricultural states of the Mississippi Valley, we find a density of 68 in the state of Illinois and 61 in Indiana, the average being in the neighborhood of 40 to the square mile. Urban Population in the term urban population, the census office includes the inhabitants of all cities of 8,000 or more. Of course, this definition is entirely arbitrary, and it may well be that urban conditions exist in places much smaller than this. Still, whatever limit is adopted, the conclusions to be drawn from historical comparisons hold equally good. The following table shows the urban population and the proportion which this bears to the total population at each census. Census years, population of the United States, population of cities, inhabitants of cities in each 100 of the total population. Census year, 1790, population of the United States, 3,929,214, population of cities, 131,472. Inhabitants of cities in each 100 of the total population, 3.35. Census year, 1800. Population of the United States, 5,308,483. Population of cities, 210,873. Inhabitants of cities in each 100 of the total population, 3.25.
3.97. Census year, 1810. Population of the United States, 7,239,881. Population of cities, 356,920. Inhabitants of cities in each 100 of the total population, 4.93. Census year, 1820. Population of the United States, 9,633,822. Population of cities, 475,135. Inhabitants of cities in each 100 of the total population, 4.93. Census year, 1830. Population of the United States, 12,866,020. Population of cities, 864,509. Inhabitants of cities in each 100 of the total population, 6.72. Census year, 1840. Population of the United States, 17,069,453. Population of cities, 1,453,994. Inhabitants of cities in each 100 of the total population, 8.52. Census year, 1850. Population of the United States, 23,191,876. Population of cities, 2,897,586. Inhabitants of cities in each 100 of the total population, 12.49. Census year, 1860. Population of the United States, 31,443,321. Population of cities, 5,072,256. Inhabitants of cities in each 100 of the total population, 16.13. Census year, 1870. Population of the United States, 38,558,371. Population of cities, 8,071,875. Inhabitants of cities in each 100 of the total population, 20.93. Census year, 1880. Population of the United States, 50,155,783. Population of cities, 11,318,547. Inhabitants of cities in each 100 of the total population, 22.57. Census year, 1890. Population of the United States, 62,622,250. Population of cities, 18,235,670. Inhabitants of cities in each 100 of the total population, 29.12. A century ago, this country contained but six cities having a population of more than 8,000 each, and the urban population constituted but 3.35%, or about one thirty-third of the entire population of the country. Today, the number of such cities is 443, and their population 18 and a quarter millions, which is 29%, or not very much less than one-third of the entire population. The total population is about 16 times as great as it was a 100 years ago, while the urban population is 139 times as great. It has grown eight times as fast as the total population. This aggregation of the people in the cities is a natural and necessary result of the increasing density of population and of the consequent change in avocations, which was discussed above. It has gone on in this country at a constantly accelerating rate, and the acceleration will probably be in the future even more marked than in the past, as a greater part of our domain reaches and passes in density of population the limit of successful agriculture. Referring to the map, Plate 9, Figure 2, which shows the proportion of urban to total population, it is seen that the urban population of the country is confined almost entirely to the northern states, especially those on the Atlantic border. Indeed, in Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Connecticut, New York, and New Jersey, the urban element is in the majority, 
and in Rhode Island more than three-fourths of the people live in its cities, while, on the other hand, the proportion in North Carolina, Mississippi, and Arkansas is but trifling, being less than 5% in each case. Now, if the urban element be subtracted from the total population, there is left what may be broadly characterized as the rural element. Plate 6 shows by the total length of the bars the population of the United States at each census, the shaded portion of each bar representing the urban population at each date, while the unshaded portion remaining represents the rural population. This element, which in the early decades increased nearly as rapidly as the total population, has in later years increased much more slowly. Indeed, during the past ten years, its rate of increase was not much more than half that of the total population, while in several states there has been an absolute loss of rural population during the past decade, and in many others the gain has been much less than the average gain of the country. The increase of urban population has been more rapid during the past decade than at any previous time in the country's history, having in 10 years increased from 22 and one half percent up to 29 percent. This great increase has, in the main, taken the form of additions to our larger cities, most of which have grown enormously. The numerical increase in our urban population in the past decade is 6,900,000, of which fully 3 million consists of additions to the 28 cities of 100,000 or more inhabitants. Chicago's half million in 1880 has become more than a million in 1890. St. Paul, Minneapolis, Omaha, Kansas City, and Denver have doubled or tripled their population. Our greatest city, New York, has apparently enjoyed a comparatively slow growth, but this is only apparent. New York's charter limits include less than one-half of the people whose business and social interests lie in that metropolis. The great majority of the people who sleep within an hour's ride of New York's City Hall are to all intents and purposes, except in name, citizens of New York, but having their residence without its charter limits, they cannot be enumerated as its citizens. A close estimate of the people thus connected with the metropolis places their number at 3,250,000, or second only to London in point of population. This territory, tributary to, but lying outside of the charter limits of New York, has increased in population at a tremendous rate during the past ten years, while the growth of the city proper has been confined to the upper parts of Manhattan Island and the portion of the city lying upon the mainland. The downtown parts of the city have diminished in population during the past ten years. This means simply that the ground formerly occupied by residences is being taken for business purposes, that the lower part of Manhattan Island is becoming more and more devoted to business to the exclusion of residents. A similar state of affairs has long existed in London. London consists essentially of a number of municipalities under various names, of which one, the Corporation of London, occupies the center of the city, the neighborhood of St. Paul's. In 1881, this corporation had a population of only 50,000, while in 1891 it had become reduced to 37,000, owing to the extension of business and the consequent reduction in residence. The average size of families has diminished continuously since 1850, when statistics were first obtained, from 5.55 down to 4.93 in 1890. In that year, the largest families were found in the South and the smallest in New England, and in the frontier states, as shown on the map forming Plate 10, Figure 1. Sex The last five censuses, that is, since 1850, have classified the population by sex. At each census, males have been slightly in excess of females, the proportion of males ranging from 50.56 up to 51.21 of the total population, as seen in the following table. Census years, sex, male, female. Census year, 1890, sex, 
male percent, 51.21, sex, female percent, 48.79, census year, 1880, sex, male percent, 50.88, sex, female percent, 49.12, census year, 1870, sex, male percent, 50.56, sex, female percent, 49.44, census year, 1860, sex, male percent, 51.16, sex, female percent, 48.84, census year, 1850, sex, male percent, 51.04, sex, female percent, 48.96. As a rule, the proportion of males has increased, owing to the increased proportion of the foreign-born, which consists largely of males. In 1890, the proportion of males was greater than ever before, due to the fact that the proportion of the foreign-born was greater than ever before. In the civilized nations of the world, generally a different condition of things prevails, females being usually slightly in excess of males, as is shown in nearly every country of Europe. In the United Kingdom, Germany, Austria, Scandinavia, the Netherlands, and Spain, females are at present in excess. The sexes are distributed over the country in widely varying proportions, as is shown on the map, plate 10, figure 2. The states colored red are those in which females are in excess of males. They are all located on the Atlantic border, and include most of the states of that part of the country. In the Mississippi Valley, generally males are slightly in excess, while in the newer states and territories of the Rocky Mountain region, males are largely in excess, owing, of course, to the fact that these are new regions in which society has not yet reached settled conditions. Race. The population of our country is composed, as regards race, of about 55 million whites, 7,500,000 of Africans or mixed bloods, a few hundred thousand Indians, and 150,000 Chinese and Japanese. The natives of China and Japan are comparatively trifling in number, and since the Chinese Exclusion Act went into effect, immigration has ceased, and except upon the Pacific coast, where nearly all of them are found, they form too trifling an element to require consideration. The Indians, most of whom are confined to the areas classed as unsettled, plate 7, figure 2, will be left to the ethnologists. The Africans present us with the spectacle of an inferior race existing in juxtaposition with the whites, and, since the early part of the century, unaided by additions to their numbers from abroad. For seventy years, this race existed in a state of slavery, for the last thirty, more or less, in a state of freedom. It is interesting to observe the progress of this race and compare it with that of the whites. This is presented in the following tables, the first of which gives the total number of each race, while the next table shows the proportions of the two races, given in percentages of the total at each census. White and colored population by decades. Census years, white, colored. Census year, 1790, white, 3,172,006. Colored, 757,208. Census year, 1800, white, 4,306,446. Colored, 1,002,037. Census year, 1810. White, 5,862,073. Colored, 1,377,808. Census year, 1820. White, 7,862,166. Colored, 1,771,656. Census year, 1830. White, 10,537,378. Colored, 2,328,642. Census year, 1840. White, 
fourteen million one hundred ninety five thousand eight hundred five colored two million eight hundred seventy three thousand six hundred forty eight census year eighteen fifty white nineteen million five hundred fifty three thousand sixty eight colored three million six hundred thirty eight thousand eight hundred eight census year eighteen sixty white twenty six million nine hundred twenty two thousand five hundred thirty seven colored four million four hundred forty one thousand eight hundred thirty census year eighteen seventy white thirty three million five hundred eighty nine thousand three hundred seventy seven colored four million eight hundred eighty thousand nine census year eighteen eighty white forty three million four hundred two thousand nine hundred seventy colored six million five hundred eighty thousand seven hundred ninety three census year eighteen ninety white fifty four million nine hundred eighty three thousand nine hundred sixty eight colored seven million six hundred thirty eight thousand two hundred eighty two ratios of white and colored population by decades census years white colored census year seventeen ninety white eighty point seven three colored nineteen point two seven census year eighteen hundred white eighty one point one three colored eighteen point eight seven census year eighteen ten white eighty point nine seven colored nineteen point o three census year eighteen twenty white eighty one point six one colored eighteen point three nine census year eighteen thirty white eighty one point nine zero colored eighteen point one zero census year eighteen forty white eighty three point one seven colored sixteen point eight three census year eighteen fifty white eighty four point three one colored fifteen point six nine census year eighteen sixty white eighty five point six two colored fourteen point one three census year eighteen seventy white eighty seven point one one colored twelve point six five census year eighteen eighty white eighty six point five four colored thirteen point one two census year eighteen ninety white eighty seven point eight zero colored twelve point two zero in seventeen ninety the first census showed that the colored race formed nearly one fifth of the population in eighteen forty after fifty years had elapsed during which time the country had received practically no increase from immigration the proportion of colored had fallen to about one-sixth of the whole in the next half century which closed in eighteen ninety during which the white race has received great additions from immigration that proportion had fallen to less than one-eighth of the whole population summing it up the colored race forms today less than two-thirds the proportion of the population which it formed a century ago the following table and the diagram forming plate eleven figure one represent the rates of increase of the two races decades percentage of increase white colored decade seventeen ninety to eighteen hundred percentage of increase white thirty five point seven six percentage of increase colored thirty two point three eight decade eighteen hundred to eighteen ten percentage of increase white thirty six point one three percentage of increase colored thirty seven point four six decade eighteen ten to eighteen twenty percentage of increase white thirty four point one two percentage of increase colored twenty eight point five seven decade eighteen twenty to eighteen thirty percentage of increase white thirty four point zero three percentage of increase colored thirty one point four one decade 
1830 to 1840. Percentage of increase white 34.72. Percentage of increase colored 23.28. Decade 1840 to 1850. Percentage of increase white 37.74. Percentage of increase colored 26.61. Decade 1850 to 1860. Percentage of increase white 37.69 percentage of increase colored 22.06 decade 1860 to 1870 percentage of increase white 24.76 percentage of increase colored 9.86 decade 1870 to 1880 percentage of increase white 29.91 Percentage of increase colored 34.85. Decade 1880 to 1890. Percentage of increase white 26.68. Percentage of increase colored 13.11. These rates of increase show that in only two decades of the century have the colored apparently increased more rapidly than the whites. The decades between 1800 and 1810, and between 1870 and 1880. The latter, however, is only an apparent excess, due to wholesale omissions in the enumeration of the colored people in 1870. The colored race has almost continuously lost ground in proportion to the white race throughout our history. Although the birth rate of the race is decidedly larger than that of the whites, its death rate as is evidenced by the mortality records of large southern cities, is still greater, being not much less, on an average, than double the death rate of the whites. Since the time of the first records, the colored race has been practically confined to the southern states, as is shown by the map showing the distribution in 1890, where it has practically monopolized labor. There has never been any northward movement of this people of magnitude sufficient to be perceptible in census returns. Indeed, the only important movement among them is southward, from the border states into those of the southern Atlantic and Gulf, from the tobacco states into the cotton states. Plate 11, figure 2, shows the present distribution of the race. In the northern states, the proportion is less than 5% of the population. In the border states, it is less than 25% while in the states along the Atlantic and Gulf, from Virginia to Louisiana, it exceeds 25%. And in three states, South Carolina, Mississippi, and Louisiana, more than half the population are colored. The highest proportion is found in the first of these states, namely South Carolina, where three-fifths of the people are colored and but two-fifths white. The question has been asked, has the condition of slavery or of freedom proved the more favorable to the numerical increase of the colored people? The figures of the census give us a ready answer. The increase has been more rapid under conditions of freedom. In the 30 years preceding 1860, the colored increased 48%, while in the following 30 years, during only 27 of which they were free, and which included the disturbed period of the Civil War and of Reconstruction, they increased not less than 68 per cent. End of Section 3 Recording by Karen Section 4 of the National Geographic Magazine Volume 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Movements of Our Population by Henry Gannett. Presented before the Society, December 9, 1892. Part 2. Nativity and Immigration. It has often been stated that the strongest and most virile nations are the composite ones, those made up 
from a mixture of blood. If this be true, we are in a fair way to distance in this regard all other nations which ever existed. The blood of immigrants from all the nations of Europe, from the Mediterranean to the Arctic, to say nothing of the Negroes, Chinese, and Indians within our borders, threatens to make of us the most thoroughly composite nation the world has ever known. During the first half of the century just past, we received practically no immigration. Our numerical gain was produced almost entirely by natural increase. Indeed, immigration was not of importance until 1847 or 1848, when the famines in Ireland and the political troubles in Germany, occurring almost simultaneously, started immigration in this direction. But since that time, there has been a migration of peoples across the Atlantic to these shores, the equal of which the world has never seen. Within a generation and a half, 15,427,657 people have crossed the Atlantic and found homes in this country. The table shows the number of immigrants in each 10-year period since 1820. Immigrants by decades, 1821 to 30, 143,439, 1831 to 40, 599,125, 1841 to 50, 1,713,251, 1851 to 60, 2,598,214, 1861 to 70, 2,314,824, 1871 to 80, 2,812,191, 1881 to 90, 5 million 246,000 613. In the first of these periods, the number was trifling. Between 1830 and 1840, it rose to nearly 600,000. In the next decade, it nearly tripled, and between 1850 and 1860, reached 2,580,000. Between 1860 and 1870, the number diminished, owing to our internal troubles. But in the next decade, it rose again higher than ever before, approaching three millions, and in 1880 to 1890, it reached the enormous number of 5,250,000, more than one-third of the whole immigration, almost double the number which came in the preceding decade, and more than double the number which arrived in any other decade. The following table shows the principal constituents of the immigration during each decade, from which it appears that the Irish, British, and Germans have constituted the bulk of the immigration. Indeed, down to 1860, other elements were trifling in amount. Between 1860 and 1870, Scandinavians and Canadians commenced to appear and have increased with great rapidity. Other elements, and much less desirable ones, such as Hungarians, Bohemians, Italians, and Poles, appear first in considerable number so recently as between 1870 and 1880, and indeed it is only within the last decade that any considerable numbers of them have come over. The danger to be apprehended from them is not from the numbers which have already arrived, for they are inconsiderable but from the fact that the immigration is increasing at a tremendous rate, so that if continued for a quarter of a century, they will become of considerable numerical importance. Principal Constituents of the Immigration Nationality, 1821 to 1830, 1831 to 1840, 1841 to 1850, 1851 to 1860, 1861 to 1870, 1871 to 1880, 1881 to 1890. 
Nationality, Canada, 1821 to 1830, 2,277, 1831 to 1840, 13,624, 1841 to 1850, 41,723, 1851 to 1860, 59,309, 1861 to 1870, 153,872, 1871 to 1880, 383,269, 1881 to 1890, five years only, 392,802. Nationality, Ireland, 1821 to 1830, 50,724. 1831 to 1840, 207,381. 1841 to 1850, 780,719. 1851 to 1860, 914,119. 1861 to 1870, 435,778. 1871 to 1880, 436,871. 1881 to 1890, 655,482. Nationality, England and Wales. 1821 to 1830, 14,225. 1831 to 1840, 7,796, 1841 to 1850, 33,353, 1851 to 1860, 253,444, 1861 to 1870, 226,570, 1871 to 1880, 444,000, 337, 1881 to 1890, 657,280. Nationality, Scotland, 1821 to 1830, 2,912. 1831 to 1840, 2,667. 1841 to 1850, 3,712. 1851 to 1860, 38,331. 1861 to 1870, 38,769. 1871 to 1880, 87,564. 1881 to 1890, 149,869. Nationality, Norway and Sweden. 1821 to 1830, 91. 1831 to 1840, 1,201. 1841 to 1850, 13,903. 1851 to 1860, 20,931. 1861 to 1870, 109,298. 1871 to 1880, 211,245. 1881 to 1890, 568,362. Nationality, Denmark, 1821 to 1830, 169. 1831 to 1840, 1003. 1841 to 1850, 539, 1851 to 1860, 3,749, 1861 to 1870, 17,094, 1871 to 1880, 31,771, 1881 to 1890, 88,132. Nationality, Russia and Poland. 1821 to 1830, 91. 1831 to 1840, 
646. 1841 to 1850, 656. 1851 to 1860, 1621. 1861 to 1870, 4539. 1871 to 1880, 52,260. 1881 to 1890, 265,088. Nationality, Hungary. 1861 to 1870, 7,800. 1871 to 1880, 72,969. 1881 to 1890, 353,719. Nationality, Italy. 1821 to 1830, 408. 1831 to 1840, 2,253. 1841 to 1850, 1,870. 1851 to 1860, 9,231. 1861 to 1870, 11,725. 1871 to 1880, 55,759. 1881 to 1890, 307,309. Nationality, Germany. 1821 to 1830, 6,761. 1831 to 1840, 152,454. 1841 to 1850, 434,626. 1851 to 1860, 951,667. 1861 to 1870, 787,468. 1871 to 1880, 718,182. 1881 to 1890, 1,452,970. Nationality, France. 1821 to 1830, 8,497. 1831 to 1840, 45,575. 1841 to 1850, 77,262. 1851 to 1860, 76,358. 1861 to 1870, 35,986. 1871 to 1880, 72,206. 1881 to 1890, 50,464. Nationality, Netherlands. 1821 to 1830, 1,078. 1831 to 1840, 1,412. 1841 to 1850, 8,251. 1851 to 1860, 10,789. 1861 to 1870, 9,102. 1871 to 1880, 16,541. 1881 to 1890, 53,701. In recent years, the character of the immigration has changed for the worse, not only by this increase of these undesirable nationalities, but in the fact that the character of the immigration from other countries is lower than heretofore in respect to wealth, education, and morality. Altogether, the changes which the character of the immigration has taken on in the past 10 or 15 years have tended to lower the standard of American citizenship and press upon us the question whether it is not wise to take steps for limiting immigration. Of the entire body of immigrants who have joined us, 4,504,128, or 28%, are Germans, 5,911,454 have come from the United Kingdom, 3,481,000 
74 of which are Irish. The United Kingdom and Germany together have supplied two-thirds of the entire immigration. Norway, Sweden, and Denmark have furnished 1,067,548, while the contingent from other European countries has been comparatively small in amount. The constituents of the total immigration and of the immigration during the last decade are shown graphically in Plate 12. The Foreign Born What effect has the flood of immigration had upon the constitution of our population? In 1840, all our people were of native birth, with the exception of 600,000 newly arrived immigrants. In 1850, those of foreign birth constituted between 9 and 10 percent of our population. In 1860, this proportion had risen to 13%, and in 1870 to nearly 14 and one half percent. In 1880, it suffered a slight reduction, being about 13 and one half percent. But in 1890, it had risen to 14 and three quarter percent, while the foreign born found in the country in that year numbered no fewer than 9,250,000. These facts are set forth in the following table. Increase of the foreign born. Census years, native, native white, foreign. Census year, 1850, native, 20,912,612. Native white, 17,273,804. Foreign, 2,244,602. Foreign, 2,244,602. Census year, 1860. Native, 27,304,624. Native white, 22,862,794. Foreign, 4,138,697. Census year, 1870. Native, 32,991,142. Native white, 28,111,133. Foreign, 5,567,229. Census year, 1880. Native, 43,475,846. Native white, 36,895,047. Foreign, 6,679,000. 943. Census year, 1890. Native, 53,373,703. Native white, 45,863,008. Foreign, 9,248,547. The following table shows the proportion which the native and foreign born bore to the total population at each census since the distinction was first made, and the maps in plate 13 show where the foreign-born are located. Ratio of increase of the foreign-born. Census years, native, foreign. Census year, 1850. Native, 90.30. Foreign, 9.68. Census year, 1860. Native, 86.84. Foreign, 13.16. Census year, 1870. Native, 85.56. Foreign, 14.44. Census year, 1880. Native, 86.68. Foreign, 14.32. Census year, 1890. Native, 85.23. Foreign, 14.77. The maps show their distribution over the country expressed in percentages of the total population, state by state. From this, it is seen that the home of the foreign element is in the north and west. The foreign-born have never invaded the south to compete in labor with the colored element. Indeed, in the northern and western states, there are found no less than 96% of the entire foreign-born element of the country. Now a glance at the constituents of the foreign element. 
They repeat in a broad way the composition of the immigration. Plate 14, figure 1, presents the constituents of the foreign-born population of 1890, showing that the Germans are in excess of all others, numbering 2,785,000, followed by the Irish, 1,871,000, the British, 1,251,000, the Canadians, 980,000, and the Scandinavians, 933,000. These five nationalities comprise nearly nine-tenths of the whole foreign element. The Italians and Russians each number less than 200,000, the Poles only 150,000, and the Hungarians and Bohemians but a trifle over 100,000 each. How are these different nationalities distributed over the country? The series of maps forming plates 14 to 16 show this expressed in the form of a proportion between their numbers and the total population of the various states. From them it is seen that the Canadians are found mainly in northern New England, Michigan, Minnesota, and North Dakota, closely hugging the northern border. The Irish are found mainly in New England and New York, comparatively few having wandered westward. The Germans are found from New York westward, and in the greatest body in Illinois, Michigan, and Wisconsin. The Scandinavians have settled as far north as they could, and yet remain within our jurisdiction, being found principally in Wisconsin, Minnesota, and the Dakotas, while the British are found scattered widely over the northern states. These people are guided largely by temperature in the selection of their homes. Those from northern Europe and Canada settle in the far north. The Germans, coming from a more temperate climate, have settled mainly south of them, as have also the Irish. What is the distribution of this foreign element as between urban and rural life? As a rule, the Irish prefer urban life, the great proportion of them settling in the cities. The same is also true in an almost equal degree with the British. The Germans are somewhat less disposed toward urban life, but still a large part of them, far beyond their due proportion, are found in our large cities. The same is the case with the French Canadians, while the Norwegians and Swedes are much more disposed toward rural life, and the great body of them are found away from the centers of population. As a rule, however, the foreign population flocks to the cities in far greater proportion than the native element does. In 1890, the 28 largest cities of the country contained a population of 9,700,000, or about 15% of the population of the country. Now, the foreign-born element of these cities comprises a little over 3 million, or almost exactly one-third of the total foreign-born of the country. Putting it in another way, Nearly one-third of the population of these cities is foreign-born, while in the country at large only about one-sixth of it is foreign-born. These cities contain, therefore, double their quota of the foreign-born element, plate 17. As to occupations, it may be stated broadly that the foreign-born element is engaged in avocations lower in character than the native element principally in those involving skilled and unskilled labor, while the proportion of them in the learned professions is much less, relative to their numbers, than among the native element. While in 1880 the foreign-born constituted about one-seventh of the population, it was found that of lawyers, clergymen, physicians, and teachers, there were about eleven native-born to one foreign-born. On the other hand, among servants, there was one foreign-born to little more than three native-born. Among unskilled laborers, the foreign-born were in the proportion of one to two native-born, while in skilled labor, such as blacksmiths, shoemakers, and carpenters, the proportion was also as one to two, and foreign-born miners exceeded in total number the native-born. This flood of immigration has produced other results in our population beyond the mere additions to our numbers and the admixture of blood. It has lowered the average intelligence 
and morality of the community. The illiterate of the northern states are mainly foreign-born, the proportion of illiterates among them being four times as great as among the native-born. Again, the criminals of foreign birth in the northern states are double their due proportion as compared with the native-born. Another result of importance has been produced. It is a well-known law of population that in a broad, general way, as the population increases, the rate of increase diminishes. It is an illustration of the Malthusian doctrine. Now it matters not in the least how this density of population is brought about, whether it be by natural increase or by immigration. The result is the same. The rate of natural increase is reduced thereby. I have made a comparison between the rates of increase of the native white elements of the northern and the southern states to ascertain approximately the effect of immigration upon our rate of increase, and the results are presented in plate 18. The southern states, including in that designation all of the states east of the plains and south of Mason and Dixon's line, the Ohio River, and the southern boundary of Missouri and Kansas, have received practically no immigration. The states north of this line and east of the plains contain 86% of the foreign element, the remainder being mainly in the states and territories of the far west. The rates of increase found among the whites of the southern states, which are not complicated by immigration, are represented by the dotted line of the diagram, and while they exhibit some oscillations they show a general, but not a great, diminution from the beginning of our history to the end. Between 1790 and 1840, the white population of these states increased 239%. In other words, the population of 1840 was 3.39 times that of 1790. In the succeeding 50 years, the population of these states increased 204%. That is, the population of these states in 1890 was 3.04 times as great as in 1840, the rate having thus diminished by only 35%. On the other hand, how is it with the northern states? In the first 50 years, during which there was practically no immigration, the rate of increase in each decade was considerably greater than in the southern states, and altogether during this half-century, the white population of these northern states increased 389%. That is, in 1840, the population was 4.89 times as great as in 1790. Between 1840 and 1890, after separating from the white population of these states, the immigrants and their natural increase, and thus leaving only the native element, the rate of increase of the latter is seen to diminish remarkably. Instead of ranging from 34 up to 41 percent, as it did in the first half century, the rates of increase by decades become 23, 20, 15, 16, and 10, while the rate of increase for this entire half century was but 112 percent, the native population in 1890 being but 2.12 times as great as that of 1840. This sudden and astonishingly rapid reduction of the rate in the North, following closely the appearance of the flood of immigration, can be attributed to no other cause. The rate of increase of the North is shown by the full line, the broken line, which commences at 1840 and runs up to 1890, being the rate of increase of the native element alone, while the full line, continuing on to 1890, represents the rate of increase of the entire population of the North, including the foreign element. It is an interesting coincidence that this rate of increase during the last decade was almost exactly the same as that of the South. I firmly believe, therefore, that the rate of our natural increase has been greatly reduced by the flood of immigration. By allowing the poor and oppressed of Europe homes in this country, we have substituted them for our own flesh and blood. I believe that if there had been no immigration, the rate of natural increase which prevailed before immigration commenced would have been much more nearly maintained, and our numbers would be nearly as great as at present. 
the sudden and rapid reduction of the rate of natural increase of the north during the past forty years i believe to be due to this flood of immigration and it is a question whether we have gained by this substitution of a mixture of european for american blood there is another result produced by immigration which is not so apparent but which it seems to me is of great and far-reaching importance in connection with this question as has been stated the immigration consists as a rule of the lower classes mainly of skilled and unskilled labor and these millions of mechanics and laborers have filled and practically monopolized the lower classes of avocations in the north in this way they have forced the native american element into the higher walks of life the headwork of the country is practically in the hands of americans almost as fully as half a century ago our industrial enterprises of all sorts are under the management of americans and the hewing of wood and the drawing of water have been assumed by the immigrant the fact that the native is still the ruling element probably accounts for the fact that the foreign element in spite of its great numerical importance has thus far exerted but a trifling influence upon our political industrial and social life the element of foreign extraction the effects of immigration on our population are not confined by any means to the foreign-born although to some extent americanized the children of the irish germans and scandinavians retain many of their parents characteristics measurably they are irish germans and scandinavians still it is interesting therefore to note to what extent our population is composed not only of the foreign-born but of the children of the foreign-born and this information was obtained both in eighteen seventy and eighteen ninety moreover in eighteen seventy practically all the foreign blood in the country must have been accounted for by the enumeration of the foreign-born and their children since immigration had commenced on a large scale only twenty-two years earlier and it is not possible that there was any considerable number of children of the second generation in the country the element of foreign extraction in the united states in eighteen seventy numbered by this enumeration ten million eight hundred ninety two thousand and comprised about one-third of the entire white population of the country in eighteen ninety those born of foreign parents including the foreign-born numbered twenty million six hundred twenty six thousand and constituted thirty seven per cent of the entire white population of the country to this large number are yet to be added probably four or five millions in the second generation to complete the tale of foreign blood the distribution of the foreign-born and their children is illustrated in plate seventeen the highest proportion being in new england and the northwestern states indeed in the northern states east of the plains forty five per cent or nearly one half of the inhabitants are foreign-born or the children of foreigners in massachusetts there are fifty six per cent in rhode island fifty eight in connecticut fifty in new york fifty six and in new jersey forty eight per cent but the heaviest proportion is found in the northwestern states in wisconsin and minnesota three-fourths of the people are foreign-born or children of foreign-born and in the new state of north dakota four-fifths of the people are of immediate foreign extraction while only one-fifth of the inhabitants are of american stock in our great cities the situation is even more startling thus in boston the native element constitutes but thirty per cent in brooklyn twenty eight and in buffalo twenty two while new york with only eighteen per cent is practically a foreign city so far as its population is concerned chicago contains a native element of but twenty per cent and detroit of twenty one while among these great cities milwaukee stands at the head or foot as you please with a native element of but thirteen per cent these are presented graphically in the accompanying plate seventeen the most extreme case which has fallen under my notice however is that of the little city of ishpeming in the heart of the iron region of michigan 
a city of some 11,000 people, of which only 6% are native-born of native parents, the remainder 94% being foreign-born or the children of the foreign-born. Summary I have attempted to sum up in a diagram, plate 19, a part of the substance of this paper. This is an attempt to show the growth of each element of the population for a century, with its status at the end of the century. The breadth of the diagram opposite the years is proportional to the population at that date, and the breadth of the various subdivisions is proportional to the numbers of the three elements, colored, native, and foreign. The immigration of each decade is indicated by the additions between the dates. The separation between the elements of native and foreign blood is, of course, only an approximation. A tentative separation was made under the assumption that the rate of natural increase of the foreign element was equal to that of the native element. Under this assumption, the separation was carried forward to 1870, where, as explained above, a definite separation was made by the census enumeration. This gave a correction which showed that the natural increase of the foreign element had been more rapid than that of the native element. Accordingly, the earlier results were corrected and the rates of increase of the foreign and of the native elements thus deduced were projected forward to 1890. The diagram at the bottom shows the present status of the population as regards colored, native, and foreign blood, classifying the last by the leading nationalities. From this, it appears that the present composition of the population is somewhat as follows. Colored, 7,500,000. White, of native extraction, 30 million. White, of foreign extraction, 25 million. The principal elements of the latter are British, 4 million. Irish, 6,500,000. German, 6,800,000. Swedes and Norwegians, 1 million. Hungarians, 500,000. Italians, 500,000. Canadians, 1,600,000. The remainder of the 25 million are distributed among various nationalities in small numbers. The white element of native extraction is apparently in the minority today in this country, being exceeded in number by the sum of the foreign element and the colored. British blood is, however, still largely in the ascendant, for if we add to the white native element the 4 million of British and 6,500,000 of Irish, we get 40,500,000, about two-thirds of the entire population and three-fourths of the entire white population. End of section 4. Recording by Karen. Section 5 of The National Geographic Magazine, Volume 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne. Rainfall Types of the United States. Annual Report by Vice President General A. W. Greeley. Presented before the Society January 6, 1893. In carrying out the announced policy of the National Geographic Society with regard to annual contributions from its vice presidents in their respective domains of geographic science, it has seemed advisable for the vice president of the Geography of the Air to place before the Society this year a special paper. The subject selected is the typical distribution of rainfall in the United States and contiguous territory and an attempt has been made to treat the subject in such a manner that it may be a permanent contribution to the physical geography of the United States. It goes without saying that a paper covering 20 minutes reading cannot go much into detail, but it is hoped that the treatment, while general, is yet such as to give definite and clear ideas on the subject treated. This paper does not consider the distribution of rain from the standpoint of the mean annual precipitation does not dwell on the variability or unequal amounts in consecutive years, 
omits to discuss the distribution from the standpoint of varying elevations, and is silent on the question of distribution with reference to frequency or absence of excessive rains of periodic or accidental occurrence. It confines itself to a question of great and sometimes vital importance, to the characteristic distribution of precipitation throughout the year and, as is believed, presents a successful analysis of the average fluctuations from month to month, so that for the first time a satisfactory presentation is possible of all the simple rainfall types and of most of the composite types which obtain over the broad expanse of the inhabited portions of North America. The necessity of careful and scientific study of climactic conditions in connection with prospective enterprises, whether pertaining to agriculture, commerce, navigation, or to special industries, has become obvious the past few years through the spur of competition. Among such conditions, this of rainfall distribution throughout the year is one of the most important. With relation to agriculture, it is essential to know whether precipitation comes at such seasons as to be a benefit or a detriment to the proposed crop. In the initiation of irrigation enterprises, not only are the questions of guarding against extensive and torrential rainfalls on one hand, and of tiding over temporary droughts on the other, of importance, but, further, whether the most copious precipitation occurs in such months as to afford water at seasonable periods, or the rain comes at such times that it must be stored for many months with consequent loss from seepage and evaporation. Similarly, this question of distribution of rain throughout the year affects most potently other business interests of importance. That these questions are of current and practical value is evident to every thoughtful man, and that their earlier elucidation and the publication of results would have been an extended benefit cannot be questioned. Take agriculture, for instance, which in eastern Colorado is pursued under difficult conditions wherever irrigation is impracticable. Failure of crops very frequently resulted until observation showed that a scanty rainfall in June is the rule in that section, and that by planting at a certain season the injurious effects of the June drought can be mitigated. Nor is the necessity of a definite and accurate determination of the typical forms of annual precipitation in the eastern part of the United States less obvious, since the latest textbook on meteorology in use in the United States, that of Loomis, contains the statement that, throughout most of the United States east of the Rocky Mountains, the rain is pretty equally distributed through the different months of the year, but the rain of summer is everywhere somewhat greater than that of winter, including melted snow. In reality, the whole section of country, about 200,000 square miles in extent, dominated by the Tennessee type of rainfall, experiences a larger precipitation in winter than in summer, the excess averaging in northern Alabama and southern Kentucky about 10 percent, in western Georgia and in Tennessee over 20 percent, and in southeastern Arkansas and northern Louisiana from 40 to 50 percent. I have pointed out elsewhere the vital importance of a favorable distribution of rainfall to certain sections of the country, where this favoring type of precipitation has proved to be one of the great bases on which rests the national prosperity of this great republic. Allusion is made to the great grain-producing sections throughout the watersheds of the Upper Mississippi, the Missouri, the Red River of the North, comprising the Dakotas, Minnesota, Kansas, Nebraska, Iowa, Missouri, Wisconsin, and Illinois. Over the greater part of this immense area, the annual rainfall is very materially less than that of the regions to the eastward or southward, but, most fortunately for the country, about three-fifths of the rainfall for the entire year occurs opportunely through the period when it is most beneficial to crops, from April to July inclusive. A less favorable type of rainfall, the Mexican or the St. Lawrence, for example, would render growing of grain unprofitable throughout the whole of this favored region. It remains to briefly indicate the few types of simple rainfall with the localities to which they refer, and to the composite types occurring through the overlapping and interference of simple types. Composite types must prevail where two simple types are not separated by high mountain ranges and thus gradually shade or merge into each other. One dividing line, the Rocky Mountain Range, separates by its crest 
if not absolutely, yet quite sharply and definitely, the Missouri type in Montana and Wyoming from the Pacific type in Idaho and Washington. The term simple has been applied to those rainfall types which can be graphically expressed by a curve with a single bend or inflection. The average monthly amounts pass from the single maximum to the single minimum through uninterruptedly diminishing quantities, and thence rise with unbroken increases to the maximum. The composite types are those in which the graphic expression would be shown by two inflections, from a primary maximum through the minimum to a secondary maximum and a secondary minimum. In general terms it may be said that each simple type of rainfall in the United States appertains to a single body of water for its resulting precipitation. Thus the Pacific type comes directly from the Pacific Ocean, the Mexican type from the Gulf of California, the Tennessee type from the Gulf of Mexico, and the Atlantic type from the Atlantic Ocean. In the Missouri type, however, two sources are evident, primarily the Gulf of Mexico and secondarily, and to a much larger degree than has been usually advanced, Hudson Bay and the chain of the Great American Lakes. In treating the fluctuations of rainfall throughout the year, it is evident that the unequal lengths of the different months affect somewhat the accuracy of direct intercomparisons of normal monthly rainfalls. There fell under my observation lately a curve showing such intercomparisons, which proved misleading, as it showed a decrease of rain from January to February and an increase from February to March, when in reality, as shown by the average amount daily for each month, the rainfall became more copious from January to February and from February to March. In this discussion, the rule has been followed of obtaining the normal daily rainfall by dividing the normal yearly rainfall by 365.25. In like manner, the average daily rainfall of February has been found by using 28.25 as a divisor, and the Loggins months by using 31. In this paper, for the sake of brevity and in order to avoid repetition, it is to be explained that the term normal daily rainfall is applied to the mean determined from the annual precipitation, and that the terms January rainfall, March rainfall, etc., unless otherwise explicitly stated, mean the average daily amount determined for the month in question by the methods above indicated. The best defined type of rainfall within the limits of the United States is that which dominates the Pacific Coast region, hence the specific name Pacific herein applied. In general terms, it may be said to dominate British Columbia, Washington, Idaho, Oregon, California, Nevada, and western Utah. In other words, the Great Interior Basin and the entire Pacific watershed from British Columbia to Lower California, excluding the section draining into the Gulf of California. The characteristic features are very heavy precipitation during midwinter and an almost total absence of rain during the late summer. The infrequency of summer rain is marked in British Columbia, and thence southward it becomes steadily more pronounced, passing through the gradations of a single rainless month in Northern California, then two and three to its culmination of four rainless months in a considerable part of Southern California and Western Nevada. There is a tendency in the upper half of the San Joaquin Valley, and thence southward into the western part of San Diego County, for rain to cease about a month earlier and to remain absent a month later than over the rest of the Pacific Coast region, the dry season being from June to September inclusive, and being usually unbroken even by a passing shower. Eastern Nevada appears to share freedom from rain during July, but the autumnal rains appear in September or earlier, under the influence of the southern part of that state of the Mexican type projecting northward. The marked tendency of the winter rains to continue into spring is evident in Washington, whence it shades with diminishing persistency to northern California and northwestern Nevada. It may be remarked that in the Pacific Coast regions, the amounts of rain vary very greatly according to the topography of the section and the distance from the ocean, so that the interior depressions, such as the Sacramento, San Joaquin, and other valleys, particularly those parallel with the coast, have a scantier rainfall than either the coast itself or the Sierra Nevada and other mountain ranges to the eastward. These variations in the total rainfall do not, however, affect the distribution throughout the year, which is typically Pacific throughout the whole region. 
as might be expected where the rainfall is very small a single month of excessive precipitation occasionally increases the rainfall so as to be misleading for instance it is apparent from inspection that the greatest normal precipitation is that of december at both san diego california and hellock nevada yet excessive rainfalls of nine point o five inches in february eighteen eighty four at the former place and four inches in february eighteen seventy at the latter throw the February daily precipitation slightly above that of December. Of the following examples of the Pacific type, five are drawn from the interior, viz. Spokane, Washington, records of 12 years, Delano, California, 15 years, Boise City, Idaho, 22 years, Promontory, Utah, 21 years, Halleck, Nevada, 21 years, and three from coast stations, viz. Astoria, Oregon, 29 years, San Diego and San Francisco, California, each 41 years. Normal daily rainfall and monthly departures therefrom. Values are in fractions of an inch. Stations. Astoria, Oregon. Normal daily rainfall for 29 years, 0 .207. Departures. January, 0 .208. February, 0 .094. March, 0 .109. April, minus 0 .035, May, minus 0 .092, June, minus 0 .114, July, minus 0 .169, August, minus 0 .166, September, minus 0 .099, October, minus 0 .050, November, 0 .131, December, 0 .187. Station. San Francisco, California, normal daily rainfall for 41 years, 0 .066. Departures, January, 0 .099, February, 0 .060, March, 0 .039, April, minus 0 .002, May, minus 0 .064, June, minus 0 .066, July, minus 0 .066, August, minus point zero six six september minus point zero six one october minus point zero three four november minus point zero three zero december point one zero six station san diego california normal daily rainfall for forty one years point zero two seven departures january point zero two seven february point zero four four March, 0 .015, April, minus 0 .003, May, minus 0 .016, June, minus 0 .027, July, minus 0 .027, August, minus 0 .027, September, minus 0 .027, October, minus 0 .016, November, minus 0 .008, December, minus 0 .042. Station, Delano, California, normal daily rainfall for 15 years, 0 .017. Departures, January, 0 .010, February, 0 .029, March, 0 .013, April, 0 .015, May, 0 .000, June, minus 0 .017, July, minus 0 .017, August, minus 0 .017, September, minus 0 .017, October, minus 0 .007, November, 0 .009, December, 0 .011. Station, Spokane, Washington, normal daily rainfall for 12 years, 0 .055. Departures, January, 0 .034, February, 0 .055, March, minus 0 .010, April minus point zero one five, May minus point zero one three, June point zero zero nine, July minus point zero three two, August minus point zero four two, September minus point zero two zero, October point zero zero six, November minus point zero zero six, December point zero zero three. Station Boise City, Idaho, normal daily rainfall for twenty two years. 0 .040. Departures. January. 0 
February, 0 0.014, March, 0 0.019, April, 0 0.016, May, 0 0.005, June, minus 0 0.014, July, minus 0 0.033, August, minus 0 0.034, September, minus 0 0.028, October, minus 0 0.013, November, 0 0.003, December, 0 0.028, Station, Halleck, Nevada, normal daily rainfall for 21 years, 0 .020. Departures, January, 0 .012, February, 0 .020, March, 0 .002, April, 0 .001, May, 0 .010, June, minus 0 .008, July, minus 0 .018, August, minus 0 .016, September, minus 0 .016, October minus point zero zero one, November minus point zero zero one, December point zero one three. Station, Promontory, Utah. Normal daily rainfall for twenty one years, point zero two one. Departures, January point zero one five, February point zero zero eight, March point zero zero four, April point zero zero five, May point zero zero zero, June. Minus point zero zero eight, July minus point zero one four, August minus point zero zero nine, September minus point zero zero two, October minus point zero zero two, November minus point zero zero three, December point zero zero nine. Another simple type of rainfall is that which in a previous paper I designated as the Trans Pecos, from the fact that it dominates extreme western Texas beyond the Pecos River. On further investigation, it proved to prevail in the province of Chihuahua, and now lighter data shows the great probability that it dominates the far greater part of Mexico, hence it is now called the Mexican type. The characteristics of the Mexican type are very heavy precipitation after the summer solstice and a very dry period after the vernal equinox. August is the month of greatest rainfall and, with July and September, furnishes over 75% of the year's precipitation at Mazatlan about 87% at Topolobampo, 58% at El Paso, Texas, Fort Davis, Texas, and Fort Union, New Mexico. On the other hand, the months of February, March, and April are marked by an almost entire absence of precipitation, aggregating for this period only 1-2% to of the year's rain on the western coast of Mexico and about 8% at Chihuahua, Mexico, the City of Mexico, El Paso, Texas, Fort Davis, Texas, and Fort Union, New Mexico. 34 years. This type dominates New Mexico, save the small drainage basins of the Gila and San Juan, the Trans-Pecos region of Texas, and probably all of Mexico, except the eastern coast and, possibly, the southern part of that country. The proof of its prevalence in Mexico rests on about ten years' observations at the city of Mexico, ten at Pueblo, where, however, the type is composite and the maximum falls in July, conforming to the rainfall regime of Veracruz, as given by Loomis six years at Mazatlan, seven at Leon de Aldemas, five at Chihuahua, and four at Topolobampo. While the Mexican type of rainfall does not absolutely obtain in Arizona, yet, taken as a whole, its influence is more potent than that of the Pacific type. The Arizona rainfall is of a composite type, the result of interference between the Pacific and Mexican. The primary maximum, closely following the Mexican type, occurs from July to August, while most generally the second maximum falls with the Pacific type in December. Interference of the types, however, brings about the principal minimum in October and the secondary minimum in May or June. The following shows the departures from the daily normal rainfall of 0 .028 inch at Fort McDonnell, deduced from the longest record, 24 years, in Arizona. January, 0 .006 inch, February, 0 .015, March, minus point zero zero four april minus point zero one zero may minus point zero two four june minus point zero two four july minus point zero one two august point zero one nine september point zero zero three october minus point zero one four november minus point zero zero one and december point zero two eight similarly colorado and a portion of texas to the eastward of the pecos watershed 
experienced a composite type of rainfall arising from interference of the Mexican type from the westward and the Missouri type from the eastward. Colorado has its principal rainfall maximum in July or August and its principal minimum in January, while the secondary maximum occurs in April or May and a secondary minimum in June. It is hardly necessary to state that certain localities, according to their contiguity, either to the simple Mexican or the simple Missouri type in their rainfall, reverse in order of importance the primary and secondary maxima and minima here mentioned. Utah has a great diversity of rainfall fluctuations, resulting from its being so situated that it is more or less influenced from different quarters by the Pacific, Mexican, and even the Missouri type, the first named being most potent, especially in the western and extreme northern part of the territory. The Missouri type of rainfall is the most important in the United States both from the vast area over which it obtains and also from its extremely favorable bearing on agriculture. This type dominates the watersheds of the Arkansas, Missouri, and Upper Mississippi Rivers, and the lakes of Ontario and Michigan, as well as over Oklahoma and the greater part of northern Texas, thus covering Montana, the Dakotas, Minnesota, Nebraska, Kansas, Iowa, Missouri, Oklahoma, Wisconsin, and Illinois together with parts of Arkansas, Texas, Michigan, Indiana, and Indian Territory. The Missouri type indicates a very light winter precipitation, followed in late spring and early summer by the major quantity of the yearly rain. The area of country covered by this type is so large that certain slight modifications could be anticipated. For instance, while the June rainfall is as a rule the most abundant, yet along the eastern slope of the Rocky Mountains, the May rainfall is somewhat greater than that of the following month. Again, while January is usually the month of least precipitation, yet in some localities the minimum has a tendency to occur in December and in others to delay itself until February. As examples of the Missouri type, there are here presented rainfall data from Riley, Illinois, record of 39 years, Muscatine, Iowa, 45, Bismarck, North Dakota, 18, Fort Randall, South Dakota, 32, Fort Ripley, Minnesota, 27, Fort Riley, Kansas, 36, Miami, Missouri, 43, Fort Shaw, Montana, 19, Omaha, Nebraska, 24, and Madison, Wisconsin, 24 years. Normal daily rainfall and departures therefrom. Values are in fractions of an inch. Station. Fort Shaw, Montana. Normal daily rainfall for 19 years, 0.028. Departures. January, minus 0 0.016. February, minus 0 0.014. March, minus 0 0.013. April, minus 0 0.005. May, 0 0.037. June, 0 0.037. July, 0 0.007. August, 0 0.002. September, 0 0.000. October, minus 0 0.011. November, minus 0 0.013. December, Minus point zero zero one. Station Bismarck, North Dakota. Normal daily rainfall for eighteen years, point zero five two. Departures January minus point zero three seven. February minus point zero two nine. March minus point zero one eight. April point zero two two. May point zero three two. June point zero six eight. July point zero two six. August point zero one nine. September minus point zero one three, October minus point zero one four, November minus point zero three two, December minus point zero two eight. Station Fort Randall, South Dakota, normal daily rainfall for thirty two years, point zero five six. Departures January minus point zero four three, February minus point zero three six, March minus point zero two three, April point zero zero two. May point zero five eight, June point zero five three, July point zero three one, August point zero two seven, September point zero one one, October minus point zero one four, November minus point zero four nine, December minus point zero two nine. Station Fort Ripley, Minnesota, normal daily rainfall for twenty seven years, point zero seven four, departures January. Minus point zero four seven, February minus point zero four one, March minus point zero two four, April minus point zero two zero, May point zero two three, June point zero one seven, July 
0.057, August 0.032, September 0.036, October minus 0.022, November minus 0.017, December minus 0.045. Station, Madison, Wisconsin. Normal daily rainfall for 24 years, 0 0.097. Departures, January, minus 0 0.036, February, minus 0 0.036, March, minus 0 0.011, April, 0 0.049, May, 0 0.019, June, 0 0.043, July, 0 0.042, August, 0 0.009, September, 0 0.013, October, minus 0 0.005, November, minus 0 0.030, December, minus 0 0.033. Station, Omaha, Nebraska, normal daily rainfall for 24 years, 0 0.091. Departures, January, minus 0 0.069, February, minus 0 0.065, March, minus 0 0.044, April, 0 0.013, May, 0 0.054, June, 0 0.097, July, 0 0.075, August 0 0.019, September 0 0.021, October minus 0 0.002, November minus 0 0.050, December minus 0 0.058. Station, Fort Riley, Kansas, normal daily rainfall for 36 years, 0 0.069. Departures, January minus 0 0.049, February minus 0 0.038, March minus 0 0.011, April, minus 0 0.004, May, 0 0.036, June, 0 0.060, July, 0 0.053, August, 0 0.045, September, 0 0.029, October, minus 0 0.014, November, minus 0 0.026, December, minus 0 0.045. Station, Muscatine, Iowa, normal daily rainfall for 45 years, 0.107. Departures, January, minus 0 0.045, February, minus 0 0.033, March, minus 0 0.020, April, 0 0.005, May, 0 0.035, June, 0 0.052, July, 0 0.020, August, 0 0.035, September, 0 0.020, October, minus 0 0.009, November, minus 0 0.022, December, minus 0 0.013. Station, Miami, Missouri, normal daily rainfall for 43 years, 0 0.096. Departures, January, minus 0 0.044, February, minus 0 0.035, March, minus 0 0.021, April, 0 0.001, May, 0 0.034, June, 0 0.074, July, 0 0.037, August, 0 0.021, September, 0 0.020, October 0 0.002, November minus 0 0.027, December minus 0 0.033. Station, Riley, Illinois, normal daily rainfall for 39 years, 0 0.108. Departures, January minus 0 0.023, February minus 0 0.034, March minus 0 0.023, April minus 0 0.011, May 0 0.014, June 0 0.030, July, 0 0.016, August, 0 0.022, September, 0 0.015, October, minus 0 0.022, November, minus 0 0.031, December, minus 0 0.042. The general character of the Missouri type is, perhaps, satisfactorily illustrated by the rainfall of Nebraska, this state being central as regarding this type. In Nebraska, only about 6% of the year's precipitation occurs from December to February inclusive. In April, however, the percentage of the entire annual rainfall is 11, in May 17, in June 16, and July 16, making about 60% for these four months. In other words, three-fifths of the yearly rainfall occurs most opportunely during the period when it is most beneficial to the growing crops. It is well known that the annual rainfall is small, Yet eastern Nebraska receives during these four months, April to July, inclusive, a larger amount of rainfall than the interior portions of the eastern states from Maine to Virginia, and western Nebraska receives only a slightly lesser amount. While the rain precipitation of the year diminishes to the northward and westward of Nebraska, yet the same favorable type of distribution prevails. 
The Missouri type changes by interference with the Mexican type in the southwest, the Tennessee type to the southeast, and the St. Lawrence to the northeast. The Tennessee type, although not covering a very extended region, is well marked, the highest rainfalls occurring the last of winter or the first of spring, while the minimum is in mid-autumn. The Tennessee type obtains over Tennessee, Arkansas, Mississippi, eastern Kentucky, western Georgia, and, except on the immediate Gulf Coast, in Alabama and Louisiana. In some localities, western Kentucky and Tennessee and adjacent parts of Arkansas, the rain of February slightly exceeds that of March, the usual month of maximum, while in northern Louisiana and adjacent regions the tendency is towards slightly greater rainfalls in April than in March. It is also to be noted that in some cases there is a tendency toward the minimum rainfall in August or September rather than October, in which month the minimum occurs for the greater portion of the area. Montgomery, Alabama, Atlanta, Georgia, Chattanooga, and Memphis, Tennessee are examples of the Tennessee type of precipitation. The Tennessee type. Normal daily rainfall and departures therefrom. Values are in fractions of an inch. Station. Atlanta, Georgia. Normal daily rainfall for 26 years, 0.143. Departures. January, 0 0.022. February, 0 0.042. March, 0 0.044. April, 0 0.007, May, minus 0 0.021, June, minus 0 0.002, July, minus 0 0.020, August, 0 0.002, September, minus 0 0.010, October, minus 0 0.060, November, minus 0 0.013, December, 0 0.015. Station, Knoxville, Tennessee, normal daily rainfall for 20 years, 0.146. Departures. January, 0 0.040, February, 0 0.043, March, 0 0.037, April, 0 0.023, May, minus 0 0.023, June, minus 0 0.003, July, minus 0 0.007, August, minus 0 0.007, September, minus 0 0.042, October, minus 0 0.044, November, minus 0 0.009, December, minus 0 0.012. Station, Memphis, Tennessee. Normal daily rainfall for 20 years, 0.148. Departures. January, 0 0.041. February, 0 0.052. March, 0 0.037. April, 0 0.037. May, minus 0 0.011. June, 0 0.019. July, minus 0 0.046. August, minus 0 0.025. September, minus 0 0.035. October, minus 0 0.047, November, 0 0.012, December, 0 0.025. Station, Montgomery, Alabama. Normal daily rainfall for 20 years, 0.147. Departures, January, 0 0.014, February, 0 0.049, March, 0 0.049, April, 0 0.031, May, minus 0 0.010. June, 0 0.014, July, minus 0 0.010, August, minus 0 0.024, September, minus 0 0.041, October, minus 0 0.062, November, minus 0 0.026, December, 0 0.015. Except in New England, the entire watershed of the Atlantic coast experiences a type of rainfall distribution which extends to the drainage basin of the upper Ohio River. This type is called the Atlantic, and is one wherein the distribution throughout the year is nearly uniform. The rainfall of Philadelphia, record of 73 years, shows that the minimum daily rainfall of October and January is 73% of the maximum daily fall in August. The most copious precipitation occurs after the summer solstice, while the minimum rainfall is, as a rule, during the mid or late autumn, the increases until early spring being very small and irregular. Generally, it may be said that a well-marked tendency obtains along the coast toward August as the month of maximum rainfall. With increasing distance from the Atlantic Ocean, and probably owing to the influence of the trans-Appalachian types, the time of greatest precipitation generally shifts to July, where the minimum rainfall, which occurs during November from Florida to western New York, gradually changes to October along the slopes of the Appalachian Range and the Upper Ohio Valley, as shown in both phases by records of Augusta, Georgia, and Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. 
the effect of interference of the st lawrence type extending southward is evident at troy new york in its maximum of february and march and even as far as philadelphia it exercises a very slight influence normal daily rainfall and departures therefrom values are in fractions of an inch station charleston south carolina normal daily rainfall for sixty two years point one three three departures january minus point zero three eight february minus point zero three zero march minus point zero one nine april minus point zero five zero may minus point zero one four june point zero two zero july point zero seven five august point zero nine seven september point zero five zero october minus point zero two six november minus point zero five two december minus point zero three one station fort monroe virginia normal daily rainfall for fifty five years point one one seven departures january minus point zero one eight february minus point zero one one march minus point zero zero two april minus point zero one three may point zero zero one june point zero zero six july point zero three two august point zero three seven september point zero zero five october minus point zero two zero november minus point zero one eight december minus point zero zero five station philadelphia pennsylvania normal daily rainfall for sixty three years point one one seven departures january minus point zero one two february minus point zero zero nine march minus point zero zero seven april minus point zero zero one may point zero zero four june point zero one five july point zero one three august point zero two six september point zero 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 october minus point zero one two november minus point zero zero six december minus point zero zero six station newark new jersey normal daily rainfall for forty four years point one two six departures january minus point zero zero eight february point zero zero one march minus point zero zero four april minus point zero zero eight may point zero zero two june minus point zero zero seven july point zero one two august point zero three eight september minus point zero zero one october minus point zero one one november minus point zero zero five december minus point zero zero three station augusta georgia normal daily rainfall for twenty two years point one three zero departures january point zero one four february point zero one zero march minus point zero zero three april minus point zero zero five may minus point zero one nine june point zero one one july point zero three five august point zero two four september point zero zero three october minus point zero four four november minus point zero one eight december minus point zero one two station pittsburgh pennsylvania normal daily rainfall for twenty two years point one zero three departures january point zero 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 february minus point zero zero one march minus point zero one zero april minus point zero one two may point zero zero six june point zero one nine july point zero five four august point zero zero seven september minus point zero one five october minus point zero one nine november minus point zero one six december minus point zero one four station troy new york normal daily rainfall for sixty years point zero nine nine departures january minus point zero two zero february minus point zero two three march minus point zero two two april minus point zero zero seven may point zero zero three june point zero three zero july point zero three two august point zero one one september point zero zero four october point zero one two november minus point zero zero one december minus point zero one seven station new york city normal daily rainfall for fifty three years point one two six departures january minus point zero one zero february minus point zero zero two march minus point zero zero six april minus point zero zero eight may point zero zero seven june point zero zero six july point zero zero three august point zero two five 
September, minus 0 0.004, October, minus 0 0.011, November, 0 0.000, December, minus 0 0.003. In New England, the Atlantic type is seriously modified and the character of the distribution, difficult to determine with exactness owing to the slight variations, is possibly affected by the interference of the St. Lawrence type. In consequence, we find in New England a composite type in which the August maximum of the Atlantic type is generally primary and a November maximum secondary, though in some localities these maxima are reversed in order of their importance. The Atlantic November minimum is replaced by a June primary minimum, while secondary minimum falls in some localities in September and in others in April. Normal daily rainfall and departures therefrom. Values are in fractions of an inch. Stations. Waltham, Massachusetts. Normal daily rainfall for 64 years, 0 0.115. Departures. January, minus 0 0.016. February, minus 0 0.019. March, minus 0 0.003, April, 0 0.010, May, 0 0.000, June, minus 0 0.010, July, 0 0.005, August, 0 0.031, September, minus 0 0.004, October, 0 0.003, November, 0 0.021, December, minus 0 0.018. Station, Amherst, Massachusetts, normal daily rainfall for 52 years, 0.122. Departures. January, minus 0 0.014. February, minus 0 0.009. March, minus 0 0.011. April, minus 0 0.016. May, 0 0.003. June, 0 0.003. July, 0 0.022. August, 0 0.021. September, minus 0 0.007. October, 0 0.003. November, 0 0.006. December, minus 0 0.006. Station, Lowell, Massachusetts, normal daily rainfall for 62 years, 0.125. Departures, January, minus 0 0.017, February, minus 0 0.013, March, minus 0 0.003, April, 0 0.005, May, 0 0.004, June, minus 0 0.003, July, 0 0.001, August, 0 0.028, September, minus 0 0.007, October, 0 0.003, November 0 0.016, December minus 0 0.010. Station, New Bedford, Massachusetts. Normal daily rainfall for 75 years, 0 0.127. Departures. January minus 0 0.001, February 0 0.008, March 0 0.008, April 0 0.005, May 0 0.000, June minus 0 0.022, July minus 0 0.019, August, minus 0 0.011, September, minus 0 0.011, October, 0 0.000, November, 0 0.017, December, 0 0.006. Station, Hanover, New Hampshire, normal daily rainfall for 50 years, 0 0.100. Departures, January, minus 0 0.006, February, minus 0 0.017, March, minus 0 0.024, April, minus 0 0.021, May, 0 0.006, June, 0 0.015, July, 0 0.012, August, 0 0.018, September, 0 0.000, October, 0 0.010, November, 0 0.027, December, minus 0 0.109. Station, Lunenburg, Vermont. Normal daily rainfall for 40 years, 0 0.110. Departures, January, minus 0 0.013, February, minus 0 0.008, March, minus 0 0.005, April, minus 0 0.021, May, 0 0.005, June, 0 0.022, July, 0 0.018, August, 0 0.009, September, 0 0.001, October, 0 0.004, November, minus 0 0.003, December, minus 0 0.015. Station, Gardiner, Maine. Normal daily rainfall for 50 years, 0 0.121. Departures. January, minus 0 0.009. February, 0 0.007. March, 0 0.006. April, minus 0 0.008. May, 0 0.001. June, minus 0 0.014. July, minus 0 0.013. August, 0 0.000. September, minus 0 0.012. October, 
0.023, November, 0 0.022, December, 0 0.001. Station, Boston, Massachusetts. Normal daily rainfall for 74 years, 0.129. Departures, January, minus 0 0.001, February, 0 0.005, March, 0 0.012, April, 0 0.006, May, minus 0 0.007, June, minus 0 0.020, July, minus 0 0.009, August, 0 0.013, September, minus 0 0.011, October, minus 0 0.005, November, 0 0.015, December, minus 0 0 0.001. The distribution of rain through the St. Lawrence Valley, although of composite type, probably merits from its peculiarity to be designated separately as the St. Lawrence type. The characteristics are scarcity of precipitation during the spring months, April being very decidedly the month of least rainfall, followed by October, and a heavy rainfall during the late summer and late autumn months, with the maximum precipitation in November and nearly as heavy rain in July or August. The heavy rainfalls of the St. Lawrence Valley during November are the more remarkable in view of the fact that in this month the minimum precipitation occurs from northern Florida to central New York. Detailed data regarding this type is not at hand, but Professor Charles Carpmael, Chief of the Meteorological Service of the Dominion of Canada, is authority for the statement that the minimum precipitation occurs in April at Kingston, Rockcliffe, Montreal, Quebec, Farther Point, Sauguin, and Perry Sound, as well as through the province of New Brunswick. It is interesting to note that in the composite rainfall types of Newfoundland and New Brunswick, as well as along the greater part of the Massachusetts and Maine coasts, the November maximum obtains, and is as a rule the principal maximum, with March as the month of secondary maximum, although in some localities these maxima are reversed in order of importance. There may possibly be added a gulf type, so called from its prevalence along the northern shores of the Gulf of Mexico, where the maximum rain falls in September and the minimum in the early spring. Western Florida and the Texas coasts are the only sections in which this obtains. The normal daily rainfall at Key West, Florida of 47 years is 0 .107 inch, with departures as follows. January, minus 0 .038, February, minus 0 .050, March, minus 0 .062, April, minus 0 .064, May, minus 0 .006, June, 0 .044, July, 0 .022, August, 0 .055, September 0 0.111, October 0 0.053, November minus 0 0.038, and December minus 0 0.043 inch. It is not within the scope of this paper to discuss the special causes which produce these differing types of rainfall distribution in North America. It may be said, however, that there is no doubt in my mind that the maxima and minima phases of precipitation are simply the result of the fluctuation throughout the year of atmospheric pressure over North America and its contiguous waters, thus affecting the relative positions of high and low areas, and consequently causing winds either favorable or unfavorable to precipitation, according to season and locality. End of section 5section six of the national geographic magazine volume five this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by marianne the natural bridge of virginia by charles d walcott the natural bridge of virginia is one of those striking geographic features of america which like niagara falls and many other natural features will in time disappear under the action of the agencies of erosion. The same forces that create it will ultimately destroy them. In the case of Niagara, the rate of wear of the platform over which the water rushes has been measured and the rate of retreat of the falls of the stream is known. Natural bridge is slowly but surely wearing away, and it appears to be desirable to record by photographs and notes the present condition of the bridge as a means of determining in the future the changes that occur from time to time. For this purpose a set of photographs, with notes taken in 1891, have been placed in the Library of the United States Geological Survey. The present article includes a few observations on the origin and the present condition of the bridge. The accompanying view, 
forming plate 21, is one looking northward through the arch, and it accurately represents the condition of the bridge and canyon at the time it was taken. It may be that a more detailed description, with a full series of views, will be published in the future. During the field season of 1891, I studied the rocks exposed along the channel of Cedar Creek, a small tributary of the James River in Rockbridge County, Virginia. The first strata met with in passing up from the river are highly inclined limestones and shales of middle or upper Cambrian age. These are succeeded by the massive Knox Dolomites, which are nearly vertical or inclined slightly westward. A few hundred feet below Natural Bridge, the westward dip decreases very rapidly, and at the bridge the beds are nearly horizontal, while a short distance above they are rising westward and dipping eastward toward the bridge at an angle of 5 degrees to 10 degrees. This increases to 20 degrees to 25 degrees higher up the stream. A diagrammatic section of the rocks cut through in the canyon of Cedar Creek gives the outline shown in Figure 1. The bridge is at A, Lace Falls at B, and James River at C. No attempt is made to show the depth of the canyon or gorge through which Cedar Creek flows. It is not supposed that the present Cedar Creek began to wear its channel across the edges of the upturned beds from B to C when the present topographic features were established. On the contrary, it began its work long before, under conditions and in rocks that have since disappeared in the general erosion of the surrounding country. The course of the stream was determined by circumstances connected with the life history of James River. When the latter obtained a new lease of active life, and lowered its channel through the Blue Ridge, Cedar Creek began to cut down its bed in the Peneplain and to prepare the way for the possibility of the existence of an arch over its channel. The general mode of formation has long been described for this and other natural rock bridges. In this case, in detail, it is considered to be as follows. Cedar Creek was engaged for a considerable period in excavating the gorge from the James River to a point not far below the present site of the bridge, where a fall appears to have existed, the summit of which was not far, if at all, below the present level of the top of the bridge. About this time the water found a subterranean passage in the limestone further up the stream than the present site of the bridge, and through this it flowed and discharged beneath the brink of the falls. The passage generally enlarged until all the waters of the creek passed through it, and the bridge began its existence. What the length of this subterranean passage was is a matter of conjecture. It may have been one hundred or several hundred feet. All of its roof has disappeared except the narrow span of the bridge, and the abutting walls have been worn back by erosion until the gorge or canyon is much wider than at the bridge. The bridge is massive and strong, and the supporting walls rise in solid, almost unbroken, mural faces to the spring of the arch, nearly two hundred feet above the bed of Cedar Creek as clearly shown in the accompanying plate, which is reproduced mechanically from a photograph taken by the author. The position of the massive layers of limestone at the center of the low synclinal gives them power to resist erosion to a much greater extent than the upturned strata above and below the bridge. The condition of the latter favors rapid disintegration, and the result is shown in the widening of the gorge. The retreating lower level of the stream is now at Lace Falls, nearly a mile above the bridge. The gorge below the bridge widens out more rapidly, owing partly to the erosion caused by a small brook that enters from the north, partly to the greater period of erosion to which it has been subjected. On the northern side, opposite Pulpit Rock, about twenty feet west of the public road, the summit of the bridge is 236 feet above the water, and this part of the arch has a thickness of 44 feet and a span of from 45 to 60 feet. The western edge is about 10 feet higher and the eastern edge about 10 feet lower than the central point. The massive layers of limestone forming the bridge are gradually wearing away on the outer edges from the action of water and frost. If water breaks were arranged so that the water could not flow in upon the bridge and about it from the southwestern side, and if a shed with watertight roof were built over the arch, disintegration and destruction would be indefinitely postponed. As it is, it will be many centuries before the natural processes of erosion now at work upon and within the arch will completely break it down. 
Since the proceeding was written, an article has appeared in the New York Tribune of May 15, 1893, in which an account is given of the discovery of a passage in the limestones near Natural Bridge that extends from the plain above down to the stream below. It is described as follows. The passage was probably created by a stream of water finding a crevice in the limestone mountain, and by the gnawing of gases, the same causes that created the natural bridge. But it has all the appearance of design and purpose. A brief description by one who has recently seen it, in the light of hundreds of candles, shows at the entrance a room about twenty feet by ten, with a ceiling sixty feet in height, then a low arched doorway into a room narrower than the former and extending forty or fifty feet up a steep flight of steps. The arches here are from fifteen to twenty feet in height, and their color a liquid blue. There are a few stalactites from the ceiling and many crystal forms on the wall. Turning here from a direct course through another arched doorway, beautifully decorated, about six feet in height, there is a round room, twenty feet in diameter and perhaps fifty feet from pit to dome. Out of the side of this springs a stone cascade, perfect as any waterfall, transparent at the lower edge, about ten feet in length and eight in breadth. As the light is thrown upon this, it has all the appearance of a living waterfall. A passage under this, over a bridge, leads to a labyrinth barely wide enough for one to pass. The arch is about fifteen feet in height, and the walls glisten like polished marble. These windings extend about thirty feet, and open into a well-shaped room, not at any point more fifteen feet in diameter, and opening, about thirty feet above, to the sky. From the description it is evident that the passage was worn by percolating waters that found their way from the plain above to the base level cut by the stream below, along some previously existing crevices. This process of erosion may be seen at the underground river between Natural Bridge and Lace Falls, where a strong current of water flows through a channel in the limestone that is about ten feet above the level of Cedar Creek and only exposed to view for a few feet of its length. All of the phenomena observed at Natural Bridge and in the canyon of Cedar Creek are repeated in many limestone regions. Sometimes they give rise to underground caverns, as at Mammoth Cave, and more rarely to canyons and natural bridges. The illustration at the Natural Bridge is one of the finest known, and worthy of study by anyone interested in geologic phenomena or the beauty in nature. End of Section 6 Section 7 of the National Geographic Magazine, Volume 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phil Schempf. The Geographical Position and Height of Mount St. Elias by Dr. T. C. Mendenhall. In connection with the survey of the boundary line between Alaska and the British Northwest Territory, it became necessary to determine the geographical position of Mount St. Elias. Previous approximate determinations had shown that the peak of this mountain must be very near the 141st meridian, which constitutes the greater part of this boundary line, and that its distance from the sea coast must be very nearly 10 marine leagues which by treaty is to determine the position of the line in the absence of a range of mountains parallel to the windings of the coast. It thus appeared that this peak is likely to prove of very great value as a cornerstone of this great boundary line, being at the junction of the 141st meridian and that part of the line which is so vaguely defined in the treaty. The execution of the work in the immediate vicinity of the mountain was entrusted to assistants J. E. McGrath and J. Henry Turner, whose previous explorations and long residence in the interior of Alaska in connection with the determination of the 141st meridian are well known to the members of this society. The complete reduction of the observations made has not yet been accomplished but enough has been done to show the geographical position of the mountain peak within a very small air, and the society will probably be interested in the preliminary results of this work, which are not likely to be modified sensibly by the completed calculations. The field work was executed during the summer of 1892. 
the party was carried to the working ground by the coast survey steamer hassler in command of captain harbour who personally took great interest in the work and facilitated its successful performance very much taking a very important part in fact in the determination of the difference of longitude between sitka and the astronomical station at yakutat bay in the absence of telegraphic connection with any of these points a series of chronometric journeys was made between tacoma which is near one of the telegraph longitude stations of the great system of the united states coast and geodetic survey and sitka which has been fixed as the base of the longitude work throughout the territory of alaska contemporaneously a series of journeys was made between sitka and the astronomical station at yakutat bay by the coast survey steamer hassler and by these two loops the longitude of the stations was connected with that of the telegraphic system of the united states time observations at tacoma and the comparison of chronometers at that point were under the direction of assistant j f pratt six complete chronometer tours from tacoma to sitka and return were made on board of the steamer queen the chronometers being in charge of mr t d davidson of san francisco this link having also been taken in by the hassler chronometers on her way to and from the field seven complete journeys are available between tacoma and sitka six complete journeys between sitka and the astronomical station at yakutat bay were made an astronomical station was established at sitka under the direction of subassistant fremont morse who had charge of time observations and the comparison of both sets of chronometers on reaching that point seven chronometers made the journeys between tacoma and sitka and the same number between sitka and yakutat bay the astronomical station at the latter place was in charge of assistant j henry turner the connection of this station trigonometrically with the summit of mount st elias was under the direction of assistant j e mcgrath this astronomical station was on the south side of yakutat bay and the measured baseline from which the triangulation was developed was on the northern side the length of this line was a little less than seven thousand meters or about four and a half miles the scheme of triangulation is shown on the accompanying sketch figure two the latitude of the astronomical station was determined by the vertical circle observations of the sun's limb by the method of circummeridian altitudes and also by the use of a meridian telescope and the talcott differential method the vertical circle used was ten inches in diameter and read to five seconds by means of four veneers the latitude here given depends on these observations as those made by the meridian telescope have not yet been reduced of the six chronometric tours between sitka and yakutat bay three only have been reduced and the results are as follows first trip june eight to thirteen difference of longitude seven minutes forty eight point one seven seconds second trip june twenty four to twenty nine difference of longitude seventeen minutes forty eight point three one seconds third trip july nine to fourteen difference of longitude seventeen minutes forty eight point one six seconds of which the indiscriminate mean is seventeen minutes forty eight point two one seconds a preliminary reduction of a portion of the chronometric comparisons between tacoma and sitka gives for the longitude of sitka nine hours one minute twenty point five seconds from which we have the adopted longitude of yakutat astronomical station nine hours nineteen minutes eight point seven seconds the latitude of this station from circummeridian observations on the sun's limb consisting of sixteen pointings on the sun near culmination on august first eighteen ninety two was fifty nine degrees thirty three minutes fifty one point eight seconds and on august eleventh eighteen ninety two from twenty pointings the result was fifty nine degrees thirty three minutes forty eight point two seconds the mean of which is fifty nine degrees thirty three minutes fifty seconds which is accepted as the latitude of this station 
subject of course to further small correction from the reduction of the results obtained from the meridian telescope work extending these coordinates to the summit of mount st elias by means of the scheme of triangulation as shown in the sketch the latitude of the summit is found to be sixty degrees seventeen minutes thirty five seconds and the longitude one hundred and forty degrees fifty five minutes twenty one point five seconds the principal base for the determination of the position of the summit of the mountain was a line connecting mount hortz and south base the length of this line was a little less than thirty eight thousand meters or about twenty three and one half miles and the angle which is subtended at mount st elias was about twenty degrees incidentally in connection with this work the height of the summit of the mountain was determined a series of zenith distance measurements was executed from five stations namely north base south base mount hortz ocean cape and the astronomical station at the latter point observations were made on fourteen different days the result for each day is the mean of three sets of six repetitions each and the series is as follows the observations being made near noon zenith distance of mount st elias june eleventh eighteen ninety two eighty seven degrees twenty minutes fifty point three seconds june eighteenth eighteen ninety two eighty seven degrees twenty minutes sixty four point two seconds june twenty seventh eighteen ninety two eighty seven degrees twenty minutes fifty one point eight seconds june twenty eighth eighteen ninety two eighty seven degrees twenty minutes fifty one point three seconds july ninth eighteen ninety two eighty seven degrees twenty minutes fifty seven point one seconds july tenth eighteen ninety two eighty seven degrees twenty minutes forty nine point eight seconds july eleventh eighteen ninety two eighty seven degrees twenty minutes forty four point eight seconds july thirteenth eighteen ninety two eighty seven degrees twenty minutes forty point six seconds july twenty third eighteen ninety two eighty seven degrees twenty minutes fifty nine point eight seconds july twenty ninth eighteen ninety two eighty seven degrees twenty minutes thirty six point one seconds august first eighteen ninety two eighty seven degrees twenty minutes fifty three point six seconds august eleventh eighteen ninety two eighty seven degrees twenty minutes fifty two point zero seconds august seventeenth eighteen ninety two eighty seven degrees twenty minutes fifty point eight seconds august eighteenth eighteen ninety two eighty seven degrees twenty minutes forty one point two seconds mean of fourteen days eighty seven degrees twenty minutes fifty point two seconds it will be seen that in the total fourteen days of observation the range of variability in the vertical angles amounted to but twenty eight seconds indicating remarkable steadiness in atmospheric conditions the observations for height at other stations although less numerous are extremely satisfactory the great uniformity of the final results for the height of the mountain as computed from observations at the five different stations is exhibited in the following table the remarkably close agreement of these figures is satisfactory evidence that this determination of the height of the mountain is such as to leave little to be desired summary of height and position mount st elias from north base eighteen thousand fourteen feet south base eighteen thousand twelve feet mount hortz eighteen thousand seventeen feet ocean cape eighteen thousand twelve feet astronomical station eighteen thousand feet 
height adopted mean eighteen thousand ten feet latitude sixty degrees seventeen minutes thirty five seconds longitude one hundred and forty degrees fifty five minutes twenty one point five seconds it is interesting to note that in the light of the information of the last year or two it can no longer be claimed that mount st elias is the highest peak upon the continent this distinction seems to belong to mount orizaba in mexico which has recently been measured by means of railroad levels and trigonometrically by dr j t scoville of terre haute indiana the height of this mountain as obtained by dr scoville is eighteen thousand three hundred fourteen feet the character of the observations is such that it does not seem likely that this result will be found to be very many feet in error it therefore appears to be entirely safe to say that orizaba is the highest peak in north america and that its altitude exceeds by two or three hundred feet that of mount st elias a detailed report on the latter mountain together with the results of revised and complete calculations will be published in due time end of section seven section eight of the national geographic magazine volume five this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by april walters the improvement of geographical teaching by professor william morris davis presented before the society february third eighteen ninety three the improvements needed in teaching geography in our schools involve a fuller investigation of the facts of the subject a better knowledge of these facts by teachers and a more skillful use of them in the processes of teaching as a society we are less concerned with the last two necessities than with the first but i may briefly state my belief that skillful teaching goes along closely with fullness of knowledge the third need will therefore be largely cared for when the second is supplied but fullness of knowledge cannot be expected of a teacher while her understanding of the geographical features of the world and of our own country and of the home state in particular is gained only from the impoverished statements of the ordinary textbooks and while original sources in which she may seek additional information are generally so few so inaccessible and so far below the standards of modern geographical research it might truly be said that even if better sources of information were within reach little use could be made of them for we must recognize the great difficulties under which the teachers in our public schools labor the variety of subjects that they have to teach the overlarge number of scholars in their classes the restrictions that tend to smother their individuality the fatigue following many tiresome duties the smallness of salary by which freedom of action toward large opportunities is hampered would that some means of overcoming these difficulties might be devised but at present it does not seem so practical to turn our action as a society in this direction as to look to remedying the fundamental need the need of a fuller investigation of the facts it may not be generally recognized by our members that there is still great need of exploration close at home it is not only in the further corners of the world that discoveries are to be made nearly every state in our country must be much more carefully studied than it has yet been before its physical features will be made known to us the geographical descriptions now available in print would be very gently characterized if only called old-fashioned where newer material has been published it is generally fragmentary brief and imperfectly illustrated the first elements of geographical study the physical features of the earth especially of its surface still call for devoted investigation it is not simply a description of the forms of the land that is wanted it is a recognition of the forms as dependent on structure and sculpture and a comparison of like and unlike forms in a systematic manner this requires special study precisely as petrography does and the desired end will not be gained until the work is placed in the hands of men especially trained for it having found this study an absorbing interest for several years past i shall try to make my meaning clearer by introducing specific illustrations from new england southern new england consists essentially of a gently inclined plateau rising to one thousand four hundred or one thousand six hundred feet above sea level in the rolling uplands of western massachusetts 
and southwestern New Hampshire, and thence descending gradually southward and eastward to sea level at the coast. Footnote. Nearly all the districts thus referred to in the address were illustrated by lantern slides. This inclined plateau is nothing more than a slightly tilted lowland of denudation, the product of long-continued destructive action of the atmosphere, by which a once larger mass was worn down to a surface of moderate relief, close to the base level of its time. The southeastern extension of the old lowland was depressed beneath the sea at the same time that its interior portion was elevated to form our New England plateau. The present coastline therefore lies roughly midway on the surface of old New England. The continuity of the plateau-like uplands is interrupted in two ways. Isolated mountains rise above it, and branching valleys sink below it. Mount Monadnock is a typical example of the former, with its bold summit more than a thousand feet above the surrounding plateau. When seen from a distance to the southwest, it rises in symmetrical triangular outline above the level skyline of its base. It is not a mountain of local construction, raised by upheaval among above the mass of the plateau, it is simply an unconsumed remnant of the greater mass of unknown dimensions and form from which the old lowland was carved. When the lowland was uplifted, Monadnock and its fellows were raised with it. In my teaching, Monadnock has come to be recognized as an example of a distinct group of forms, and its name is used as having a generic value. A long paragraph of explanation is packed away when describing some other mountain as a Monadnock of greater or less height. The valleys by which the plateau is dissected have all been excavated since the uplift of the old lowland. Where the plateau is high, the valleys are sunk deep below it. The Deerfield Valley in northwestern Massachusetts is a full thousand feet deep. Where the uplift was small near the coast, the valleys are shallow. Where the rocks are hard, as is generally the case, the valleys are narrow, like that of the Deerfield above named. Where the rocks are soft, the valleys are wider illustrating the general principle that nature, mature and old forms are more rapidly developed on soft than on hard rocks. The Berkshire Valley, excavated in limestone between crystalline rocks and schists, is six or more miles wide. The Connecticut Valley, excavated in weak sandstones, is even wider, forming a valley lowland ten or fifteen miles from side to side and broadly dividing the plateau into eastern and western portions. Occasional beds of hard rocks, Chiefly ancient lava flows occur in the sandstone belts and are much less eroded. They form ridges rising far above the lowland and indeed still retain nearly the height of the adjacent plateaus. Mount Holyoke, opposite Northampton, is a type of these ridges. It holds, essentially, the same relation to the lowland that Monadnock holds to the plateau. Both are residual mountains of harder rocks, but the two manifestly belong to different generations of geographical development. It appears from this brief outline that our New England geography is of composite quality. The uplands with their residual mountains represent the closing stages of one generation or cycle of development. The valleys represent the more or less advanced beginning of another cycle. The distribution of our villages and our occupations, the lines of travel and the movements of population may all be shown to depend largely on the topographic forms thus classified. By following some plan of treatment such as this, it becomes possible to make just comparisons between different regions. For example, a close correspondence may be found between our dissected New England Plateau and the Hundrochtanus Plateau, through which the Rhine has cut its famous gorge below Bingen. Footnote. Excellent lantern slides of this picturesque region may be had from dealers, much better, in fact, than can be found for our scenery at home, although the latter is much more important for the schools. End footnote. Here we find an even upland, with occasional eminences rising above it, and with deep valleys sunk below it. The eminences on the plateau are there, as with us, residuals of a once much greater mass, rising moderately above a base-leveled surface. The valleys are the work of a later cycle of development, inaugurated when the old base-leveled surface was uplifted to its present altitude. In all this, Southern New England and the plateau of the Middle Rhine are thoroughly homologous, but certain significant differences between the two regions should be noted. The plateau of the Middle Rhine is so extremely flat-topped that it must be conceived as having advanced further in its first cycle of denudation than New England, 
Indeed, it is the best illustration of a smoothly base-leveled area that I have found, and serves me as a type of such form. On the other hand, its valleys are much narrower than ours, hence its second cycle must be regarded as less advanced than ours. Both regions possess composite topography, including similar elements, but the stages in the two cycles of development represented in each case do not precisely agree. I cannot now delay to illustrate other elements of our New England topography, even in so brief a manner as the plateau, with its residual mountains and its initiated valleys, has been treated, but I may record my conviction, based on experience with scholars of different ages and with teachers in schools of various grades, that all our geographical features, when studied out in a manner similar to that outlined above, become luminous in comparison with the obscurity of the conventional accounts in our school books. The drowned valleys that form our bays, the drowned rivers that form our estuaries, at once gain a new meaning when thus explained, and it is not a little remarkable to see how little recognition there is in general teaching of the control exerted by depression of the land on the form of its coastline. Look at Narangasat Bay, the fjord of the Thames at Norwich, the Connecticut above Saybrook, of the Housatonic toward Birmingham, of the Hudson even up to Albany, all drowned like Pagati's brothers at old Yarmouth. Yet what schoolboy ever hears our coastal rivers thus simply and rationally characterized? Look at the sprawling outline of Greece and ask our classical scholars if they describe it as a rugged mountainous region standing up in the Mediterranean up to its knees. And yet how effective is the homely comparison? It is the same with the results of glacial action. The textbooks of geography are practically silent on this important topic. Yet many features of glacial origin must be known, in fact, to every boy who has ever rambled through the woods on his half-holidays. Our gravel ridges and mounds and our sand plains may be reckoned as a characteristic of our home geography, as Lowell's Bigelow papers are of Yankee dialect. It is a pity that they are not duly mentioned in our schools and compared with the suggestive fund of fresh material brought by Russell from Alaska and so honorably associated with the name of our society. The comparison that may be drawn here is as fair as that instituted already between New England and the Plateau in the Middle Rhine, but the two comparisons are of different kinds. The comparison of the two plateaus associate distant regions that are now alike. The comparison of New England and Alaska employs the present of the latter region to illustrate the past of the former, and this style of comparison is extremely suggestive in geographic study. For several years past, some of my more advanced students have chosen as subjects for their theses the physical geography of various states with which they were more or less familiar from residence or field observations, or with which they be wished to become familiar. They have thus had occasion to search the literature of each state for accounts of its physical features, and the search has generally been without large reward. The practice has been useful, but the product has not been great. It is this want of material that convinces me that nothing less than the direct exploration of our home country, with the single object of investigating its topographical development, will secure the facts that are now needed in geographical teaching, and thus we return to the general question that was laid aside while southern New England was before us. It is, of course, impossible in the limits of this address to give a full statement of the scheme of systematic geography the appreciation of which seems to me essential in the desired exploration and investigation, but there are two leading principles which I may outline, since without them no progress can be made. The first is that every landform passes through a comparatively systematic series of changes from its youth, when its form is defined chiefly by constructional processes, past its maturity, when the processes of sub-aerial sculpture have carved a great variety of moldings and channelings, toward its old age, in which the accomplishment of the full measure of denudation reduces the mass essentially to base level, however high it may have been originally. I have become accustomed to call this unmeasured time a geographical cycle. It may be long for a structure of hard rocks, or shorter for a structure of weak rocks, but in both the sequence of immature, mature, and senile forms is essential. The particular expression of these forms varies with the structure of the mass concerned, but for every structure there is an appropriate sequence of young, mature, and old features. It is therefore important to determine, in accordance with this fundamental principle, the stage in which any given area stands in its life's journey. 
the standard descriptions of many of our states gives no such account of their topographic forms and the student or teacher who seeks it has little reward the account is needed not only because the reader can gather from it a better understanding of the relations of a region to the rest of the world but also because such an account enables him to appreciate much more closely and more easily the actual forms of the region itself a second important principle is in a measure a corollary of the first at any time during a geographical cycle a land area may be disturbed by depression or elevation a new relation is then established with the base level of drainage and a new cycle of denudation is introduced the forms developed by denudation in the first incomplete cycle then become as it were the constructional forms of the new cycle and from those as a beginning the forces of denudation go on anew this combination of the topographic features developed in the two cycles produces what i have called composite topography and this is of extremely common occurrence for an example we may again refer to the dissected plateau of southern new england the upland with its residual mountains is the product of an earlier cycle the valleys are the work of a later cycle the glacial features may be referred merely to a short-lived climactic episode in later in the second cycle so brief was the occupation of the country with ice compared to the time required for the excavation of the valleys in the uplifted plateau geographical descriptions and the appreciation of them are greatly advanced by a recognition of these principles they are essentially simple conceptions but the variety of their application is infinite the work of more than two cycles may not infrequently be recognized thus in pennsylvania the crest lines of the appalachian ridges are remnants of an uplifted and almost consumed plateau of cretaceous denudation of which only the hardest parts now remain the open valley lowlands between the ridges are the product of a tertiary excavation in the uplifted plateau the narrow trends in which the rivers traverse the lowlands are of post tertiary origin many points of view may be selected on the susquehanna where these three elements of the landscape stand out with much distinctness and the pleasure of their contemplation is greatly increased by the recognition of their distinct condition of origin in successive geographical cycles or during successive uplifts of the land what is the most effective way in which we can promote the advance of geographic investigation and secure accounts and illustrations of our home country in accordance with a systematic and scientific method it has seemed to me that appeal might be profitably made for the cooperation of the directors of the various state geological surveys i therefore propose to ask the directors of our various state geological surveys to devote annually a part of their funds to the study of the physical features of their domains in the light of modern geographical science provided that the terms of their appropriation bills will allow them to cover this side of the geological field and if not i shall hope that special appropriations of moderate amount may be made for this particular purpose experts should be employed for this work as they are now in paleontology and petrography the results thus gained would appear in successive annual reports brief at first increasing in scope as opportunity offers and setting forth the larger and smaller elements of the topography in such simple style and with such comparisons and illustrations as should be of immediate value to teachers in grammar schools and high schools the state boards of education might secure special reprints of these geographical chapters at very moderate cost for distribution as state products to all public libraries and to all public schools of the higher grades much in the same way as the energetic commissioners of the topographic survey of rhode island have secured the distribution of their state map free to all their public schools and libraries the legislature would soon see the employment of these geographical chapters year after year by thousands of teachers the appreciation that this hitherto undeveloped economic field might receive from those occupied with the advance of public education and assured support would then be given to the work even on a large scale by some such practical steps we may secure material advance in the quality of geographical instruction during the past year i have had many illustrations of the need of material geographical of the kind here referred to teachers in our public school are well aware that they have not now the fuller account of the facts that they would enjoy and yet they know not where to turn to find what they need many teachers principals and superintendents with whom i have spoken admit at once that the books to which they now have access are quite insufficient to satisfy their wants and they listen gladly to any feasible plan that will provide a more extended and more scientific description and explanation of the facts of geography near at home 
with which they have to deal from their earliest to their latest teaching. Geologists or geographers who are already acquainted with our local geography from personal experience can perform a grateful service to the schools by preparing elementary accounts of the regions with which they are familiar, and such books as these should be greatly multiplied. But, so far as I have been able to learn, it is only the smaller part of our country that is now known well enough to those who can be prevailed on to write elementary books, and hence the importance of actual geographical exploration in order to supply our teachers with what they need. If some such plan as the one proposed above were put in operation, it might come to pass in a decade or two that the graduates of our common schools would not be so blinded as they now are to the facts of their home geography. Harvard University, Cambridge, Massachusetts. End of Section 8. Section 9 of the National Geographic Magazine, Volume 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phil Schempf. An Undiscovered Island Off the Northern Coast of Alaska, Part 1, by Marcus Baker. On a map of the polar regions, published in Gotha 11 years ago, land is indicated as existing about 150 miles north northeastward from Point Barrow, the northernmost point of Alaska. The position of this land is latitude 73 and one half degrees north and longitude 153 one half degree west of Greenwich. I have not succeeded in finding this land indicated on any other map, neither have I found any published statement respecting it. In the summer of 1849, Callet and Moore, in the Arctic search vessels Herald and Plover, cruised in the Arctic Ocean between Point Barrow and Herald Island, searching for Sir John Franklin. It was during this cruise that Herald Island was discovered and landed upon, and the high peaks of what we now know to be Wrangell Island were seen to the westward. In the map accompanying their report, an appearance of land is shown in latitude 72 and one half degrees north, longitude 161 and one half degrees west of Greenwich, being about 130 miles northwest of Point Barrow. On a small map accompanying Osborne's stray leaves from an Arctic journal, land is indicated in the same locality, as also on an undated map published by Longman in London in 1850 or 1851. Russian hydrographic chart number 1495, published in 1854, also shows land here, with a note, indications of land according to the report of the English sloop Plover in 1849. These four maps are the only ones out of a considerable number examined by me which show this appearance of land, and they are all obviously derived from the same authority, viz. Kellett and Moore. In Kellett's narrative, the only reference to this appearance of land is the following statement at page 14. This was our most northern position. Latitude 72 degrees 51 minutes north, longitude 168 degrees west. The ice, as far as it could be seen from the masthead, trended away west-southwest, compass. Commander Moore and the ice master reported a water sky to the north of the pack, and a strong ice blink to the southwest. It appears obvious from this statement that the evidence of land existing here is very slight. The appearance of land is omitted from all the late maps. It does not appear on the British Admiralty charts, nor on the charts of our own hydrographic office or coast survey. Indeed, on hydrographic chart 68, a sounding of 54 fathoms, muddy bottom, is shown in this place. It is clear, I think, that land does not exist here. Now, on the circumpolar map first mentioned, the land shown north-northeast to Point Barrow is about 150 miles northeast of the place where Kellett's appearance of land is shown. I had supposed, before examination, that these indications referred to the same thing, but having made an examination, I am of the opinion that the indication of land shown on the circumpolar map is not derived from Kellett and Moore, 
but from some unpublished source of information that there is an undiscovered or rather unvisited land somewhere north and east of point barrow is a matter of common talk among the whalers who annually visit this region captain john keenan of troy new york master of the whaling bark stambul of new bedford reports that he and all his crew saw it while on a whaling voyage some time during the seventies the eskimos have traditions of this land and of a visit to it by their fathers long ago the known facts respecting this hypothetical or should we not say real land are exceedingly meager and all unpublished it has therefore seemed to me desirable to put these few facts on record and that no place was more suitable than the journal of a society devoted to the increase and diffusion of geographic knowledge the facts have all come to me through my old friend captain e p herendine who at my request has written the account to which these remarks are intended merely as an introduction captain herendine a native of woods hole massachusetts has been for many years engaged in whaling having entered the arctic in pursuit of whales as early as eighteen fifty and has since then made more than a score of voyages to this region i have had the pleasure of making three voyages to the north pacific and arctic oceans in his company in eighteen eighty two eighty three he was a member of the united states signal service party stationed at point barrow he is well acquainted with all the natives on the arctic coast from the east cape of asia eastward to the mouth of the mackenzie river he speaks their language and is universally known to the natives of that region under the name of heretic from the natives and through captain keenan of the whaling fleet he has obtained the following information which he has kindly written out for the national geographic society i beg to suggest the desirability of calling this very little known land keenan island End of section 9section 10 of the national geographic magazine volume 5 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by phil schempf an undiscovered island off the northern coast of alaska part 2 by captain edward perry herendine among the many traditions of the point barrow eskimo the following is not without geographic interest since no account is kept by them of the lapse of time it is impossible to fix a date to any story related by them previous to the life of their father or grandfather their simple answer to any question regarding the date of these occurrences is always the same i draw knee long ago our story is this an eskimo was out on a whale hunt with his umiak and crew in april or may venturing much further than their companions and being encompassed by ice they were carried away to the north and east by the moving pack until at last they came in sight of a strange land after many hardships and the death of most of the crew some at last reached the mainland their own beloved Nuna, greatly exhausted, and related their adventures to wondering listeners. They told of times when starvation grimly threatened, and when the timely catching of a seal or killing of a bear saved them from a dreadful fate, and the skins furnished material to repair their worn garments. These tales, by whomever related, seemed to bear testimony to one point, viz., of land somewhere to the north and east of point barrow which has been seen by some of these people under such circumstances of hardship distress and loss of life as to have fixed the event in their minds and been related by father to son for perhaps many generations it is often told that natives wintering between harrison and camden bays have seen land to the north in the bright clear days of spring in the winter of 1886-87, Uzharlu, an enterprising Eskimo of Utkivi, was very anxious for me to get some captain to take him the following summer, with his family and canoe and outfit, to the northeast as far as the ship went, and then he would try to find this mysterious land, of which he had heard so much, 
but no one cared to bother with this venturesome Eskimo explorer. So confident was this man of the truth of these reports, that he was eager to sail away into the unknown like another Columbus in search of an Eskimo paradise. In the winter of 1887, several of the most intelligent of the Cape Smythe Eskimo came to me about dusk of the evening of February 15th, and reported that three strange men had come up from the southwest along the shore ice, and appeared very weary, but on coming opposite the village, which could not have been seen by the travelers before, they quickened their pace, turned abruptly offshore, and disappeared in the ice pack. It was just as the sun was setting, and the strangers could be seen distinctly, but not until they had gotten into the rough ice did it occur to these people standing on the bank that these three wanderers were strangers indeed, and the more they talked the matter over, the more wonderful it seemed that any tired hunter should pass their village without stopping for rest and refreshment. It was evident that they turned away in fear when they saw the village and the people standing on the bank. Who could these men be who turned away from their hospitable village, where food and a warm welcome awaited them? They reasoned that every man on the coast, from Point Hope to Point Barrow, was known to all the others, and knew he would be welcome to food and shelter. The more they talked, the stranger it seemed, until the conclusion was reached, that these were Inu Tumuktua, lost people and of course their home must be the mysterious land of their father's tradition. As a proof of this, they said these three men wore white clothing, which was most likely made of white bearskins, while the Eskimos of the coast wear brown clothing made of reindeer skins. Another point in favor of their assertion was that these men had no guns, which fact was noted before they turned off shore into the pack. They had spears and a coil of seal line, and used the spears as walking sticks as they plodded wearily along. The circumstance was most strange. Every man in the village of Utkivi gave an account of himself that evening, and I took the trouble to send to Point Barrow the next morning, but none of them had been in that vicinity or were able to throw any light on the subject. From my knowledge of the Eskimo, I am sure no one acquainted would have passed a village without stopping. It was near night, yet these men, in evident alarm, turned offshore into the ice pack and were never seen again. I made arrangements to go out in the morning and trace these men and solve the mystery, but the morning dawned with a fierce blizzard, causing the abandonment of the search, and left us wondering whence they came and whither they went. The only report of land having been seen by civilized man in this vicinity was made by Captain John Keenan of Troy, New York, in the 70s. He was at that time in command of the whaling bark Stambul of New Bedford. Captain Keenan said that after taking several whales, the weather became thick, and he stood to the north under easy sail, and was busily engaged in trying out and stowing down the oil taken. When the fog cleared off, land was distinctly seen to the north, by him and all the men of his crew. But, as he was not on a voyage of discovery, and there were no whales in sight, he was obliged to give the order to keep away to the south in search of them. The success of his voyage depended on keeping among whales. This fact was often discussed among the whalemen on the return of the fleet to San Francisco in the fall. The position of Captain Keenan's ship at the time land was seen has passed from my mind, except that it was between Harrison and Camden Bays. A letter addressed to Captain Keenan by the writer in February, asking for more definite information as to date and position of his ship, and other points of interest, failed to reach him and was returned. End of section 10《セクション11》of the National Geographic Magazine, Volume 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phil Schempf. An Undiscovered Island Off the Northern Coast of Alaska, Part 3, by General A. W. Greeley. Mr. Baker's notes on an undiscovered island off the northern coast of Alaska 
are extremely interesting i am however unable to agree with mr baker in the belief that land exists in the polar sea between point barrow and melville island on my attention being called to the paper and german map of eighteen eighty two i did not at first recall that i had before seen charts marked with the signs of land referred to on latter consideration i remembered maps containing this knowledge and have since examined all maps of arctic america from eighteen forty four to eighteen fifty eight in my private collection and one or two others accessible elsewhere it is interesting to note to what extent these signs of land were credited by map makers of that period for many years chart number two hundred sixty of the hydrographic office of the royal navy was the standard map of the polar regions so far as i have learned there were but two such charts between eighteen thirty five and eighteen eighty six one being that of eighteen thirty five the other bearing the date of december twenty four eighteen fifty five the chart of eighteen thirty five had no such land upon it nor did the first edition see scoresby's search for franklin london eighteen fifty two which bore the note corrected to eighteen forty nine and such land disappeared from the corrected chart of eighteen fifty five it appears that corrections were constantly made on this chart of eighteen forty nine some even of the most important character without additional footnotes this is strikingly illustrated by a copy of the chart published in the parliamentary blue book referred to by mr baker folio london eighteen fifty two plate fifteen although the chart has the engraved note corrected to eighteen forty nine yet there appear thereon the important discoveries of admiral inglefield made in smith sound during the summer of eighteen fifty two which were not known in great britain until his return in november of that year it is probable that these discoveries were added to the chart in the final revise just as the report was going to press sir john barrow the great authority on arctic discoveries in his polar chart of eighteen forty six voyages to the arctic regions london eighteen forty seven enters no note regarding the new land the land referred to so far as i know first appeared on the polar map in richardson's arctic searching expedition a boat voyage through rupert's land longman london eighteen fifty one this probably being the longman undated chart of mr baker later in chronological order it appeared in osborne's stray leaves from an arctic journal london 1852 additional papers relative to the arctic expedition etc london 1852 evidently printed after november first 1852 both quoted by baker in the revue britannique of december 1853 paris was published a map of the polar regions with the legend land seen in 72 degrees 30 minutes north 161 degrees west to the southwest of this land is a dotted line marking the limits of the polar ice in 1849 this evidently is the line of ice charted by the plover in 1849 then follows the russian hydrographic chart number 1495 1854 quoted by baker with the note indications of land according to the report of the english sloop plover in eighteen forty nine with mr baker i have searched in vain for corroboration of this entry the herald was in company with the plover and the parliamentary report finds confirmation in seaman's voyage of the herald london eighteen fifty three volume two page one hundred six it was a fine clear night at midnight the latitude was obtained by the inferior passage of the sun seventy two degrees ten minutes thirty seconds north twenty nine july eighteen forty nine our soundings had gradually increased to thirty five fathoms of soft blue mud this position was our most northern one latitude seventy two degrees fifty one minutes north longitude one hundred and sixty three degrees west Commander Moore of the Plover and the Ice Master reporting a water sky to the north of the pack and a strong ice blink to the southwest. The evident incorrectness of the land charted is shown by the experience of Collinson in 1850, 
when the general line of the heavy pack ice was somewhat farther northward extending from southeast to northwest from seventy three degrees north in one hundred and sixty degrees west to seventy two degrees forty minutes north in one hundred and sixty five degrees west collinson on august twenty sixth eighteen fifty was in seventy three degrees twenty three minutes north one hundred and sixty four degrees west and on august twenty eighth was in seventy two degrees thirty five minutes north one hundred and sixty one degrees west thus having passed directly over the position of the land chartered as above on the seventeenth he was in seventy two degrees forty five minutes north one hundred and fifty nine degrees west august twenty second in seventy two degrees twenty five minutes north one hundred and fifty eight degrees west august twenty first in seventy two degrees ten minutes north one hundred and fifty three degrees west collinson says august seventeenth eighteen fifty the fog cleared away at one p m and we found ourselves in a lane of clear water ten miles wide with a clear sea to our northeast our observations placed us one hundred miles northwest by north from point barrow and we found forty-five fathoms of water muddy bottom twenty one had traced pack from seventy two degrees forty five minutes north in one hundred and fifty nine degrees west for two hundred and seventy five miles to southeast to seventy one degrees forty two minutes north one hundred and fifty four degrees thirty minutes west august twenty eighth here we reached our farthest point north in seventy three degrees twenty three minutes north and longitude one hundred and sixty four degrees west in the afternoon the pack edge trending more to the southward we got much encumbered by endeavoring to get through it to the eastward straining our eyes in that direction in hopes of seeing either land or water on august eighteenth eighteen fifty mcclure was in seventy degrees forty eight minutes north one hundred and thirty eight degrees west with no sign of land the weight of opinion in the following few years was decidedly against there being such land as shown by its omission from the charts of arctic america in the following named works scoresby's search for franklin london eighteen fifty one hooper's the tents of the tusky london eighteen fifty two mangles arctic searching expedition second edition london eighteen fifty two where peterman's search map is reproduced there being no map of the first edition london 1851 sutherland's voyage to baffin's bay and barrow strait peterman's map london 1852 further correspondence and proceedings connected with the arctic expedition presented to the parliament london 1852 peterman's map lieutenant s gurney cresswell's map dated may fifteenth eighteen fifty four brands sir john franklin map by langs berlin eighteen fifty four armstrong's northwest passage london eighteen fifty seven osborne's mcclure discovery of the northwest passage london eighteen fifty six mcdougall's eventful voyage of h m s resolute london eighteen fifty seven brown's northwest passage second edition london eighteen sixty which contains a map by aerosmith eighteen fifty eight it thus appears that the plover land is a myth mr baker agreeing with me on this point the keenan land lies however east of the mythical land already disposed of being indefinitely located between harrison and camden bay north of the seventy-second parallel the uncertainty of position of whalers is well known as no care is given to longitude or other astronomical observations since definite data are lacking the subject can be approached from another standpoint that of the depths of the adjacent seas it will be recalled by those familiar with the arctic ocean to the north of bering strait region that it is a very shallow sea in one direction only does it deepen and unfortunately for keenan island it is in that particular quarter in my opinion the great improbability of land in the region mentioned appears from an examination of the soundings of the sea from the northwest to the east of point barrow which are as follows the position being approximate one hundred seventy two degrees west longitude seventy three degrees five minutes north latitude 
78 fathoms. 159 degrees west, 72 degrees 6 minutes north, 133x. X indicates no bottom. 155 degrees west, 72 degrees north, 145x. 140 degrees west, 70 degrees 5 minutes north, 190x. 139 degrees west, 70 degrees 3 minutes north, 145x. 126 degrees west, 70 degrees 5 minutes north, 110, and 124 degrees west, 74 degrees 5 minutes north, on the very coast of Banks Land, 45 fathoms. The above observations show that the parts of the Arctic Ocean passed over, and most nearly adjacent, gradually and interruptedly increase in depth from the west, from the south, and southeast toward the reported land, attaining in its neighborhood the greatest known depth of water to the northward of Bering Strait. That this condition of depth is not strictly local, but extends uninterruptedly northward, is proved conclusively by the very heavy ice met with by Collinson and McClure between Point Barrow and Banks Land, which ran upward of 200 feet in thickness. As this thick ice is unquestionably of land origin, from an ice-capped country of considerable extent, there must be deep water for its transition. It is possible, but not probable, that the southern edge of this land lies so close to Arctic America. End of section 11. Section 12 of the National Geographic Magazine, Volume 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Geologist at Blue Mountain, Maryland by Charles D. Walcott. Most of the summer visitors at Blue Mountain, Maryland, give little thought to the origin of the mountain, nor how it came to be a ridge rising so boldly on the west from the Cumberland Valley and on the east overlooking the mountain valley to the foot of the Catoctin Ridge, which rises above the plain stretching thence southeastward to Washington. During the summer of 1892, the writer discovered that the rocks forming the crest of the Blue Ridge belong among the oldest formations deposited in the Appalachian Trough, since they carry types of life occurring in the most ancient fossiliferous rocks on the North American continent that are distinguished by a recognizable fauna. The geologic structure also shows that these rocks rest upon the ancient seabed of the Appalachian Trough, and that they are of the same relative geologic age as the Cambrian rocks that occupy an equivalent stratigraphic position in Vermont, New Jersey, New York, Virginia, and Tennessee. The recent work of Dr. G. H. Williams demonstrates that, with one partial exception, the older crystalline rocks underlying the Cambrian strata have hitherto been misinterpreted and misunderstood by the geologists who have studied them. Instead of being sedimentary formations originally deposited in the seabed, they are volcanic rocks and almost identical with the lavas found in Nevada, Wyoming, and in many portions of the Rocky Mountain region. This discovery proves that the laboratory of nature produced a certain type of volcanic rock almost at the beginning of the evolution of the North American continent, and again produced the same type many millions of years afterward on the western side of the continent. The broad mountain crossing the Pennsylvania-Maryland line includes eastern and western border ridges and an intervening valley. On the western or Blue Ridge side, it is built up of sedimentary rocks originally deposited in the sea on the bottom, and it may be the side of the Appalachian Trough. In the intervening valley, it consists to a considerable extent of eruptive rocks, which poured out as flows the ancient land surface prior to the existence of the Appalachian Trough and before the deposition of the stratified rocks which so largely form the North American continent within the limits of the United States. The elevated eastern side forms the Catoctin Ridge, which is capped by a compressed fold of the old shales and quartzites. 
both ridges continue south of the Maryland line toward Harper's Ferry and far into Virginia as compressed synclinal folds of the Cambrian rocks, resting on the rocks of the ancient Appalachian trough, the older rocks and the more recent rocks having been involved in the same series of folding. In addition to this folding, numerous thrusts of one mass of rocks upon another are to be found all along the Blue Ridge, especially north of the Pennsylvania-Maryland line, in the northern extension of Blue Mountain, or the South Mountain of Pennsylvania. In some instances, the ancient eruptive rocks have been thrust westward, so as to rest upon and above the more recent sandstones and shales, which were originally deposited upon them in the bottom and along the shore of the Appalachian trough. Often the pressure has cleaved the massive lavas and formed slates and shales that appear like those deposited in quiet waters. The result of this has been to complicate the geologic structure and topography of South Mountain and the Blue Ridge, and to make the region one of great interest to both professional and amateur geologists. Erosion has aided their study by cutting away thousands of feet of strata from above the present mountain area and adjacent valleys, and thus laying bare a portion of the ancient shoreline of the Atlantic coast area of Cambrian time and of the foundation upon which much of the present continent is built. The history of the Blue Ridge and its rocks, as now interpreted, is essentially as follows. It began long after the first known primitive rocks of the earth were raised into plateaus and ridges to form the platforms of the present continents. At the close of the periods in which the earlier crystalline rocks of the continent were formed, and also the great masses of bedded rocks beneath those containing the Cambrian or oldest known fauna, that portion of the North American continent, then above the sea, is thought to have consisted of, one, a large part of what is now the British possessions, two, a long, broad mountain area, Atlantic, extended southwestward from Newfoundland to the present site of the Gulf of Mexico, and it may be the West Indian archipelago, three, and one or more areas, Pacific, on the western side of the continental plateau, on the line of the present Rocky Mountain and Sierra Nevada ranges. The eastern or Atlantic area and the bed of the interior sea toward the west in what may be called the Appalachian Trough were then formed of various kind of rock, including granite, schists of various kinds, crystalline and unaltered sedimentary rocks, and in some localities of great masses of volcanic material that had been poured out over the surface in very much the same manner as were the relatively recent lavas found in the vicinity of the Yellowstone National Park and in various parts of the Rocky Mountain region. The waves of the interior sea wore away from the western shore of the Atlantic land area various rock materials and deposited them along with that brought in by the brooks and rivers as layers of sand and gravel on the seabed all the way from the present site of the St. Lawrence River to Alabama. In these deposits, fragments of the volcanic rocks, schists, etc., were mingled and spread out in sheets. At times, the supply of material was very fine and formed thin layers of mud that afterward consolidated into shales and slates. After a deposition of several thousand feet of this character of materials, the water deepened, probably by the subsidence of the bed of the sea, and calcareous muds were deposited during a great interval of time until in places they reached the thickness of several thousand feet. These now form the limestones found in the Cumberland and Shenandoah valleys and their extensions northward to Canada and southward to Alabama. All along this ancient coastline, from Labrador to Alabama, various forms of marine life existed, and their hard parts, such as shells of crustaceans, allied to the living king crab, and other organisms, were buried in the mud and sand. The deposition of sediments in the sea, immediately west of the Atlantic area, continued until from 12,000 to 40,000 feet in thickness were piled over the ancient sea bottom, layer upon layer, sometimes of one kind of sediment and sometimes of another. These are now found as layers of sandstone, limestone, coal, shale, slate, 
and various combinations of sandstone, shale, etc. With the close of the first great age, Paleozoic, in sedimentation in the Appalachian trough, the Earth's forces again became active, and sufficient pressure was exerted from the Atlantic coast side of the continent to raise this great mass of sediments above the sea and to fold it in ridges and hollows, very much as layers of paper or cloth would fold from pressure applied to the edges of the layers if they were partially confined above and below. This was varied, however, in the great rock masses by the frequent shearing on the line of the folds and the thrusting of masses of rock one over the other as cards shift over each other under pressure. One of these folds, with minor folds within it, has by subsequent agencies been carved into the Blue Ridge. The epoch of folding was several millions of years ago, so long since that sufficient time has elapsed for thousands of feet of sediments to be deposited in the interior lakes and seas of the North American continent, and for animal life to develop from the then highest types of fish and reptile to the higher mammals, at the head of which man stands today. During the thousands of centuries since the first great Appalachian uplift, the rain, frost, and snow have been at work sculpturing the old land surface and slowly working out the mountains, valleys, and plains. It is not improbable that the process of mountain uplift and that of wearing away the mountains to a relatively level area, base level of erosion, may have taken place several times. The intervals of rest between the wearing away of the highland and mountains and the succeeding epoch of uplift being of long duration. So long, in fact, that centuries might pass without effecting a marked change in the relations of the land and sea. It was not far back, geologically speaking, that the Blue Ridge was a part of, and not distinct from, a great plain that was broken by low hills and valleys and drained by streams flowing into a river that occupied relatively the same position that the Potomac does now. The continent was then at a lower level in relation to the sea, and it was not until it became elevated that the Potomac began to cut down into its bed in the old plain and carry out to the ocean the material which filled the areas now represented by the Cumberland and Shenandoah valleys. As this process continued and the river lowered its channel, the Blue Ridge began to take shape as a distinct feature in the landscape. Slowly but surely, the softer beds were broken up, dissolved and carried away, and the harder beds of rock began to project above the ancient plateau. It was only the question of which beds of rock could the longer resist the forces of rain and frost to determine the location of mountains and valleys. We have thus hastily sketched the evolution of a portion of the continent and the evolution of one of its topographic features as shown by the Blue Ridge. This evolution has gone on everywhere. Every ridge, however small, every valley, whether shallow or deep, narrow or broad, every stream channel all over the surface of the continent has its history back in the past, and it is by the studies of the geologists that we learn something of that history. It is now nearly 40 years since William B. and H. D. Rogers discovered many elements of the structure of the Appalachian Mountains but it was not until within the last few years that the means of correlating and thus interpreting more accurately the structure of the various mountains formed by the lower and oldest series of the sedimentary rocks have been obtained. During the deposition of the 40,000 feet of sediments in the Appalachian trough, many millions of invertebrate animals lived and died along the shore and on the seabed. Those that lived in the earlier epochs became extinct and new forms succeeded them, and these in turn were succeeded many times during the vast interval between the first deposit and the closing one before the epoch of the last Appalachian uplift and folding. The remains of the various groups of life now afford the data by which the geologist correlates the various disturbed and often separated masses and determines what were their original relations to each other. There are hundreds of local details yet to be studied and interpreted, and the work will be done by those who love to study the record of creation in the fragmentary book of nature, where all is written that we know of the past 
before barbaric man began his imperfect record by myth and legend. End of section 12. Recording by Karen. Section 13 of the National Geographic Magazine, Volume 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Great Populous Centers of the World by General A. W. Greeley the astonishing growth of urban population in the United States during the past decade induced the writer to cursorily examine the tendencies of other countries in this direction, which developed facts indicating very clearly that it is a general and not local migration. In conducting the research, lists were made of the 500 or more cities in which the population exceeds 50,000, in which doubtless live one-fifth of the fourteen hundred and eighty millions which make up the population of the world. From this list have been selected the hundred cities having the greatest number of inhabitants, and, with one exception, Canton, no place has been included unless its population has been determined by census. In general, the figures here given agree with those in that most excellent publication, the statesman's yearbook the census year is not uniform and as it may be said that the growth of cities outside of the united states lies in general between one and two per cent annually the order of rank here given is not absolute of the five hundred cities with a population above fifty thousand the countries having the greatest number are united states eighty five India, 76, Great Britain, 72, Germany, 47, Russia, 34, France, 33, Japan, 17, Spain, 16, Austria-Hungary, 15, Italy, 14. Four-fifths of all are situated in these ten countries and one-sixth in the United States. No less than three of the ten cities having a million of inhabitants are in the United States, and also four of the sixteen great population centers of the world. This last designation is here given to cities of more than three-fourths of a million, this dividing line in rank being at once apparent, as there are practically no cities with population between half a million and three-fourths of a million. In view of the preponderating influence exercised by great cities upon the progress and welfare of the world, it is extremely interesting to note that more than one-half of the cities herein named are either populated by English-speaking races or are under their control. Of these fifty-two cities, two are in Australia, two in Canada, one in China, two in Egypt, thirteen in England, ten in India, two in Ireland, two in Scotland, one in Singapore, and seventeen in the United States. It is not the purpose of this sketch to investigate the causes which particularly favor the enormous aggregations in modern cities, for such causes must be complex, local, and numerous. It is evident, however, at a glance, that the elements of easy transportation and the moderately rigorous climate are the most frequent concomitants, if they are not the predominating causes. As someone not very wisely remarked, it is fortunate that great rivers run by so many great cities, and in this list but few cities are found which have not facilities for water transportation. By far the greater number of large cities are situated climatically in an average temperature between 45 degrees and 55 degrees. In the parts of Europe and America, where these annual temperatures prevail, there is one city of 100,000 inhabitants to about every 2 million of population. In Russia, 
there is only one such city to over nine million, and in India, one to over ten million souls. With but few exceptions, the populous cities of the world are the product of the age, as is illustrated by the fact that at the beginning of this century, the United States had no city of 100,000 inhabitants, well now it has 28. England had one only, now it has 24. List of the most populous cities by last census. Rank, census year, population. 1. 1891. Greater London, England, Outer Ring. 5,633,332 London, England, Registration 4,211,056 London, England, London, England, Central Area 1,022,529 1891 Paris, France Two million four hundred forty seven thousand nine hundred fifty seven. Three, eighteen ninety, Greater New York, United States. Footnote Mr. Henry Gannett's figures, this volume, page thirty one. Three million two hundred fifty thousand. Eighteen ninety two, New York, United States. One million eight hundred one thousand six hundred thirty nine. Four, Canton, China, estimated, one million six hundred thousand. Five, eighteen ninety, Berlin, Germany, one million five hundred seventy nine thousand two hundred forty four. Six, eighteen ninety one, Vienna, Austria. One million three hundred eighty nine thousand six hundred eighty four. Eighteen ninety one, Vienna, Austria. Footnote excluding suburbs. One million three hundred sixty four thousand five hundred forty eight. Seven, eighteen ninety one, Tokyo, Japan. One million one hundred sixty one thousand eight hundred. 8. 1890. Chicago, United States. 1,099,850. 9. 1890. Philadelphia, United States. 1,046,964. 10. 1889. St. Petersburg, Russia. In winter. One million three thousand three hundred fifteen. Eighteen eighty nine, Saint Petersburg, Russia, in summer. Eight hundred forty five thousand three hundred fifteen. Eleven, eighteen ninety two, Brooklyn, United States. Nine hundred fifty seven thousand one hundred sixty three. Twelve, eighteen eighty five. Constantinople, Turkey, 873,565. 13. 1891. Calcutta, India, excluding Howrah, 129,800. 840,130. 14. 1891. Bombay, India. 804,470 15. 1891 Glasgow, Scotland 792,728 Glasgow, Scotland Footnote Excluding suburbs 565,714 16. 1884 Moscow, Russia, 753,469. 17. 1891. Buenos Aires, Argentine Republic, 561,160. 
18, 1891, Liverpool, England, 517,591. 19, 1890, Budapest, Hungary, 506,384. 20, 1891, Manchester, England, 505,343. 21, 1891, Melbourne, Victoria, 491,378. 22, 1891, Osaka, Japan, 483,609. 23, 1891, Brussels, Belgium, 482,268. 24, 1887, Madrid, Spain, 472,228. 25, 1891, Warsaw, Russia, 465,272. 26, 1881, Naples, Italy, 463,172. 27, 1890, St. Louis, United States, 451,770. 28, 1891, Madras, India, 449,950. 29, 1890, Boston, United States, 448,477. 30, 1890, Baltimore, United States, 434,439. 31, 1891, Birmingham, England, 429,171. 32, 1890, Amsterdam, Netherlands, 417,539. 33, 1891, Lyon, France, 416,029. 34, 1891, Marseille, France, 403,749. 35, 1891, Sydney, New South Wales, 386,400. 36, 1891, Copenhagen, Denmark, 375,251. Copenhagen, Denmark, footnote, excluding suburbs, 312,387. 37, 1882, Cairo, Egypt, 368,108. 38, 1891, Leeds, England, 367,506. 39, 1890, Leipzig, Germany, 353,272. Leipzig, Germany, footnote, excluding suburbs, 293,525. 40, 1891, Dublin, Ireland, Metropolitan Police District, 361,891, Dublin, Ireland, footnote, excluding suburbs, 254,709, 41, 1890, Munich, Germany, 348,317 42, 1890 Breslau, Germany 335,174 43, 1890 Hamburg, Germany 329,923 44, 1890 Mexico, Mexico 
329,535. 45. 1891. Sheffield, England. 324,243. 46. 1890. Odessa, Russia. 313,687. 47. 1891. Hyderabad, India. 312,390. 48. 1890. San Francisco, United States, 298,993. 49. 1884. Kyoto, Japan, 297,527. 50. 1890. Cincinnati, United States, 296,908. 51. 1881. Milan, Italy, 295,543. 52. 1890. Cologne, Germany, 281,273. 53. 1892. Buffalo, United States, 278,727. 54. 1890. Dresden, Germany, 276,085. 55. 1872. Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. 274,972. 56. 1881. Rome, Italy. 273,268. 57. 1891. Lucknow, India. 273,090. 58. 1887. Barcelona, Spain. 272,481. 59. 1890. Cleveland, United States. 261,353. 60. 1891. Edinburgh, Scotland. 261,261. 61. 1891. Belfast, Ireland. 255,896. 62. 1890. Bordeaux, France. 252,415. 63. 1890. Stockholm, Sweden. 246,564. 64. 1878. Lisbon, Portugal. 246,343. 65. 1890. New Orleans, United States. 242,039. 66. 1890. Pittsburgh, United States. 238,617. 67. 1890. Washington, United States. 230,392. 68. 1881. Turin, Italy. 230,183. 69. 1891. Antwerp, Belgium. 227,225. 70. 1891. Benares, India. 222,520. 71. 1876. Bucharest, Romania. 221,805. 72. 1891. Bristol, England. 221,665. 73. 1891. Hong Kong, China. 221,441. 74. 1891. Montreal, Canada. 216,650. 75. 1891. Bradford, England. 
216,361. 76. 1891. Nottingham, England. 211,984. 77. 1890. Rotterdam, Netherlands. 209,136. 78. 1890. Detroit, United States. 205,876. 79. 1887. Palermo, Italy. 205,712. 80. 1891. West Ham, England. 204,902. 81. 1890. Milwaukee, United States. 204,468. 82. 1890. Magdeburg, Germany. 202,235. 83. 1891. Lille, France. 201,211. 84. 1882. Alexandria, Egypt. 200,755. 85. 1885. Santiago, Chile. 200,000. 86. 1891. Kingston on Hall, England. 199,991. 87. 1888. Havana, Cuba. 198,261. 88. 1891. Salford, England, 198,136. 89. 1888. Riga, Russia, 195,668. 90. 1891. Delhi, India, 193,580. 91. 1888. Kharkov, Russia, 188,469. 92. 1891. Mandalay, India, 187,910. 93. 1891. Newcastle, England, 186,345. 94. 1891. Singapore, Singapore, 184,554. 95, 1890. Prague, Hungary, 184,109. 96, 1891. Kiev, Russia, 183,640. 97, 1891. Kampur, India. 183,210 98 1891 Newark, United States 181,830 99 1891 Toronto, Canada 181,220 100 1891 Rangoon, India 181,210 End of section 13section 14 of the National Geographic Magazine volume 5 This is a LibriVox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org our youngest volcano by J. S. Diller, presented before the Society, April 28, 1893. Our youngest volcano is in Alaska. There was an eruption at Bogoslov in October 1883 and at other points since then, and there can be no doubt whatever concerning the existence of active volcanoes in Alaska. In our own country, exclusive of Alaska, there may be some doubt whether living volcanoes exist. 
It is well known to all, no doubt, that the greatest volcanic region in the world lies in the northwestern part of our own country, occupying a large tract in Idaho, Washington, Oregon, and California. There were many active volcanoes there during the middle and latter portions of the tertiary period, and there is still a considerable number of them which can hardly be called extinct. Frequent reports of volcanic eruption may be seen in western newspapers, but the large majority of them are of doubtful authenticity. There is considerable evidence, however, that in 1842 to 1843, Mount Baker and Mount St. Helens in Washington discharged large quantities of ashes, with which the adjacent country was covered as with a light fall of snow. Professor Davidson of the United States Coast and Geodetic Survey and Mr. J. S. Hiddle report eruptions of Mount Baker in 1854, 1858, and 1870. These reports are based on observations made at long range, and so far as I know, have not been corroborated by actual ascent of the mountain. Dr. Harkness of San Francisco reported to the California Academy of Sciences a volcanic eruption in Plumas County of that state, at a point about 10 miles northeast of Lassen Peak. He found the trees near the lava were scorched as if by the heat of the lava at the time of the eruption. He visited the locality, and from data he gathered there, with historical evidence from natives and early settlers in the Sacramento Valley, he concluded that the eruption occurred in January 1850. In 1885, Captain, now Major Button, and I visited the region, and, approaching it from the same side as Dr. Harkness did, saw no reason whatever to doubt his conclusions. A few years previous, Major Button had studied the active volcanoes of the Sandwich Islands, and he was deeply impressed with the newness in the appearance of the lava field in cinder cone northeast of Lassen Peak. Later in the same season, I revisited the volcano alone for the purpose of studying the phenomena more thoroughly, and found good reason for believing that it is very much older than was at first supposed. Pine trees grow from terminal buds in joints at the rate of one joint each year. So it was thought that if we could find a living tree that was well scorched, we could climb up and count the number of joints above the scorching and could thus discover the number of years since the eruption. We started out around the lava field to find a suitable tree, but to our great surprise on the further side of the lava field, the scorched sides of the trees were away from the lava, so that it was evident that the scorching was not produced by the lava. A little further examination convinced us that a forest fire had swept through that region from the north and scorched all the trees more or less on that side. We returned to the cinder cone, and, finding large pine trees growing close to the cone, it was doubted whether the trees could have survived so close to the volcano. The question arose as to the thickness of the layer of volcanic sand near the cone where the trees were growing, and with soup plates for shovels, we had no better in camp, we dug down to find the bottom, but the loose sand caved in and we could not penetrate it. A quarter of a mile away from the base of the cinder cone, another attempt was made, and at that distance, the layer of volcanic sand was found to be seven feet thick. Of course, it was evident at once that no living trees in the neighborhood could have survived such a shower of hot ashes. The large living trees must have grown up entirely since the eruption. Near the cinder cone, there are some dead trees, which have been partially burned. Examining these, it was found that they had not grown on the top of the layer of volcanic sand like the living trees, but that they extended down through this layer to the original soil beneath. The relation of the old and new forest trees, as well as that of the stumps of the older forest, is shown in the accompanying sketch, figure 3 on page 95. It is evident that the tree from the original soil beneath is older than the eruption, and that since the tree was either dead or killed at that time, and has not completely decayed, that the eruption cannot have occurred many centuries ago. Of the time that has since elapsed, we have found some measure in the age of the living trees. In the same region, the timber is cut for lumber, and by counting the number of rings of growth, it was found that the largest trees near the cinder cone are not less than 200 years old, so that the eruption at the cinder cone must have occurred a little more than 200 years ago. On the whole, it would seem probable, therefore, 
that our youngest volcano, south of Alaska, is not the cinder cone ten miles northeast of Lassen Peak, as once supposed, but is most likely to prove to be Mount Baker in Washington. End of section 14. Recording by Karen. Section 15 of the National Geographic Magazine, Volume 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Olga Bilova. Proceedings of the International Geographic Conference in Chicago, July 27-28, 1893. Introduction. Inasmuch as the World's Columbian Exposition, held at Chicago, Illinois, from May 1 to October 30, 1893, was in commemoration of the greatest geographic discovery of recorded history, the National Geographic Society felt that, in some manner, American geographers should participate therein. Since space and means were lacking for the installation and maintenance in the Columbian Exposition of a geographic exhibit fittingly illustrating the evolution of geographic discovery and exploration in the American hemisphere, it became necessary to devise other means of celebrating the discovery of our hemisphere by Columbus. For these reasons, the presidents and order managers of the society took into consideration the advisability of participating in the series of remarkable congresses which were to be held at Chicago during the period of the exposition. It was thought that a separate congress of geography was inadvisable, and that a meeting to be designated a conference of American and European geographers should form a section of the World's Congress of Education. This decision was formally approved by the Society and action in accordance therewith was promptly initiated. The board of managers decided that this conference should be held under the auspices of the National Geographic Society, and with this view appointed the following committee with full powers in the premises. The Honorable Gardener G. Hubbard, General A. W. Greeley, Dr. T. C. Mendenhall, Professor W. B. Powell, and Professor T. C. Chamberlain. The United States Commissioner of Education, the Honorable William T. Harris, President of the World's Congress of Education, cordially approved of the plans of the committee and offered all possible facilities for their satisfactory completion. The preliminary notices were incorporated in the program of the World's Congress of Education. The Hall of Washington Art Institute building was assigned as a place of meeting and two days, Thursday and Friday, July 27 and 28, 1893, were set apart for a Conference of American and European Geographers by authority of the Congress of Education. Formal invitations in the name of the National Geographic Society were extended to the principal geographic societies of the world to participate in the conference by delegates or by the presentation of memoirs, and many favorable replies were received. The conference met on the designated day. Its proceedings were marked by a degree of interest and an attendance quite beyond the expectations of the committee, and it is believed that it exercised a material and beneficial influence toward the study of geography in the United States. With a view of affording variety to the meetings, and also of utilizing, in the interests of the conference, the numerous objects of geographic interest in the Columbian Exposition, it was decided that the sessions of July 27 should be held in the Art Institute building, Chicago, and those of July 28 within the exposition grounds. As this conference was the first international meeting of geographers in America, the Board of Managers of the National Geographic Society deemed it proper to publish, under the auspices of the Society, the record of this conference, together with such of the memoirs as it has been found practicable to incorporate therewith. Among the countries and societies which show their lively interest in the conference by designating delegates are the following. Brazil, Instituto Histórico Geográfico Etnográfico, Rio de Janeiro, Delegate Baron de Marejo. France, Société de Géographie, Paris, Delegate M. E. Levasseur, Membre de l'Institut. Société de Géographie de Lille, Delegate Monsieur Paul Leblanc. 
England, Royal Geographical Society, Delegate Colonel Sir Casimir S. Jovsky, KCMG, Manchester Geographical Society, Delegate Mr. James D. Wilder, Member of the Council, Mexico, Sociedad Mexicana de Geografía Estadística, Delegate Señor Dr. D. Inao Navarro, Consul General of Mexico at New York, Portugal, La Sociedad de Geografía de Lisboa, Delegate Madame Regina Manning, Scotland, Royal Scottish Geographical Society, Delegates Dr. George Smith, C.I.E.L.L.D., Member of the Council, and the Honorable John Abercrombie. United States, American Geographical Society, New York, Delegate Professor William Libby, Jr. The Geographical Society of the Pacific, San Francisco, Delegate Professor George Davidson of the United States Coast and Geodetics Survey, President of the Society. The National Geographic Society was represented by the Honorable Gardner G. Hubbard, President, and General A. W. Greeley, U.S. Army, Vice President, as delegates. Ms. R. R. Skidmore and Mr. F. H. Newell, Secretaries. Professor William B. Powell of the Board of Managers. Major G. W. Powell, Director, United States Geological Survey. Colonel F. W. Parker and others. End of section 15. Section 16 of the National Geographic Magazine, Volume 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Proceedings of the International Geographic Conference in Chicago. July 27-28, 1893. Minutes of the Conference. F. H. Newell and Eliza R. Skidmore, Secretaries. The sessions were opened in the Hall of Washington, Art Institute Building, Chicago, at 10 o'clock a.m., July the 27th, 1893. There were present about 400 individuals, including delegates and invited guests. The Honorable Gardner G. Hubbard, President of the National Geographic Society, was called to the chair as presiding officer of the conference, and Mr. F. H. Newell, was appointed recording secretary. Several communications from societies and individuals were laid before the conference. The Royal Geographical Society, through its secretary, Mr. J. Scott Kelty, expressed its sincere regret that it could not be represented by a member of its council, in addition to the regular delegate, Sir C. S. Gzowski. The Royal Scottish Geographical Society, through its secretary, Colonel Fred Bailey, offered its congratulations to the conference and expressed its cordial good wishes for the success of so important an assemblage. Dato Sri Amar Draja of the Johor Commission regretted that his unexpected departure for Europe prevented him from reading a paper on Johor. On the part of the Johor Commission, he expressed the hope to be able shortly to present the first complete map of Johor ever published. Baron de Marajou, delegate of the Instituto Historico, Geografico y Etnografico de Rio de Janeiro, expressed the very lively interest of himself and the society he represented in the conference, and presented nine volumes of geographic researches, etc., published by his society. While he could not then speak on the geography of Brazil, he promised a memoir thereon for future publication. Senor Graciano A. de Azambuja, commissioner from Brazil, congratulated the conference on its meeting and promised for publication a paper on the development of southern Brazil. Monsieur E. Levasseur, member de l'Institut, delegate from the Société de Géographie of Paris, wrote from New York that impaired health prevented his attendance greatly to his regret. His thirty years of geographic study and research inspired him with an intense desire to participate actively in the discussions of the conference, he had hoped to set forth the importance of economic geography and enclose the bibliography of his works. General John Eaton, formerly United States Commissioner of Education, took the chair and presented to the conference the Honorable Gardner G. Hubbard, who made the opening address, 
treating of the relations of the currents of air and water to the temperature of countries and to animal and vegetal life. Hon. John Abercrombie, delegate from the Royal Scottish Geographic Society, spoke briefly as follows. Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, though here to represent the Royal Scottish Geographic Society, I had not intended to address the conference, as I am not a professional geographer, and indeed have only been actively associated with the work of the Society for less than a year. I come rather to pick up information than to impart it, rather in the capacity of an absorbent sponge than as an overcharged rain cloud. Such being the case, I confine myself to giving a brief summary of the origin and work of my own society. The Royal Scottish Geographical Society was formed some nine or ten years ago with the laudable object of educating the Scottish public in the subject of geography and of keeping them thoroughly informed of the progress made in the subject in all parts of the world through the medium of a monthly magazine which I am glad to say has also a certain circulation in the United States. Some of the earlier numbers contain valuable papers on the various methods employed by map makers to overcome the inherent difficulty of transferring geographic points on an irregular globular surface like the earth to a flat surface like that of a map. Other technical matters have also been treated of at various times so that the magazine has a real educational value apart from the papers descriptive of travel adventure, and the strange habits and customs of savage peoples. Our late secretary, Mr. A. Silver White, contributed more than one monograph on the geography and history of that part of Eastern Africa, in which Great Britain and Germany are more nearly interested, and they will always possess a permanent value. In order to popularize the subject as much as possible, papers are read monthly before the members of the society and their friends for nine months every year. Most of the explorers who have read papers before the Royal Geographical Society of London are willing to speak before us in Edinburgh as well as at our branch societies at Glasgow and Aberdeen. The first speaker to address our newborn society was Mr. Stanley after his return from one of his earlier travels of exploration in the great African continent, and the session this year was expected to close by an address from Lieutenant Peary on his projected expedition in the direction of the North Pole. Unfortunately, a letter arrived from him shortly before I left home, expressing regret that owing to unforeseen circumstances he was obliged to abandon his scheme of coming to lecture in Great Britain before the departure of his expedition. I ought not to omit to mention that though we are a private society and receive no aid from the government, our library and the privilege of consulting maps, books, and consular reports is freely opened to the public. Considerable use is made of these facilities by persons engaged in commerce, and almost daily our librarian is consulted by those who are not members of the society, but are desirous of obtaining commercial information in regard to foreign countries. In this way the society distinctly benefits the public. Another way in which the public may receive instruction free of cost is by courses of lectures on physical geography or geology in relation to geography, on the distribution of plants and animals over the globe, and other kindred subjects. These lectures are given either by a member of the society or by some other competent person, and are generally well attended, especially by the young and by the fair sex. The most important work on which a committee of my society is now engaged is a thorough and complete revision of the spelling of the Gaelic and worse names in northern Scotland, in conjunction with the director of the Ordnance Survey of the United Kingdom. On existing maps, the Gaelic names are not always given correctly. The spelling is irregular and, when given correctly, cannot be pronounced properly by a person ignorant of Gaelic and its remarkable spelling. For instance, in the island of Skye, the Cullin Hills are spelt on the ordnance map Cachulin, as if they were called after the old Irish hero of that name, though they have never received that designation from the people of Skye. The committee is proceeding in this manner. Every local name on the map is submitted to three or four of the oldest men in the parish, and their pronunciation is taken down by a person speaking Gaelic. In this way, the local pronunciation is surely fixed, 
and if the words have a significant meaning they can easily be written in standard literary gaelic if that should differ from the local pronunciation as i am not on the committee myself i am not certain whether the words are to be given phonetically on the map or according to literary usage in gaelic but i have no doubt that they ought to be rendered phonetically so that even those unversed in gaelic would be able to read them correctly old irish was written as it was pronounced but unfortunately the faddists of the sixteenth century for there were faddists even in those days invented an absurd rule opposed to every philological principle and still in force which they called in irish or gaelic cowlery cowl leathanry leathan that is to say if there is a slender vowel an e or an i in the first syllable then the first vowel of the next syllable must be slender similarly if the vowel of the first syllable is broad as a o u the first vowel of the second syllable must also be broad these extraneous inorganic vowels do not affect the pronunciation and in a reformed spelling ought certainly to be omitted another fruitful source of inaccuracy in writing gaelic words arises from spelling in accordance with a fanciful and in reality a baseless etymology the dictionary of the highland society and o'brien's irish dictionary are full of examples of this sort though there is this excuse for them that both were compiled before philology became an exact science and before old irish of the ninth and tenth centuries was known to the learned world the task which the committee has to accomplish is therefore by no means an easy one another subject which the royal scottish geographical society has had under consideration though no action has yet been taken is one that relates to lake basins on all our ordnance maps the configuration of the earth's surface always ceases with the surface of the water no soundings are given no underwater contours and all knowledge of the bottom of the lakes is left to the imagination such a state of things is clearly inexcusable but unfortunately the funds of the society are insufficient for the task the admiralty which considers fresh water lakes beyond its province and draws the line at salt water has been applied to but without success and so for the present the subject is in abeyance general a w greeley chairman of the committee on awards of prizes of the national geographic society made an announcement of the progress of the committee and of the steps taken to call public attention to the generous offer of the society the chairman then introduced madame regina Mani, delegate from la sociedad de geografia de lisboa who made a few remarks concerning the attitude of that society and of the portuguese people toward the conference general john eaton ex-commissioner of education of the united states presented the following address on the relations which may or should exist between the national geographic society and geographic instruction mr president ladies and gentlemen voluntary activity in america for the benefit of mankind has an almost boundless opportunity the national geographic society as one of our voluntary agencies has proposed to itself as one of its object the promotion of the knowledge of geography among the people of the united states geography in its narrower sense as a description of the surface of the earth which we inhabit lays under contribution various sciences and includes topics of deep interest its literature is not a collection of meaningless words geographic discovery with its thrilling adventures is by no means at an end but geography in its larger sense not only includes as is said the forms and measures of the earth its astronomical relations the relative positions and distances of places and the representations of the whole or portions of its surface on globes or maps which is known as mathematical geography it describes as well the principal features of the earth's surface as consisting of land and water its atmosphere its climate and its various animal and vegetable and mineral productions which is called physical geography it also considers the earth as the abode of mankind and treats all that relates to the moral or social condition of the different races or nations which dwell upon it so comprehensive is geography in its bold definition as mankind in all conditions must have a definite habitat on the face of the earth so knowledge in all its forms has a local habitation 
Shakespeare has taught us that when the poet would make real forms of things unknown, he gives to airy nothings a local habitation and a name. Herein is recognized a law with which both the action of mind and the logic of the subject of thought are in accord. This fact is of supreme importance to the educator. He who has the facts in human progress fixed in the place where they occurred has a ready index to the history of mankind, to what man has thought and done. He may at will call up any actor, event, science, or philosophy. He has only to introduce the element of time to unfold, in order and at will, the record man has made for himself as he has ordered his ways under the hand of his creator. Naturally, as the oak springs from the acorn, the human mind follows the tree from the seed to the fruitage, and in obedience to this law we have in teaching the historical method. Naturally, too, the mind looks on this and on that and compares one with another, and in obedience to this law we have in teaching the comparative method. Geography can furnish from its stores untold data adapted to use in both of these methods, most essential to successful instruction. Out of its data may be drawn in the greatest abundance that which is fitted to the attention and understanding and to awaken the interest of beginners in school and of those of any grade of progress. If this view is correct, it cannot be doubted that schools among us have treated geography and related subjects most unfitly. As a result, there has been inattention where there should have been attention, dullness where there should have been enthusiasm, waste, where there should have been gain. Let geography be put in its proper place and treated according to sound pedagogical principles, and all that pupils acquire of what man is and what man has thought and done will be gained, with less waste of time, energy, and purpose, and with far more satisfactory results in other subjects of instruction. Geography, if rightly taught, will furnish the pupil what is needed for nourishment of mind, on the one hand, and for discipline, on the other. It will not unbalance the faculties, it will not cultivate reason to the injury of memory, or reflection to the destruction of expression, or vice versa. Here, therefore, in this department of education, there is most ample scope for the efforts of the National Geographic Society. Voluntary in its methods of action, it may move with all the freedom consistent with good reason. It has before it as its objects 1. The perfection of geography itself 2. The dissemination of the data of geography 3. The selection of the data and their adaptation to other subjects of instruction and to the best results in teaching 4. The training of all teachers in the right knowledge of the subjects and in the best methods of teaching them for pupils in all grades and 5 the devising and use of all objects, graphics or stereoptics, and other aids in illustration to make most effective the presentation of places, persons, events, and their relations. Thus, travel will unite instruction with diversion. For the student, man, races, nations will arise and take their places on the stage of action in their true relation and character. The National Geographic Society, voluntary in its character, as we have noticed, in promoting its great ends by improving the methods of education, may ally itself with all cooperative official agencies. Its purposes are most strictly in accord with the statutes regulating that great disseminating agency, the United States Bureau of Education, now so ably and efficiently administered by its commissioner, the Honorable W. T. Harris. By the aid of the facilities of that bureau, and the great confidence reposed in it, the society may bring its helpful service by its leadership, prizes, lectures, and publications to the aid of every teacher and school in the land. Other nations, too, may gain its cooperation, and thus it may accomplish the great and beneficent purpose of its honored president and his collaborators. Following General Eaton's address, the chairman announced, We have with us today a friend who promised to speak provided his name was not placed on the program. He will now address you, Major J. W. Powell, Director of the United States Geological Survey. Major Powell addressed the conference as follows. Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, the occasion on which we meet, the anniversary of the discovery of America by Columbus, notes a great geographic event, the greatest event of human history. 
It had a wonderful influence on the world, this discovery of America of which you have heard so much during the past year, and it had an influence in a direction which perhaps you have not considered. Prior to the discovery of America, all the humbugs of the world gathered under the skirts of religion. If any man had an ostrum which he wished to vend, or a doctrine which he wished to inculcate, he claimed that it was a revelation from heaven. Somehow or other the discovery of America changed all that. Up to that time the people of the world had not believed the earth to be round. Here and there a scholar believed it, but the teaching of scientific men and scholars had but little effect on the world at large. When Columbus proved by sailing across the sea that the earth is actually round, that it is in fact a globe, so that the great multitude of people themselves came at last to believe it, it made science respectable. And when the feet of Columbus had the effect of making science respectable, people came ultimately to place on the shoulders of science the responsibility of all the humbugs of the world. If a man now has a wonderful nostrum which he wishes to vent, he does not say it was revealed to him by heaven, but it was taught to him by science. If a man wants to bombard the heavens for rain, it is scientific to do it. If a man wants to recover the lost rivers of the arid regions, he has some scientific theory in which to do that work. So science has come at last to be the bolster and the foundation of very many of the humbugs of the world. That is not all. Science has gone forward to accomplish something, and since the time of Columbus, science has accomplished much in the great field of geography. The earth has three envelopes, movable, ever-changeable, moving vertically, and moving horizontally. There is one envelope of air, another of water, and another of rock. These three envelopes are changing their positions, moving back and forth over the surface of the earth horizontally, and rising and falling forever. Three great classes of movement are discovered on the surface of the earth, one in the air, one in the water, and one in the rocks themselves. We study the movements of the atmosphere in modern scientific geography, and have learned much about them. Your president has today learnedly placed before you some most interesting results of scientific investigations in relation to the movements of the atmosphere and the movement of the waters of the earth. As the winds blow about the earth and the air rolls in vertical movements, storms gather and hurricanes blow here and there, and thus we find that the whole aerial envelope is forever in motion. In a similar manner, the watery envelope is forever in motion. It is not alone moving in currents in the ocean and in great rivers, but it is forever moving vertically. In some portions of the earth, twenty inches of water are evaporated every year, and in other portions, one hundred and twenty inches, and the envelope of water, bearing from twenty to one hundred and twenty inches in thickness, is lifted into the heavens and descends again as rain every year. There is a third envelope of the earth, which is in the same manner in motion. Modern geography is no longer engaged simply in the study of the position of geographical localities, no longer engaged solely in measuring the depths of the seas and the heights of the mountains, no longer engaged in simply delineating the currents of the seas and the winds which blow about the earth, but modern geographic science has come to study the origin of the land areas and the reason why the rivers run where they do and why the waters circulate as they do, and it is especially throwing vast light in modern times, in the last decade or two, on the origin of landforms. It is classifying valleys, it is classifying plateaus, it is classifying mountains and hills, and explaining their origin. It is classifying islands. This study of physiography, this new branch of the study of geography, is being cultivated in many lands, and it has discovered that there is an envelope of rock moving horizontally with the waters as the rivers wash the hills and valleys and mountains, and moving vertically by upheaval from beneath and by the pouring out of volcanic lavas from below, so that the three movable envelopes of the earth, the air, the water, and the geologic formations of the rocky envelope are forever in motion, and the laws of this motion are being studied. It is thus that the new theme is being introduced into the study of our schools, and the reason that geography is in this conference allied with education is that these new facts, new laws, new principles of this systematic knowledge in relation to the earth are to be introduced into our schools, and it forms a theme of wonderful interest. Colonel Francis W. Parker, 
principal of the Cook County Normal School, read a paper entitled The Relation of Geography to History. It is printed on later pages. Captain Magnus Andersen, of the ship Viking, delivered an address on Norway and the Vikings. This address also will be found on later pages. At 1 p.m. the session was adjourned for two hours. Afternoon Session July the 27th, 1893 At 3 p.m. the conference was resumed, about 200 persons being present. The first paper, Geographic Instruction in the Public Schools, was by Professor W. B. Powell, Superintendent of Public Schools, Washington, D.C. Professor T. C. Chamberlain, representing the University of Chicago, read an essay on the relations of geology to physiography in our educational system. Professor William Libe, Jr., delegate from the American Geographical Society of New York, spoke briefly on the relations of the Gulf Stream and the Labrador current off the New England coast, describing his researches into the effect of these currents on the distribution of food fishes. Mr. F. H. Newell, United States Geological Survey, read a paper entitled The Arid Regions of the United States. These communications appear among the memoirs and addresses appended here too. The session was then adjourned until 8 p.m. Evening Session, July the 27th, 1893. At 8 p.m., President Hubbard introduced General A. W. Greeley, United States Army, who delivered an address on interpolar expeditions, making a special reference to his own expedition, the explorations of Lieutenant Lockwood, and the terrible sufferings and partial destruction of the party on their retreat. There were about 500 persons present. At 9.30 p.m., the conference adjourned to meet next morning at the Monastery of La Rabida, in the fairgrounds, Jackson Park, and afterward to continue the session at 11 a.m. in Recital Hall. Friday, July the 28th, 1893. The members of the conference met in Jackson Park, where, through the courtesy of Mr. William E. Curtis, chief of the Latin American Department, they had the exclusive use of the monastery of La Rapida from 9 to 11 a.m. Mr. Curtis and Captain John G. Burke, United States Army, escorted the members through the monastery and explained the precious collection of historical papers there exhibited. At 11 a.m., President Hubbard called the session to order in Recital Hall, introducing Miss E. R. Skidmore, who read a paper entitled Recent Explorations in Alaska, printed elsewhere. Mr. Adolf Ernst, Venezuelan commissioner to the World's Columbian Exposition, delivered an address on Venezuela, and Ensign Roger Wells, Jr., United States Navy, described a trip up the Orinoco River. Dr. Emil Hustler, Paraguayan commissioner to the exposition, was present, but asked to be excused from attempting an address in English. The Brazilian commissioners to the World's Columbian Exposition, Senor Graciano A. de Azambuja and Baron de Marajou, while expressing their highest regards, also made their apologies for not participating more fully. At 1 p.m., the meeting adjourned until 3 p.m. Afternoon Session, July the 28th, 1893. Present about 100 persons. President Hubbard first introduced Captain John G. Burke, United States Army, who read a paper on the history of the old monastery of La Rabida, describing the changes in that part of Spain in which it is located. Paul B. Du Chalou then spoke of his travels among the Norsemen and of the character of their ancestors, the Vikings. Captain Victor Maria Concas, commandant of the Spanish caravels, related what is known of the history of the caravels of Columbus and upheld the Spanish sovereigns in their court. Mr. Frederick A. Ober read a paper entitled In the Wake of Columbus, reciting his searches for relics of Columbus and his examination of the places at which Columbus probably landed. Honorable William E. Curtis, in a paper entitled Recent Discoveries in the Archives of the Vatican regarding early Norse voyages to America, described his successful search for records regarding the probable early Norse voyages to America and stated that there was evidence there showing a knowledge of land in the direction of North America. Several of these papers are appended. The representative of the Raja of Johor was not able to be present owing to an unexpected call to London. At 5 p.m. the conference adjourned sine die. End of section 16
Section 17 of the National Geographic Magazine, Volume 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Marianne. Relations of Air and Water to the Temperature and Life by the Honorable Gardner G. Hubbard, President of the National Geographic Society. Circulation of Air and Water it was said in olden times, The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. That which was unknown science hath revealed. The wind in its currents is governed and directed by laws as fixed as those of the solar system. If a moisture-laden wind passes over the country it leaves the land fruitful, but a dry wind leaves it barren. The currents of air are among the most important factors in the physical geography of our earth, affecting not only soil and climate, but also vegetal and animal life. The winds obtain their moisture through evaporation, which goes on everywhere and at all times, in the equatorial and polar oceans, from the rich cultivated soil and the arid desert, from the valley and the snow-clad mountain. Recluse tells us that the evaporation from the equatorial ocean is from 13 to 16 feet a year, this estimate is confirmed by the United States Geological Survey, which found the evaporation from the southern Colorado River to be 102 inches, or nearly 9 feet in a year. The quantity of water evaporated from the land must be very large, as only about two-fifths of the rainfall is returned by the rivers to the ocean. A great part, probably more than one-half of this quantity, is re-evaporated to fall the second and third time as rain. The movements of the atmosphere depend either directly or indirectly on differences of temperature. Without these differences, the air and ocean would be stagnant. There is a constant interchange of atmosphere between the equator and the poles. Cool air from the north blows toward the equator, first in a southwesterly, then in a westerly direction, crossing the Atlantic about the Tropic of Cancer. Cool air from the south blows in a northwesterly and westerly direction, and crosses the Atlantic near the equator. The difference of solar accession between the equator and the poles gives the northward and southward motion to these currents. The revolution of the earth on its axis gives the westerly motion. These air currents are the great trade winds which wafted Columbus across the Atlantic and Magellan across the Pacific. The trade winds of the northern Atlantic are about 20 degrees in width from north to south. Those of the southern Atlantic are not quite so wide. These winds oscillate northward in August and southward in February, following the sun. Between the trade winds of the north and the trade winds of the south there is a zone of calm. While the winds blow over the land, as well as over the ocean, their movements, interrupted by hills and mountains and affected by temperature, lose that broad sweep and uniformity so characteristic of the ocean. Return currents of warm air blow across the ocean from the torrid zone toward the northeast in the northern Atlantic, and toward the southeast in the southern Atlantic. The trade winds, or equatorial currents, blow around the world from east to west. The polar currents blow from west to east. The great ocean currents follow the same general course as the wind system. Their movements are initiated by differences in density, caused chiefly by temperature and by evaporation. Yet the larger part of the motive power is derived from the wind. These movements have been ascertained by years of observation on vessels in every ocean, sea, and gulf, by the cumulative evidence of drifting objects, some of which had their influence on the spread of vegetal and animal life, and even civilization itself, and by the researches of scientific exploring expeditions to polar regions and remote islands. These oceanic movements are as well understood as those of the great atmospheric ocean above us. When water has acquired its movement, the configuration of the bottom of the ocean and of the shoreline, the rotation of the globe on its axis, and the direction and velocity of the wind modify its movement. South America By this circulation, the equatorial waters of the Atlantic blow across that ocean, impinge against the coast of South America, and are deflected northward and southward. The southeasterly trade winds blowing over it become surcharged with moisture and pass directly up the valley of the Amazon, watering the earth with frequent rains for 2,000 miles to the foothills of the Andes, where some of this moisture is deflected by the mountains southeastward to water southern Brazil. The remainder ascends the slopes of the Andes until it condenses and falls as rain and snow, 
and only dry winds blow across the comparatively narrow plains between the Andes and the Pacific. The vapor from the Atlantic falling of the rain over the valley of the Amazon, and along the eastern slope of the Andes and the Cordilleras, flows back to the ocean through the Orinoco, the Amazon and La Plata, and makes the interior of South America one of the richest countries of the world. The Amazon, a great Mediterranean sea as it is often rightly called, is projected into the heart of the continent. Its total fall, from the foothills of the Cordilleras to the ocean is not over 300 or 400 feet, affording for the largest vessels uninterrupted navigation and innumerable harbors for 1,500 miles into the interior and 1,000 miles further for smaller vessels. The aggregate navigable waters of the main stream and its tributaries are estimated at 50,000 miles. The moist winds abundantly water the valley and modify its climate. Their influence in tempering the climate is felt directly more than 1,000 miles up the valley, and indirectly still further, through the shadows thrown by the clouds and through the rainfall and cooling effect of the drops of rain falling from a high altitude. It is from 8 degrees to 10 degrees cooler than on either side of this rain belt, and it is more healthful than other equatorial regions. The tropical woods are so thick and the creepers and undergrowth so luxuriant that animal life is almost entirely confined to the trees above and the waters below. Nature has thus far been more powerful than man who has struggled in vain to subdue this fertile valley to his use. The winds that pass up the valley of Rio de la Plata to the mountains of Peru, Bolivia, and Argentina are not so heavily charged with moisture as those of the Amazon Valley. Consequently, the thick forests and dense vegetation gradually disappear, and instead of an inland sea, there are vast plains or pampas over which roam herds that could not live in the valley of the Amazon. Thus the difference in the rainfall changes the entire vegetal and animal life. Through the center of South America, from the Caribbean Sea to the Straits of Magellan, there is a vast stretch of lowland through which run the waters of the Orinoco, Amazon, and La Plata, with low divides between their valleys. A boat can pass up the Orinoco, thence by Casaquere River to the Rio Negro, a branch of the Amazon, thus through the Amazon and its branches to a low divide between the valleys of the Amazon and the Rio de la Plata. Here there is a carry of six or eight miles, and then continuing down La Plata to the Atlantic Ocean, the traveler may make a water journey of over 3,000 miles between the Cordillera and the eastern plains of South America. The easterly currents flowing from the Antarctic Pole are deflected by Cape Horn along both eastern and western coasts of Patagonia. On the eastern coast, the winds blow offshore, leaving that coast arid. The westerly current, as it approaches the tropics, is deflected further westward and forms the greatest of the equatorial currents. The moisture of the winds that blow over this Antarctic current is precipitated on the cool shores of Patagonia and Lower Chile, and these countries are correspondingly enriched, while the same winds continuing over the heated plains of Upper Chile, Peru, and Southern Ecuador are rarefied and take up what little moisture there is in these plains, to be afterward condensed and precipitated on the mountain slopes. From this cause, the western coast of South America for the 3,000 miles from Lower Chile to Upper Ecuador is dry and barren, and would be uninhabited except for the mines of gold and silver in the mountains and the deposits of nitrates and guano along the coast and on the islands. Yet the rainfall in South America is greater than in any other part of the world, and more than twice as great as the rainfall in Asia. North America The northern equatorial current, less powerful than the southern, crosses the Pacific about the Tropic of Cancer, where it is deflected by Japan and flows northward as the Kuroshiwu Current, recrossing the Pacific in a northeasterly direction. The Pacific Ocean is so wide that it is doubtful if this current would reach the American coast were it not for the drift caused by the wind which blows across the Pacific with strong and steady force. When it strikes the shores of North America, it is feebler and has a lower temperature than the Gulf Stream of the Atlantic Ocean on reaching the coast of Europe. The currents of wind strike the coast between the 50th and 55th degree of north latitude, the region of greatest rainfall, and are in part deflected northward and southward by the coast range of mountains. The remaining portion blows over the mountains and up the valley of the Columbia. Continental fogs and rains abound on these shores, and the coasts of southern Alaska, 
British Columbia, Washington, and Oregon are covered with the densest and largest growth of evergreen forest in the world. These winds prevail as far southward as the latitude of San Francisco, where the southeasterly trade winds commence and blow offshore, leaving southern California and the western coast of Central America a zone of calms, dry and barren. While the western coast of the continent is bathed by the waters of the Pacific, its eastern shores are washed by the equatorial current of the northern Atlantic, which flows around the West India Islands through Caribbean Sea and the Gulf of Mexico. The trade winds from the Gulf of Mexico water the eastern coasts of Central America and Mexico, and impinging on the mountains of the interior are deflected towards the north and east, over the southeastern states and up the Mississippi Valley, where they unite with the warm winds which blow directly up the valley from the Gulf of Mexico and water the valley of the Mississippi. The rainfall in the upper part of the valley is derived largely from the Rocky Mountains. The waters of the Pacific, carried by the winds and deposited on the Rocky Mountains as rain and snow, being again evaporated and carried eastward to fall as rain. This great valley extends from Canada southward to the Gulf of Mexico, and from the Rocky Mountains eastward to the Alleghenies. It is 1,500 miles long and 2,000 miles wide, the largest and richest valley of the temperate zone. A very low and narrow divide separates the Mississippi Valley from another great valley extending from the Rocky Mountains eastward with a gentle slope to Hudson Bay and the Atlantic. It is as long from west to east as the valley of the Mississippi is from north to south and is from 500 to 600 miles wide. The western portion of this plain is drained by Saskatchewan River. The winds which blow over this valley from the Rocky Mountains in some years water imperfectly the western portion of this plain but with a copious rainfall, the land yields abundantly. The eastern portion is watered from Hudson Bay, Lakes Winnipeg, Manitoba, and the other large lakes of the province. As the climate is cold, less rainfall is required than in the valley of the Mississippi. Another very low divide separates this valley from the Great Plain, 2,500 miles long, descending with a gentle slope to the Arctic Ocean through which runs the Mackenzie River. The winds that blow from the Arctic Ocean fall in rain and snow in this valley. Thus, through the center of America, from the Arctic to the Antarctic Oceans, there are no high elevations, while there is a more uniform distribution of rainfall and temperature than on any other continent. From the Arctic Ocean, cold currents of water flow along both the eastern and western coasts of Greenland and bear immense icebergs and fields of ice southward until they meet the warm waters of the Gulf Stream, where the ice melts causing fog banks and depositing the debris brought from the Arctic glaciers, thus aiding in the making of the great fishing banks of Newfoundland. The Arctic current, still cold, runs southward inshore from the Gulf Stream and affects the climate of North America to the latitude of New York, if not to Cape Hatteras. From the Caribbean Sea and the Gulf of Mexico, the Gulf Stream passes around Florida and flows along the southern Atlantic states. The currents of air from the Gulf Stream blow over slightly cooler waters and deposit rain on the eastern side of the Alleghenies and water the eastern coast of the United States. Europe The main Gulf Stream is deflected by the shape of the ocean bottom and the contour of North America, northward and eastward, toward Europe, but its drift is largely increased by the winds. The drift from the southward sets around the North Cape of Norway, 71 degrees north latitude, keeping the coast free from ice all the year round, and it is felt in the Kara Sea. It is by means of this current that Nansen hopes to be borne through the Kara Sea and from the Lena Delta by way of the North Pole to Greenland. The winds that blow over the Gulf Stream water the western coast of France, Great Britain, and Scandinavia, and temper the climate of these northern regions to such degree that Stockholm and St. Petersburg have become great cities, while in a lower latitude in Labrador, on the other side of the Atlantic, the country is so rocky and rough, and the temperature so intensely cold in the winter, lower than the inhabited parts of Greenland, that Labrador would be worthless and uninhabitable, except for the seals and fish. These currents are deflected by the coasts of France and Spain towards the west, and are drifted in different directions by the wind, watering the eastern coasts of Spain and Portugal, but having precipitated their moisture, they leave the highlands of Spain dry, cold in winter and hot in summer. In the Mediterranean, the evaporation is much greater than in the Atlantic Ocean. Its water is therefore salt and heavier. 
To supply this loss by evaporation, water flows from the Atlantic into the Mediterranean, from west to east, as a surface current. The projection of Italy and Greece into the sea deflects these currents along each coast of both countries. The general course of the winds of southern Europe is interrupted by the Alps and Apennines of Italy, and by the high mountains of Greece. Land and sea breezes water these countries in August and September, while the winter snow on the Alps fills the Italian streams in summer and irrigates the land through numerous canals. A plain, beginning in Holland and Belgium, runs through Germany, gradually growing broader into Russia, where it is known as the Black Zone, thence northwest through a large part of Siberia. It is low in the west, gradually rising toward the east, though in Siberia its northern margin dips gently beneath the Arctic Ocean. The western part of this plain is watered by the winds from the Atlantic and from the North and Baltic Seas and the Gulf of Finland. The eastern part of Siberia is watered by the winds from the Arctic Ocean. These plains are the granary of Europe and Siberia, although a small part, comparatively, of the Siberian plain is good for corn. Asia the regularity in the motion of the currents of air and water prevailing in the Western Hemisphere and the Atlantic Ocean is apparently lacking in Asia and the Indian Ocean. The mountains of America run northward and southward, and have little, if any, effect in originating currents of air, and none at all on the ocean currents. In Asia, the largest and highest mass of mountains in the world runs east and west, and from their foothills the great plains of India and China extend to the Indian Ocean and the China Sea bringing a polar climate into close contact with the torrid zone. Cold winter winds blow from the Himalayas and the high plateaus of Central Asia southwestward into Indian Ocean and China Sea and drift the waters with them. When the sun turns toward the north in the summer solstice and the plains in India and China become heated by the torrid sun, the wind changes and blows toward the northeast. At the meeting of the winds, the monsoon breaks, and the cyclones of India and the typhoons of China follow. They are soon over, and then the monsoon blows over Indian Ocean and China Sea. All India, Kashmir and western Tibet, further India, Annam and eastern China and Japan are well watered, fifty feet of rain falling in a year in some parts of India. In these countries there are generally six months of rainy season and six months of dry. In parts of India, the water of the rainy season is stored in large reservoirs for irrigation in the dry season, while in China, numerous canals between the different rivers in like manner irrigate the land. India and China are among the richest countries of the world and have the densest population, though destined to be surpassed in the future by the population of the Amazon and Mississippi valleys. We have thus seen the effects of the winds and ocean currents in modifying the climate and in enriching the great valleys of South America and North America, of Europe, India, China and Japan. Deserts or basins. About one fifth of the territory in each continent is arid and desert land. With one or two possible exceptions, these arid regions are basins, where the rivers and rainfall either run into salt lakes or are lost in the desert and never reach the ocean. These deserts are caused by winds which blow either from colder over warm areas and are therefore dry or over vast plains or mountainous regions upon which they have precipitated their moisture. The average rainfall on the great deserts does not exceed 10 inches a year, and the evaporation is usually greater than the rainfall. They are situated generally between the 20th and 40th degrees of north latitude and between the 20th and 30th degrees of south latitude. In the northern belt are the Carson and other basins of Nevada, the Salt Lake of Utah, the Desert of Sahara, Arabia, Persia, the Aral Caspian Desert, the Tanin Gobi, and the Mongolia Desert. In the southern belt is the desert of Antakama in South America, Kalahari in South Africa, and the Australian deserts. These basins in the northern belt contained formerly lakes much greater than are now found in either of the continents. Salt Lake was formerly much larger and deeper, for its waters once beat upon the shores 1,000 feet higher up the mountainsides than at present. Its waters then found their way to the ocean. This was probably in the Ice Age, when the surrounding mountains were covered with snow and great glaciers, and the evaporation was much less than the rainfall and the water from the melting glaciers. In the deserts of Sahara, numerous dry water courses show where great rivers formerly ran into Lake Tihad. In Asia, the Caspian and Aral Seas were connected, covering a territory many times greater than at present, 
with an outlet to the Bosphorus and Mediterranean. We have not sufficient knowledge of Arabia to know the former condition of that arid country. The process of desiccation is still going on, and how much longer it will continue no one can tell. Mountains of America Next, we will notice the influence of the mountains on the atmosphere, either in enriching or impoverishing a country or in intensifying the movements of the currents of air and water. The mountains of America rise at the Arctic Ocean and form the divide between the Mackenzie and Yukon rivers. A second range runs from northeastern Alaska through Mount St. Elias. Then these two bands extend through British Columbia, gradually widening as new ranges arise until they obtain a width of 500 miles at the boundary line between British Columbia and the United States, and a width of 1,000 miles on the line of the Union Pacific Railroad. These two ranges, the Sierra Nevada and the Rocky Mountains, come together in southern Mexico and extend as a single range through Central America and the Isthmus of Panama. On entering South America, this range again divides forming the Cordilleran and the Andes systems, and thence they extend southward with a varying width between them from 40 to 200 miles. They are connected from east to west by several cross ranges or spurs. From southern Chile, the Andes continues as one chain through Patagonia and Tierra de Fuego to Cape Horn. This is the longest and most persistent chain of mountains in the world. The peaks gradually rise in height from north to south until in Chile, Aconcagua, 22,427 feet in height, is the culminating point. Then southerly, the range generally lowers to an elevation of a few hundred feet only at the Straits of Magellan and Cape Horn. Several volcanoes in this long range rise to a greater elevation than any of the non-volcanic peaks. In North America, the currents of air from the Pacific Ocean in passing over the coast, Sierras, and other ranges deposit a large portion of their moisture on the mountains. Between these ranges are warm valleys, and the winds chilled in crossing the mountains evaporate the little moisture in these valleys, and they are left dry and arid unless irrigated by mountain streams. Thus we have a succession of arid valleys and green mountain ranges, moistened with rain and snow, and rich in forests and vegetation. A number of these valleys are enclosed basins, from which the mountain streams have no outlet to the ocean, and in some of which saline lakes are found. Mountains of Asia In Asia we have the largest continent, the highest mountains, the most elevated plateaus, and the greatest extent of desert land in the world. The Pamir, or Roof of the World, the Abode of the Gods, as it was called by the inhabitants, is a vast plateau of 30,000 square miles area, with a north and south extension of about 400 miles, and with a mean elevation of 12,000 feet. It is traversed by a high range of mountains culminating in the Taghama, 25,500 feet in height. The Pamir was the only barrier Alexander could not pass. Now, the English, the Russians, and the Chinese meet on this plateau and struggle for the control of Asia. From it branch all the great mountain ranges of Asia. The Hindu Kush range runs west through Afghanistan between Persia and Turkestan along the southern shore of the Caspian Sea, culminating in Mount Ararat, thence as the Caucasus Mountains to the Black Sea, while a spur of this chain follows the southern shores of the Black Sea to the Mediterranean. The Himalayas run a little south of east from the southern part of the Pamir for 1,500 miles, separating India from Tibet and China. The Kuen Luen Range, sometimes considered as an extension of the Hindu Kush, runs from the middle of the Pamir through western and part of central China for 2,700 miles. The Thian Shan runs from the northern end of the Pamir northeast, separating Tarim and Mongolia from Siberia. As it approaches the ocean, it turns toward the north and ends in Kamkachka, forming the great divide between the waters of the Arctic and Pacific Oceans. Between these mountain ranges are elevated plateaus, and the former dominate the rainfall and temperature of the continent. The steeper slope of the mountains of Asia is toward the Indian Ocean, between the Himalayas and Kuen Luen ranges, and running from the Pamir East is the highest and longest plateau in the world, varying from 17,000 to 10,000 feet, its lowest elevation. Above this plain, the mountains tower from 4,000 to 18,000 feet. Their summits are covered with everlasting snow from 8,000 to 10,000 feet below their crests. Here is truly the abode of the snow. 
this plateau from its height and position between two ranges of mountains is cold in winter and hot in summer this is tibet the land of the lama here all the great rivers that empty into the pacific and indian oceans excepting the yukon the columbia the colorado and the zambesi have their source in the western part of tibet the indus and brahmanputra rise one running west through a pass fourteen thousand feet in height into india the other running east through passes thus far inaccessible and unknown into india east of the headwaters of these two rivers rise the rivers of siam and farther india further to the northeast rise the great rivers of china the huang ho and yang si kiang their valleys are separated by high chains of mountains extending in a northwest and southeast direction the huang ho runs north and east through the temperate zone of china and the Yangtze Kiang, south and east, through the semi-tropical regions of Middle China. As they gradually approach, they enclose a great valley and become the arteries of the superabundant life of the empire. The eastern part of this great valley, watered by the winds from the China Sea, is crossed from northeast to southwest by parallel ridges, from which numerous streams descend. The valley of eastern China is thus abundantly watered, and the rich soil yields bountiful crops. For thousands of years this region has been the home of the Chinese, a self-dependent world. It is a limited territory of 1.3 million square miles, no larger than the valley of the Mississippi, yet it sustains a population of 400 million, or one-third of the people of the globe. North of the Kuen Luen Mountains, and the valley of the Huang Ho, and south of the Thian Shan, is the plateau of the Tarim, sometimes called East Turkestan. It is much lower than Tibet, and is traversed by cross-ranges of hills or low mountains, through which flows the river Tarim. Little rain falls on this plateau. The sand from the desert is gradually covering the fertile valleys. The ancient lakes are now little more than salt marshes, and where formerly lived bands of Huns and Vandals that overran Europe, now only a few shepherds find a scanty living. This part of the world seems exhausted. Without a shrub or tree or blade of grass, and no longer fit for the residence of man, it has become the sole home of the wild horse and the yak. East of this plateau of Tarim are the deserts of Gobi and Mongolia, which extend far eastward toward the Sea of Japan, a high range of mountains separating Mongolia, however, from the sea coast, so that only dry winds blow over these great deserts. North of the Thian Shan and the Altai Mountains is the Great Plain of Siberia, it starts from a lower level than that of the Tarim Desert, and descends with a gradual slope northwards for 1,500 miles to the Arctic Ocean. These plains resemble in some respects the Great Plains of the United States, but the latter slope toward the east and south, with a climate growing continually warmer, while the Siberian Plains slope toward the north, the temperature growing continually colder. The winds in summer blow from the Arctic Ocean over these plains to the Altai Mountains, while in winter they blow from the mountains to the ocean. There is a slight evaporation from the Arctic Ocean, but the temperature of Siberia is so low and the summers so short that the plains require comparatively slight rainfall to fertilize them. There is a large portion of Asia, Arabia, Persia, Turkestan, including Caspian and Aral Seas, to which we have not particularly referred because it is entirely outside of the influence of either the monsoon, trade, or other moisture-bearing winds. This territory extends from Arabia northeastward beyond the lake of Balkash into Siberia, a vast extent of country, larger than Europe, a dry, rainless desert, hot in summer and cold in winter. Part of this region is from six to 7,000 feet above the level of the sea, part below the sea level, yet neither height nor depression makes any difference in this arid land. Formerly sections of these countries were thickly populated, the Aral and Caspian basins were once called the Garden of the World. In Mesopotamia were Nineveh, Baghdad, and Babylon. In Persia, Susa, and Persepolis. Historians tell us of great cities, flourishing empires, where now is only a barren and sandy desert. We do not know whether the climate has changed or whether in ancient days the country was thoroughly irrigated, and now through neglect has been buried deep in the sand of the desert. Although four-fifths of Asia are either desert or mountainous land, and are only scantily inhabited, two-thirds of the population of the world are found within its borders. End of section 17
Section 18 of the National Geographic Magazine, Volume 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Proceedings of the International Geographic Conference in Chicago, July 27-28, 1893. Memoirs and Addresses. The Relation of Geography to History. By Francis W. Parker. Geography is the science of the present appearance of the Earth's surface. Geology is the history of the present appearance of the Earth's surface, the record of the countless changes which have led to the present phase of geology or geography. Mineralogy is the science of the rock material which has undergone countless changes. Physics and chemistry are the sciences of the laws of change in the crust of the Earth as well as in air and water generally. Meteorology is the study of heat acting through air and moisture, changing the Earth's surface, producing and sustaining life. Geography, with its kindred sciences of inorganic matter here named, may be called the science of the physical basis of life, since it deals with the environment, the support and the nourishment of life. It is therefore the interpretation of life. The modern geologist, who reads as an open book the present surface of the earth in all its varied forms, traces there the significance of each characteristic area. In other words, the present surface forms of the earth are the visible revelation of its geologic history. Thus each particular form has its profound significance. It is to him the manifestation of all the changes that the earth has undergone by the action of forces through matter under law. But there is still a higher and more important significance of surface forms that may be called functional. Geography has been defined as the physical basis of life. Life in its multiplicity of organisms can best be studied by understanding the influence of structural and meteorological environment upon it. Ethnology and history are the sciences or philosophies, if you please, of the evolution of the human soul from the beginning. When the written record fails, then suppositions must fall back upon all the influences which surrounded it in its earlier stages. Of these influences, probably, the geographical structure is the most potent. We owe to the founder of modern geography, Carl Ritter, the first systematic investigation in the direction of the relation of history to geography. Ritter's fundamental statement, though not given in his own words, may be stated as follows that each and every characteristic area of the Earth's surface has had a determining influence on the evolution of mankind. This statement presents us a working hypothesis for our study of this subject, the relation of history to geography, but it needs some very marked modifications and limitations in order to make it valuable as a means of searching for truth in history. First, there are marked differences in the influences of a characteristic territory or a specially defined form of surface structure on man in each stage of his development. For example, a particular structure may act as an obstruction to growth in one phase of man's evolution, while in another phase it would be of the greatest assistance. The savage aborigines of India probably deteriorated in a land which afterward presented great advantages to the invading Aryans. If those savages could have taken up bodily and put down on the vast steppes of Eurasia, they would have, in a forced nomadic life, taken a vigorous step in advance, while the Aryans, who had had the education of the plains, took a mighty step forward in the refuge which the great mountain walls offered against the attack of their nomad enemies. A land of swamp and morass exercises one influence on the savage as a land of refuge. To the barbarian and civilized man, however, it is a land easily defended by ditches, canals, and dikes. It is of the first importance to know the degrees of development before we can have any understanding of the influence of the structure of the country. The second modification is in regard to the community life of the people or the ethnographic relations in tribes and nations. These relations of gens and tribes and fratries in the evolution of peoples are common to all mankind in whatever part of the globe. They have had a tendency to overcome and control to a certain extent the influences of structure. The Aryan race, for instance, whether they lived in the tropics or in cold Norway, 
had in their community life the same general tendencies, the same habits and customs, the same worship of ancestors, modified, it is true, to a degree by their environment of structure and climate. The third modification is probably the highest of all, and is that which has been foreshadowed in the ethnic relations of a people, that the human spirit in all lands, ages, and stages of growth from the beginning has had the same general tendencies, modified, it is true, greatly by structure and climate, but nevertheless overcoming to a degree all external influences. This is shown by the fact, although it is still under discussion, that collision, contact, and mutual influences of peoples with peoples have not been necessary to similar manifestations and common tendencies. It is also shown by the universality of like myths, of religious beliefs, fetishes, totems, and religious tendencies, common to the Eskimo and South Sea Islanders, and arts that bear strong resemblances that grew out of these common tendencies. With these great modifications of the fundamental principle of the influence of surface structure on the growing life of man, the knowledge of geography, that is, of surface structure, is absolutely indispensable to the study of history. The study of history, briefly stated, is the study of the growth and development of the spirit, or soul, of man from the beginning, the study of the individual, anthropology, the study of community life of man, ethnology, and with it, closely allied, is the study of the influence of surface structure, or geography, and its relation to that life. It is not my purpose to present a method for the study of geography in its relation to history, but rather to call attention to the general direction of this study. We may begin in broad lines and show the common relations of similar forms of structure, as, for instance, the influence of mountains, natural fortresses and enclosures, swamps and desert oases, as places of refuge for tribes and nations, after they have passed the lower phases of the development of the plains and steppes. The steppe or prairie was adapted to nomad life, a stage of evolution which may be considered as indispensable to human evolution. The periodic or scanty rains on the steppes made grass the principal means of nourishment. Nomad life on the steppes of Eurasia had far stronger influences on civilization than the prairies of America, for the old world had domesticated cattle, while the prairies were mere hunting grounds until river bends afforded protection to barbarians emerging from lower stages. From tract to tract, the nomad drove his cattle in order to gain sufficient nourishment and in that life the attrition with other tribes, the struggle for existence, led to a higher stage, and the tilling of the soil and the building of the village began. The moment a barbarian discovered the art of agriculture and remained in one favorable place for a time, he took a long step in development, but, surrounded by wandering savages, he was at a great disadvantage. He was the prey of his savage brother, who burned his house and stole his cattle. This led him to seek for a place of refuge, and here we see the direct relation of natural fortresses, mountain fastnesses, the enclosures by deserts or swamplands to history. Thus we have India, a great naturally enclosed fortress, walled in by high mountains on the north, easily defended by passes on the west. We have Persia, Palestine, desert enclosed Egypt, Greece, Italy, Spain, Great Britain, Norway, Mexico, and Peru. The Aryans of India, the Semites of Palestine, and the mound builders of Mexico and the Incas of Peru no doubt fled from the open lands to the great structural fortresses of mountain and desert. Prolonged relief from continued or threatened war made civilization possible. Again, each natural fortress, by its structure and climate, determines to a great degree the special influences. The structure and climate of India present a marked contrast to those of Norway in their influences on the same race. Egypt, in its valley unity, its unity of river source and silt distribution, led, we are told, to monarchy and monotheism. Greece, with its mountain-walled valleys, made polytheism a human necessity and founded democracy. The little strait that separates England from the continent determined the peculiar civilization of Great Britain. The shutting out of Russia from the practicable harbors and natural seaports hemmed in the civilization of that land. We have already spoken of the grassy plains. 
With regular rains, forests spring from the plains and make it possible for man to take higher steps in civilization. Wood and timber presented the necessity for tools. Forests were the means of both protection and progress. The vigor of the early stages of the Aryan race may be traced to the forests on the northern and western slopes of Europe. It can be said that a shut-up condition is absolutely necessary during one phase in the evolution of a nation, but the contact of a nation with other nations by friendly intercourse or war is as absolutely necessary in higher stages of growth. China, a pioneer in human civilization, owes its present state of fixed ideas to the isolation of vast deserts and mountain regions. The contact of Greece with the Roman Empire gave the tremendous influence of Grecian art, literature, and politics. True, the Romans conquered Greece, but, in a far higher sense, Greece conquered the whole world through her aggressors, for the invading Romans not only gathered the rich fruit of the little peninsula, but scattered its seeds over the whole civilized world. The plateau continent, Africa, is the most marked illustration of the influence of geography on human development. Rivers falling from highland to highland in cataracts make inland navigation exceedingly difficult, thus isolating her tribes from the outer world. It is a common inference that the higher the stage of civilization, the less dependent man is on surface structure. True, the path of progress is marked by overcoming and subduing physical obstructions, but that does not limit the developing influences of characteristic areas of surface. Utah, changed to a garden by man's invention and enterprise, exerts a far stronger influence than it did as a desert on the degraded savage. The savage hunted over Pennsylvania, totally ignorant of the riches that lay beneath his feet. The civilized man comes and uses the vast treasures to his own advantage, but in this change we do not say that he frees himself from nature. He simply uses natural products, uses environment for a higher stage of growth. The river valleys once marked the lines of migration of tribes and nations, of which the Danube is a notable instance. Under civilized man, the same river cuttings and natural excavations are made the new pathway of the civilized world, the railroad. The vast plain to a low stage of civilization is either a hunting ground or a pasture of cattle. In the higher stages, this plain becomes a place where civilized men from all nations and tribes under the sun can come together and live together, melt and fuse into one great nation. Different nations have gone through the wild, nomad life, the life of the fortress, and have reached a stage in which isolation means decay. The fortress life hems in the intellectual and moral life, and they step back to the plains of their ancestors to live together in one great nation on the grandly modeled continent of North America. These are only some of the phases in the interpretation of history in its relation to geography. There is a psychologic relation which is organically connected with the study of history. The Earth's surface is the home of man, and geography is the study of that home. A psychologic definition may be given as follows. The study of geography is the formation of an individual concept of the Earth's surface, gained either by observation or by imagination. That is, the study of geography is the formation of individual concepts corresponding to the Earth's surface as a whole or any of its parts. The Earth's surface, as the home of man, is the stage on which all human action has taken place. Not only does the structure interpret, to a great degree, the events in the evolution of man, but it is at the same time an indispensable factor in the retention or memorizing of historical facts. In other words, history can neither be understood nor remembered without a clear mental picture of the stage or the surface structure on which the historical events took place. The knowledge of surface structure is of the greatest economical importance to the study of history. In the usual way of studying history, events, the march of nations, wars, are not clearly localized and defined. Facts and events, schweben in der Luft, as the Germans say. They are only related by the vague web of time without any notion of differentiated space, and are therefore easily forgotten. We all know in early youth how a child spontaneously cultivates fancy and imagination. Geography is essentially, in its basis, the product of imagination, the imagining of surface characters. 
To illustrate, a clear mental picture can easily be acquired of the beautifully modeled peninsula of Greece, with its great northern defensive barrier of mountain maze, its midrib of the Pindus, its beautiful valleys, and its great walls of mountains. Here are the conditions for the autonomy of 17 states, and the necessary proximity for mutual influence and defense. The separation, as I have already said, produced polytheism and initiated democracy, the proximity, federal life. Now, a distinct picture of this beautiful peninsula, surrounded by its seas, is an easily acquired product of geography by real study. It must, however, be said in this connection that there is very little true geography, the geography of Ritter and Guillot, now taught in our schools. We must all admit that the most of the so-called geography now taught in the schools is a conglomerated mass and mess of disconnected and doubtful facts, with little or no psychologic unity and very little practical use. Witness the failure of the best geography ever written, The Common School Geography by Guillot. It is doubtful whether that splendid book ever paid for its maps. Real geography is not taught because teachers do not understand it and because they have very little or no means of studying it. But to return to the main point in question, how easy it is to develop by the imagination a clear concept of the peninsula of Greece, the main range of the Pindus, the spurs and the plateau of Peloponnesus. On this basis, how easy and how delightful it is to follow the development of Greece from the ages of the gods and heroes through its struggles to its highest reach of art and intellect. We can see Thermopylae and study with interest the memorable events connected with it. We can study the marathon plain. We can travel with the athletes to Ellis. We can picture the unwalled city of Sparta. This is only one example of the countless instances in which the memorizing of history would be made permanent, effective, and delightful. The causes are studied, the effects known, and the pictures become more and more distinct. Geography is the study of the Earth's surface as the home of man, the influence of that home on man's growth, and it is organically united, psychologically related to memory. Geography, the picturing of the divinely modeled Earth, is beautiful and inspiring in itself. No art man ever produced equals in beauty and grandeur the sculptured Earth, but add to this intrinsic glory the function of the Earth as the home of man, a home that throughout the ages has been his home and school alike. Trace human history in all its stages by the light that the study of geography throws over it, and we have a subject of extreme fascination in itself and of the highest use in education. End of section 18. Recording by Karen. Section 19 of the National Geographic Magazine, Volume 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rosehip. Section 19. Proceedings of the International Geographic Conference in Chicago, July 27th to 28th, 1893. Memoirs and Addresses. Norway and the Vikings by Captain Magnus Andersen. I am called upon to speak of the Vikings. I do not know that I can tell much more about the Vikings than most of you have read in history, though it may interest you to know that it is an ordinary sailor who speaks of them. But I might improve the opportunity to tell you a little about modern Norway. As you know, Norway united with Sweden in 1814 on equal terms, that is to say, each country enjoying the freedom and liberty of a government independent of the other, except as to the king and the diplomatic representation abroad. This union has benefited both countries to a large extent, and every true Norwegian of today feels an admiration for his forefathers who had the courage to sacrifice home and almost everything dear to them to save the liberty of Norway, 
which was threatened not only by foreign foes but by starvation which stared the people in the face in 1814 by reason of this union both norway and sweden have advanced in commerce so that today we do not call ourselves a very poor nation we have a commerce which we believe to be up to the times the norwegian fisheries are conducted on the most modern principles great improvements have been made and new devices invented and utilized the norwegian department in the fisheries building at the world's fair speaks for itself and i think everyone will agree with me that it is astonishing what a small nation can do our fish exports amount to something like thirteen million dollars a year which is very well for two million people besides the ordinary fisheries the whale and seal industries have in the last forty years yielded a handsome income to the country the pioneer of this trade is the still living commander sven foyne who by his intelligence energy endurance and integrity raised himself from an ordinary sea captain to the wealthiest man in norway he is now eighty-four or eighty-five years old and has been going to sea since he was fourteen we have also had since the tenth or eleventh century our wood industries and the exporting of wood is next to the fisheries when the latter fail we always have something to fall back on the wood export consists mostly of dressed goods wood pulp spars and poles which are shipped all over europe though the largest consumers are great britain and the english colonies mining and quarrying are carried on and in the last fifty years important manufacturing districts have sprung up where sufficient water power was found and every year enterprising young men go out to foreign lands and on returning set up fresh branches of industry another source of income is the great number of tourists within the last few years who are attracted by the beautiful scenery of the land of the midnight sun however this has demoralized poor farmers somewhat and we have always been proud of our farmers the important place which shipping norway occupies is world-renowned the norwegian merchant flag floats on every sea and each one of norway's two million inhabitants represents one ton of shipping placing us fourth in the ocean carrying trade the bulk of our shipping is employed by foreign nations indicating that shippers have confidence in us as seamen a glance at the map will show that it is not an agricultural country although the ruling class are farmers our rock-bound country with its long and rugged coast has a wonderful attraction in the roaring north sea and every boy as soon as his arm has attained sufficient muscular strength goes off to make his living there it is no wonder then that the norwegians are found in every part of the world and that they have gained a reputation for being first-class sailors the word viking must undoubtedly have originated from the word vik and indicated in olden times what is now known by the term pirates they were no doubt worthy of that name as they committed many an evil deed by perusing the sagas it will be found that these men possessed many good qualities which make their characters a very interesting study they had a manly independence and a high sense of honour and liberty as well as courage and pluck their word was never doubted and their promise never broken they treated a weaker enemy fairly and toward women behaved like true gentlemen 
it is true that their expeditions gave them the name of plunderers and fearful warriors who ruined everything before them but history tells us that these men were also able to found dominions and rule countries we are all acquainted with their voyages around north sea through english channel and to the mediterranean as well as with their discoveries of the faroe islands and greenland but the most interesting expeditions for us to study while we are at the world's fair are undoubtedly those made to this country in the tenth eleventh and twelfth centuries leif ericsson sailed in nine hundred and ninety nine from greenland to norway where he entered into the service of king olaf Tryggvesson there he was christened and started for home the following spring in company with a priest steering what was afterward looked upon as the regular course from norway to greenland between the faroe islands and shetland but he must have been overtaken by storms and carried out of his course for after having drifted about some time he reached an unknown land in the far west where he found wild grapes and uncultivated cornfields he returned to greenland the same year bringing news of the new land which he called vineland and this resulted in two attempts to colonize vineland it will thus be seen that the first discovery of this continent was by chance as all discoveries generally are and was the result of the good seamanship of our ancestors and their love for a seafaring life their voyages back and forth afterward show us also that they were great navigators and daring enough to venture out on the open sea guided only by the sun moon and stars the first attempt which was made to colonize the newly found land was made in the year one thousand under the command of eric the red and thorstein ericsson and failed as the sailors steered too far south and found no land they returned home in the autumn thoroughly exhausted the second time they were more fortunate as torfinn karlsefni early in the spring of one thousand and three took command of another expedition consisting of three ships and a hundred and forty men and set out for vineland which they must have reached safely as we afterward have accounts of helliland markland and vineland by reason of the hostility of the natives they gave up their possessions and returned to greenland in the summer of one thousand and six the inhabitants of greenland were too few to enable them to keep up any colonization outside of their own land thus the expeditions must have terminated for we only hear of another attempt made in the twelfth century by a bishop named eric who started off on missionary work but as no more was heard of him and as a new bishop was elected in his place he must have perished vineland expeditions appear according to norwegian history to have been brought to an end in eleven twenty one according to professor horsford the last ship returned from america to iceland in thirteen forty seven besides the history to prove that our ancestors were here we also have the excavations in massachusetts by professor horsford who with professor anderson has done so much to enlighten the world about the discovery of america Professor Horsford is dead, but I am glad to know that a daughter has taken up the work, and on April the 22nd of this year found the log house built by the party of Torfinn Karlsevni in 1004. It has often been said that the Vikings could never have crossed the northern Atlantic in an open ship such as they had in those days i would not really say that we started on this trip to prove that they could 
because when I first got the idea I had not heard much doubt expressed about it. What we really started for was to bring the ship over to the World's Fair. In 1880 an old Viking ship was discovered buried in the clay of the Norwegian coast, and most of it as sound as it was the day it was put down. Consequently, we were the only nation that could produce such a ship as was used in those days. We knew that Americans admired courage, and that if we could bring a ship such as this over to the World's Fair, that it would be appreciated as well as interesting. We started a subscription. The government had already been asked for money, but they decided that it was too risky an undertaking. They said, if it is to be built for the Chicago World's Fair, and if you will send it over by a steamer, we will vote the money. But if it is to be sailed over, we think it is sport, and very dangerous sport at that, and money will not be appropriated for that purpose. So we went to work and got subscriptions from nearly 15,000 people, ranging all the way from 10 cents to $200, and I believe $250 from one man. That was the man I mentioned, who was the most enthusiastic of the whole lot. Having obtained the money and the model, we started to build the new ship about three or four miles from where the old one was found. Even sailors doubted whether an open ship like that could be brought over safely, and with all my reasonings I was rather doubtful myself. The only argument I had was that if the Vikings could sail the ship over, we ought to be able to. I had confidence in the Viking. We got the ship fitted out and towed her around the coast to Bergen April 1st. Finally, we were off for America. We had been out two weeks before we found what she could really do in heavy weather and how she could steer, encountering then a heavy gale which lasted thirty hours. Up to that time there wasn't a man aboard that took so much as his boots off, but after we found that the ship steered in all kinds of seas, that the rudder on the side worked finely, confidence in our ship gradually stole upon us and after that we took it as easy on board of that ship as on any other. We undressed and went to bed, and I really was ashamed of myself for not believing in history. We were out six weeks altogether, forty-four days from Bergen to New London. The last four weeks we had a favourable passage, encountering some gales during that time, none of them, however, lasting so long as the first one. We did not mind that, because, as I said before, we had obtained confidence in our vessel. And my opinion is that really not fifty per cent of our seafaring class use as safe vessels as the Viking. I would not hesitate to take that ship across the Atlantic any time of the year when I have a cover for it. We had only a canvas one. For eight or nine days the thermometer was down to zero, but we were well dressed and fed, and we were not troubled. On arriving on this side, we had a series of astonishments in the receptions tendered us. I was astonished also that everybody seemed to want to make the trip a kind of demonstration against Columbus's discovery of America. That was something new to me. I tried at banquets and receptions to explain that we didn't wish it that way. During the construction it was proposed to the committee in charge of the ship that we call it the Leif Erikson but we finally decided not to, as we did not want Americans to think us demonstrating. The Norwegian is modest. 
but after we found that the newspapers had taken the case up on this line, we knew there was no use of further discussion. When I get home and they ask me how this came about, I will simply tell them that the American newspapers did it. I feel very grateful to the American people for the reception they have given us, and it will be very gratifying to me to carry home their good wishes. I hope that we have made the impression we wished to make, that we had an old ship of the Vikings of long ago, and that we have sailors at the present day. End of section 19 Section 20 of the National Geographic Magazine, Volume 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by April Walters. Geographic Instruction in the Public Schools by W.B. Powell. The purpose of teaching geography is the education of the learner. The methods of teaching the subject must be such as to secure the end sought. Different views exist among parents and also among teachers respecting what education should do for the learner. Some persons, representing the extreme on one side, believing that the acquisition of knowledge is the main purpose of education. Other persons, representing the extreme on the other side, believing that the training of the faculties of the child constitutes the main purpose of education. Between these two extremes, every grade of belief and every grade of practice respecting the purpose of education finds its adherence. In arranging a course of instruction for the children of the public schools of the District of Columbia, it had been assumed that both ends above named may be accomplished, namely that the children may be trained for the purpose of gaining power, and that while being trained, they may come into possession of knowledge that will be of value to them, and furthermore, that such training may be on lines of experience and investigation that will contribute to develop a power to ensure success in the future prosecution of the study and at the same time the acquisition of the knowledge that lays at the base of all geographical information. The first important end to be secured by the study of geography is to train the learner to see geographic facts or recognize geographic phenomena when he sees them. One who goes through the world with his eyes open is constantly learning and is ever in the possession of enjoyment. It is not an easy matter to train the beginner to see and know what there is to be seen and known by seeing when passing over a country. For instance, to see springs and know their causes, to see the wearing of river banks and the changing of the courses of streams and know their causes, to see the denuding of elevations and know its causes, to see filling and making of valleys and know their causes. This, however, can be done by a systematic course of training. The steps of such training, however, to ensure the desired result, must be sequential, and each must have its definite and well-outlined purpose. Another important end to be secured by studying geography, and one which sequentially follows the first step, is that training which will enable the learner to see geographic facts and to understand geographic phenomena from symbols or from examination of maps and by reading text in connection therewith. An attempt to teach geography by reversing these steps will prove fatal to educational success, for it anticipates the strength of mind and its power to receive. The result of such instruction is not knowledge, but rote information. The latter purpose has in the past constituted the main effort of teaching geography in our schools. The first step, that of training the child to understand geographic phenomena when he sees them, has in the main been omitted. A third purpose of teaching geography is the acquisition of knowledge. This purpose is easily secured when the work for accomplishment of the first two purposes has been systematically carried out. If first knowledge is obtained in the right way, its value is almost inestimable from either of two points of view. First, as an acquisition of the mind on which it has made an impression, because obtained by contact with phenomena firsthand or from original sources, it will serve ever after as an interpreter of kindred information, whether received firsthand by contact with things or through symbolic channels. Second, as a possession of the mind, it is a nucleus to which all future information on the same subject obtained by original investigation or through symbolic channels will be added naturally and logically, 
thus ensuring a well-arranged body of information on that subject at every step of acquisition. The process of learning to see is slow. It is, however, easy if the beginning is made simple, and each step is made a sequential advance on its predecessor. The young mind grows by slow increments. It expands by short stages, but it grows and expands easily, as does its physical home, when given opportunity to do so naturally. To learn to see, the child must make purposive efforts in looking. He must be made to look for the purpose of discovering characteristics. Characteristics are not impressed easily. The young mind does not learn to see until it has looked many times and looked discriminatingly. Phenomena well adapted to the beginning of this kind of training are found in plants and animals. Fortunately, these are geographic phenomena a knowledge of which will be valuable in the future prosecution of geographic knowledge. A study of the forms of leaves, the colors of leaves, the parts of leaves, the growth of leaves, involving comparisons and leading to conclusions, will strengthen the mind systematically and develop its power to see. A study of buds, their forms, their positions, and their development will train the mind systematically, but on a slightly different line from that resulting from the study of leaves. There is, in the study of buds, a beginning of the study of cause and effect, but so simple, so easily understood, that the most childlike mind, if properly directed, can master it. Correspondingly, it may be said of other parts of the study of plants, then may be said of plants in their entirety. By simple steps, each of which is taken many times, the child advances to the knowledge of the forms of plant life and many of the sequential changes of the same. The child's mind during this study is strengthened his breadth of seeing and thinking is enlarged, for it has involved his knowledge of the phenomena of cold and warm weather, of wet and dry weather, of sunshine and cloud, of springtime and summer, of fall and winter, and his experiences, because of other relations of life than those of his school, have been made to form a part of his knowledge as one compact interrelated entirety, and to do office in that training which gives him the power to see and strength to discover cause and effect. The work here indicated is possible in the schoolroom. Fortunately, also, it is the most profitable work that can be done for the accomplishment of those mechanical results which the school is expected to secure. In a corresponding way, the study of animals is equally profitable. It is a little more difficult because the phenomena are not so easily secured for study, a little more difficult again because the phenomena are not so easily understood as those of plants. The child has been prepared for this more difficult work, however, by his study of plants. It will be observed that in the study of units of work thus far named, the child has been made acquainted with many geographic phenomena and has come into the possession of a large geographic vocabulary, every word of which is the symbol of a geographic fact that has come into his possession by contact with the phenomenon itself. To this extent, then, has the mind been trained geographically. It may be said to have a geographic bent. It will be observed also that the teaching thus far has had for its purpose, first, that training which leads to the perception of facts without reference to their causes, facts of size, color, and form, of which the vegetal and animal world furnish so great and delightful a variety, and second, the perception of facts of size, color, and form, and also of use or purpose, which involves an effort to see effect and to discover cause. The materials for use in training the child in these two steps are easily obtained. Their investigation affords a most delightful occupation for the child, which occupation correlates mental and physical activity in the acquisition of knowledge, thus ensuring both mental and physical improvement. The next series of units or facts is learned by both experiment and observation. The child has become strong enough now to project causes and note results. The unit or series of work is the study of vapor and its various phenomena, as steam, cloud, rain, hail, mist, and dew. By experimenting, the child sees water change to dust, become invisible, return to dust, and finally look into his face from the ice pitcher as water again. By repeated efforts, by slow stages, he learns the causes of clouds and their precipitation as rain. He sees the morning mist, rising from the sidewalk as water, being carried away to be formed into drops to be returned again to the hilltop as water, and, by slow degrees and by easy steps, 
he learns that the sun is lifting the water from the sea and from every other place where water is found in whatever form to the skies where it is gathered and drifted and cooled to be returned to the earth thus does he learn one great cause of geographic facts of geographic phenomena without which the mountains would not be denuded valleys would not be made springs would not become and rivers would not flow while the work in the study of plants and animals and in experimenting with water and studying its wonderful and interesting phenomena is going on the child is being trained in some of the simpler steps of the study of position he comes by this means into the possession of a vocabulary that is necessary for future use in the study of geography he learns many terms used in showing this relative positions of objects as up down above below farther nearer beyond this side that side he studies the dimensions of definite areas as the teacher's desk the schoolroom in which he works he learns to represent things on paper with the pencil and placing articles in various positions on the desk he learns to represent them not in perspective but as objects on a flat surface thus he is led from the thing to the symbols of things and thus does he gain power to see things in symbols the school block or the park in front of the school or in some other part of the city is viewed examined and talked about it must be remembered that the talking about the block at this early stage of the work is most essential by repeated viewing repeated examinations and repeated conversations representing in oral symbols what has been seen and the relations of the things that have been seen the mind is caused to grow continuously and with a truly geographic bent an intermediate step is now thrown in that is a new symbol is introduced a symbol between the oral symbol and that of the map representation by the sandboard the block or lot or other portion of ground viewed and examined is represented on the sandboard in miniature in plastic material this is most profitable work in the development of judgment having thus made a miniature block or park on the sandboard in the schoolroom the child is led to represent the same on paper with the pencil and is led to invent the mechanical means by which the elevations and depressions may be represented giving further and valuable cultivation to the productive imagination on determinative lines next comes effort to read corresponding correct maps of parts of the city as blocks or parks which work at first must be very simple the measurable product of such reading is the conversation of the child in oral description and also the representation of what he sees on a little sandboard at his desk in plastic material the product of such work is of greatest value which is not measurable is the growth of the child's mind in learning to read facts from symbols for the world of geography which is to be to him a source of profit and delight throughout his future life will be presented to his mind mainly by means of symbols during all the work thus far outlined the child has been assigned no tasks or at most very few tasks he has been led to put forth purposive effort by an interest that the teacher has aroused in him in the subjects under consideration the kindergarten has been taken up into the primary school but the child has learned geographic terms has learned their uses by using them has learned their definitions by talking about them repeatedly and has learned to spell them by writing them many times in his little compositions he has learned the proper use of english idiom in the expression of geographic phenomena whose forms and other conditions he has sought to explain to his teacher our young learner is yet in the primary school while doing the different kinds of work enumerated above he has been learning to read having read many stories and descriptions and poems related to and based on the work which he has done and which enables him to understand thoroughly what he reads and which causes him to be interested in what he reads because it is the confirmation and expansion of that which he knows to be true as found by his own efforts very few if any tasks have been assigned yet the child has become an original investigator very few lessons have been prescribed yet the child has learned to use english for the expression of exact ideas and in their exact relation very few requirements have been demanded yet the child has made a delightful beginning in the most interesting study of geography if the purpose of the child's school life thus far had only been that he might learn to read 
no more profitable plan nor one more certain of true success could have been adopted if the purpose of the work had been only to teach him to talk correctly to use his mother tongue for a purpose accurately and at the same time exactly no better scheme could have been invented if the purpose of the work had been to train the child to see to discover to project to observe and to conclude within the limits of possibilities of his mind adapted here thereto no better process could have been employed the work however requires ideal teaching it is not done by the assignment of lessons on the part of the teacher it is not done by conning on the part of the child it is done by self-imposed purposive activity on the part of the child it is induced by a loving appreciation of the way the child learns and by a broad intellectual thoroughly planned leading on the part of the teacher thus far have i given what i am pleased here to state from the first circle of teaching of geography in the schools of washington the giving of geographic knowledge has been but a secondary consideration in the teaching of the subject thus far as will readily be seen it has been rather the ever-present aim of all the work to put the learner's mind in a rational attitude toward geographic phenomena quantity is of little importance in any school work more important is that presentation of subjects and that consideration of subjects that result in an attitude on the part of the learner towards these which may be characterized by intellectual alertness or interest intellectual exactness or accuracy and intellectual control or cultivated will the child who has finished a subject in school has not been put in a rational attitude toward that subject the learning must be such that it will nourish and give appetite for more and at the same time develop that intellectual activity and strength that will ensure success and continued pleasure in the further prosecution of the subject he who closes his german book to read no more because he has finished the subject has not been taught right and has studied largely in vain no matter how high he stands on his final examination so it is with any other subject the fault is always in the teaching and is found in the wrong idea of what should be taught or in a wrong selection no less than in the wrong methods of teaching what to teach is harder to determine than how to teach in our study thus far we have been brought in contact with two kinds of phenomena geographic conditions and causes of geographic facts neither has been studied however in a way to show its relation in the groups of geographic categories the child does not know he has been studying geography he has been growing familiar with the forms and other characteristics of naturalistic facts which however have been so grouped as to make their relations easily seen when he shall have reached the stage of progress in his development where it will be desirable and profitable for him to resolve his store of facts into categorical series he has been preparing for geographic study this preparation is not yet complete it must include a knowledge of humanistic phenomena which he must get first hand for geography involves a knowledge of men and of nations with the conditions of their lives and their related industries and commercial characteristics and achievements the second circle of studies may well begin with the study of humanistic phenomena now we study the life of the city in all its ramifications as far as the child is able to understand it the buildings of the city of what they are made for what they are used where the materials came from of which they are made how these are prepared and how they are transported home life under different conditions such as nationality and classes home interiors schools churches the uses of buildings and their corresponding structures thus fitting them for their uses the streets how they are named or designated how houses thereon are named or designated where bridges occur why they are there thus determining thoroughfares and principal streets by their causes the occupations of the people the productions of the city means of transportation means of communication means of lighting the city the water system of the city in its details the sewerage system which leads to a knowledge of the use of the river as a scavenger all of which knowledge with much more that cannot here be enumerated is gained by actual observation and experience and if properly done helps to lay the foundation for correct understanding of geography helps to prepare the child for the study of other cities which he has not visited but of which he may know by reading and by comparison with the facts of his own city which he has studied this group of facts should be taught thoroughly and with great care children twelve years of age are found in the city who have never seen the white house 
who do not know the relative positions of the capital and the treasury. Children, graduates of the high school, are found who have never seen the soldier's home and who do not know what it is for, who do not know how Washington is supplied with water, or understand the meaning of the name Conduit Road. Such children are not found in great numbers, but that a few have been found suggests that others may have been ill-prepared for the study of geographic text, and that perhaps all have had less preparation by contact with things than they should have had. Another group of phenomena to which the children's minds are directed, and which must be taken up systematically, consists of interesting facts having climactic causes. The children do not study them as such because they do not know what climate is. They, however, associate them in climactic categories while studying them, thus being helped to understand climate, its causes and effects logically, when later they study the subject for that purpose. They observe the coming and going of birds and note the time of year of each. They observe the birds that do not leave and the kinds of home that each species builds. They observe the coming of snow, the coming of flowers, and the lengths of the days with these times of years, and learn to associate them as correlated facts, but not as cause and effect. They are yet too young to know the distinction. This group of phenomena is large, interesting, and valuable for educative purposes. Like other groups to which I have called attention, it must be passed after alluding to it enough in detail to make its character and purpose understood to the hearer. Our children have now grown strong in their power to see, so purposive have been the steps by which their observation has been directed. They are next taken to the fields to observe the decay of rocks, the making of soil, the running of streams, the washing of hillsides, the making of valleys, the denuding of hilltops, and the numerous other phenomena which the casual, uncultivated reader does not see, cannot see, but which the student of geography should be trained to see before he is allowed to proceed further in the study. Much of this work is done in the schoolroom, involving the examination of rocks, the examination of pebbles, and the study of the causes of their forms. Miniature coal mines are made to appear in the schoolroom. The different kinds of coal are examined. The causes for the existence of different kinds of coal need not trouble us at this time. The different kinds of rock, shale, sandstone, etc., may be studied advantageously in the schoolroom. The purpose of this is to give information and especially to open the eyes of the children and to put them in proper intellectual attitude to their surroundings when, for any cause, they go into the fields or onto the hilltops. During the progress of the study of this last unit, the children learn many valuable geographic facts, facts that are valuable as interpreters in their further reading and as nuclei in their further acquisition of geographic information. Some of these are concepts of valleys, of slopes, of water divides, of drainage areas, of denuding of land surfaces, of filling of lake basins, and of changes in courses of streams. They are the geographic alphabet for further reading and investigation. Some of these lessons must be given many times because the real meaning of some of the phenomena is difficult of perception. During the progress of this series of lessons, the children handle many specimens and talk about them, make many river basins in sand and talk about them, make many miniature ranges of hills and talk about them, compound small valleys into larger ones and talk about them, gather the waters of many little streams and carry them down into one large flow to lake or ocean, define, that is bound, the smaller basins and in turn the large basins including the smaller ones, thus building in the mind concepts by means of which later in the study they may be made to understand the great basins or drainage areas of which a continent is made. During all this activity with the mind and hand, they read about subjects upon which their minds and hands are engaged, and thus learn the real meanings of words printed and correct uses of geographic terms, thus learn to get geographic information from the printed text. Our next group of work, for which the children are now prepared, is the close study of a section of country having various characteristics, first noting the different characteristics and recording them, then representing the section on the sandboard and plastic materials from the study of field notes. To do this in some cases, it is found necessary to make the sand map in the field from observation and afterward make field notes, that children may learn how to make field notes and then how to use them in the workshop or laboratory. This power comes slowly, 
but like all other acquisitions of power it comes easily if the steps are short sequential and taken often enough the next step is a representation of the section studied with pencil this representation is made from the sand map rather than directly from the section studied the next step is that of studying a wall map representing a section of country and then translating it in representation on the sand board this whole unit of work is given chiefly for the purpose of training children to see contour and other geographic facts and symbols, that is, for teaching children to interpret a map. We have thus far, if we have done our work as we have hoped to do, trained our children to such a degree that, in part at least, they can be led to understand maps and texts that describe them. They are now ready for the study of geography as found in the textbook. The last group of units constitutes the second circle of geographic work. It should be stated here that during the process of this technical geographic work, the children read much of people and places, of industries, of products, and of processes. This reading is made intelligible by the preparation of the children have had for it, and by the fact that most of it is either exemplified or illustrated in the schoolroom. The children have articles of clothing brought into the schoolroom to be examined, and to be compared with corresponding of articles of their own. They have products, both natural and manufactured, on their desks in abundance, for study, for comparison, for conversation. They have illustrations of fields, of factories, of processes. They study the changed form of materials in connection with the processes and machines by which these forms are changed. They compare the crude materials with the marketable materials and show where one kind is found in a package on the grocer's shelf and name the processes by which the transformation is made. Thus they are made ready, in a further sense, to study the geography of the world and to understand some of the very important and valuable facts which study of geography discloses to him who knows how to read properly. One purpose of the work done thus far has been that of training the imagination of the child. If he goes from home, he sees other cities and compares them with his own, for which comparison he has been prepared. He sees hills, valleys, streams, plains, and other phenomena, which he interprets by that which he learned in his home study by comparing the two. If he does not travel from home, he takes journeys in imagination, for books are put into his hands for that purpose. He thus, in his imagination, visits other cities in distant states. These he finds on river banks or by the seaside. He sees ranges of hills, valleys, mountains, streams, dams, canals, factories, he witnesses processes and examines products in every step of which comparison is made and conclusions drawn. In this work, too, he is trained to estimate distances by comparing the unknown with the known, thus getting some adequate conception of direction and space. The children are now strong enough to look upon the world as a whole. They are acquainted with much of the phenomenon resulting from the facts that the earth is spherical and that it resolves on its axis. They undoubtedly know these facts also for an intelligent teacher could not thus long instruct children without being forced to tell them of these facts. They now, therefore, are to be acquainted with the globe representing the earth and its surface. They learn the grand land divisions of the earth and its chief water divisions, and learn the relations of each to all the others. Learn of the relative size of each, and approximately as nearly as they can be made to understand, the actual size of each in extreme breadth and length. They learn some facts of climate, without special study, of course, further than that derived from a knowledge of the relation of the axis of the earth to the plane of its orbit. This gives the opportunity for teaching belts or zones, and as far as it is taught at all, it is taught with accuracy. Now the children's knowledge of plants and animals and kinds of people about which they have been learning may be further enlarged, and each kind or group of facts related to its appropriate belt or zone home. The continents and oceans may be located in zone belts or climatic homes, and plants, animals, and men located in their respective parts of continents or oceans, thus correlating the old, or that which was previously learned, with the new. Thus may the learner see the globe divided into land and water, related to heat and cold, possessed of life, distributed by climatic causes, possessing characteristics consistent with and lives induced by such causes. The children are now prepared to study geography as the home of man, and as the result of man's skill and efforts. Study geography by states, by civilizations, 
by socialistic phenomena, by economic phenomena. State lines may be made to mean something to the children now. Great and important lines of commerce may be fixed easily, because the children find out not only where they exist, but why they are there. But before these are studied in their detail, it is desirable to study the consonant in its special structure of mountain ranges and consequent basins or drainage areas. For this, the children have been prepared by their previous work. To prevent making this part of my subject too long and too tedious, I will say that North America is studied physically, in which connection it is studied historically also, so that national lines or divisions are seen to move back and forth and finally become fixed by physical causes when such exist, as is the case frequently. The relations of these states are studied historically and politically. Commercial centers of commerce are fixed definitely, and the reasons for their location are ascertained either in history or in physical causes or in both. The character, value, and extent of commerce of each city are definitely studied. The relations of same are discovered, and means by which such commerce is carried on are definitely known. The character of the people, their industries, their habits of life are studied in each country. Comparisons are made, and conclusions are drawn, and causes are sought, and sometimes, if not in all cases, ascertained. Natural products and manufactured products and articles of dress are studied. Other articles, as of warfare or husbandry, showing conditions and habits of life, are brought into the schoolroom and examined and discussed. The imaginations of the children are called on in picturing the lives and homes of the people of these countries in comparison with their own lives and their own homes. The cultivation of the imagination is helped by the use of pictures and by the reading of texts describing and narrating, by reading tales and poems, the result of which is tested from time to time by the writing of essays and the representation in graphic form of what is in the minds of the children. During the progress of this study, the children are made to know how to get to these centers of commercial life. Thus do the children learn the relation of each state of the continent to the other states. To say that they learn of steamboat lines and railroad lines and telegraph lines and express companies is unnecessary. These are taught necessarily, but as a means, not as an end. Now the children are to study the United States as an entirety in a corresponding way, the details of which need not here be given. It should be said, however, that the states are grouped by physical characteristics and climatic conditions, which in turn help to group them according to productions and industries and resources, which in turn enable us to determine the character and occupations of the people in large belts or sections, and at the same time to locate commercial centers. Now we have only to get the connecting links between these commercial centers, or in other words, the ways and processes of communication and transportation. Then we have a good general view of the United States and of the people of the United States, where they are and what they are doing. Details in great number are avoided. The definite locality of important places is insisted on, as well as the means of communication by land and water between such important places. The geographic history of the states and their cities having been learned at the outset. We are now prepared to look again from the United States out on the continent and get the governmental relations between the states of the continent and the United States as a whole, as well as with large commercial centers of the United States. And the child is led to see lines of communication, freighted with commerce and human life, stretching between cities of different states, each end of which is guarded by representatives from other states. The child is made to know why such guards are placed there, and what some other prerogatives are. It will be seen that this is the geography of man and his doings, and not the geography of state line boundaries and locations of capital cities and their sizes. The relativity of the values of industries, of the values of products, of the areas of states, of the populations of states, of the sizes of cities, of the industries of the cities, etc., are studied and represented in graphic form for comparison, innumerable examples of which may be found in our schools at the proper time of year. Now, before South America is studied, we need to know a little more about the causes of climate, many of the results of climate having been taken on faith without having had recourse to their causes. Some physical phenomena of the United States would have been better understood had the children known better the climatic causes. Such causes, however, it is believed, are too difficult for them to master at the time of their development when the facts were learned. The children are now stronger. The climate of South America and its resulting effects are a little more difficult to understand than those of North America. 
partly because they are farther from home, so we give a little study of the trade winds, their causes and effects, and try to give an understanding, if not of the causes, certainly of the existence of the Gulf Stream and its effect on climate, which prepares the children for the study of South America in a way corresponding to that in which they studied North America. It may be stated in passing that South America is studied largely in its commercial relations to the commercial centers of the United States. The people, of course, demand a large part of our effort in the study of this country. In point of quantity, the study of South America is very small compared with that of North America or even of the United States. Now Europe is studied in a corresponding way, but Europe is more difficult to study than South America. The geographic history of North and South America is easily obtained and easily remembered because of its sequential character and because of its relation to our present condition. The historical geography of Europe, however, is long and complicated. Not much of it, therefore, is attempted. The causes of climate, however, are studied and physical reasons for present state lines are considered. Europe is studied by representative nations in their relation to the United States and representative commercial centers of the United States. In this study, the locations of commercial centers are definitely fixed and means of communication are considered and learned. Of course, the people are studied and their lives, habits, and industries are considered. To accomplish these ends, we study the habits of their representatives among us and ascertain their home life and fatherland by studying the causes of their coming here. Their manufactures are brought into the schoolroom and studied by comparison with our own. The location of some of the representatives in this country is ascertained. The location of some of our representatives in their country is ascertained. The result of having such representatives in two countries is ascertained to some extent. Thus the children are made to know, as far as they are able to understand, the governmental, the social, and the commercial relations existing between the great centers of Europe and those of America. And while learning them, they are led to consider their causes and their effects upon our lives and upon our industries, and thus they come to know how man is making and changing geography. Now, Asia, Africa, and Oceanica are studied, but to only a limited degree by comparison with Europe, or even by comparison with South America, because there is not time to study them more. The purpose of teaching geography in the school, as it has been before stated, is to train the children how to study it. It is not possible to teach anything exhaustively. It is not desirable. We have trained children to see that an interesting purpose of their work in school is the knowledge of the geography of man, of what he is, of what he has been, of what he is doing, and of how he is related to the activities of the world and to the ever and constantly changing geographic phenomenon of the world. Later in the school course, if I may speak definitely, in the eighth grade, the children have a study of the essential outlines of physical geography from a logical and scientific standpoint, during which study there is opportunity for relegating the vast amount of phenomenon with which they have become acquainted during their study of geography into categorical series and thus classifying them sequentially and logically. I must not omit one other point. I have stated from time to time that their children do much reading from standard authors, accounts of travels, descriptions of people and of countries, expositions of processes, etc., which they are able to understand because of the character of their preparation for such reading, namely, their contact with things firsthand. I have stated also that the teacher and children avail themselves of charts and maps and pictures or graphic representations, almost without number or limit, for the purpose of explanation, elaboration, or more definite view, some schoolrooms being veritable museums or picture galleries. For instance, when a city like London or Philadelphia is being studied, these pictures hang side by side with Washington pictures, with which they are being compared. But there is one other class of reading for which we have been preparing our children, which without this preparation could not be appreciated by them, even if it could be made intelligible to them. I mean pure literature that has for a part of its contents facts of nature, all of which when properly studied is a part of the study of geography. I do not refer to that valuable literature used largely in getting information of which I have spoken so much in this paper. As for that instance by Bayard Taylor in his accounts of other lands, Washington Irving in tales of travel such as his voyages, Italian scenes, descriptions of London, John Burroughs in his fascinating accounts of animals and their haunts and other similar authors. This is studied as a means of getting information. 
I refer to a body of pure literature, whose office is to please and cultivate rather than to instruct. Alhambra by Moonlight, a description of Niagara, a description of a storm at sea, Oliver Wendell Holmes's Chambered Nautilus, Gray's Elegy in a Country Churchyard, Whittier's Barefoot Boy, Bryant's Waterfowl, and Proctor's The Sea represent this literature. I thought the sparrow's note from heaven, singing at dawn on a tire alder bough. I brought him home, in his nest at even. He sings a song, but it pleases not now. For I did not bring home the river and sky. He sang to my ear, they sang to my eye. One must get close to nature and know it well, must learn much of birds and flowers, must commune with a river and sky as a lover, to understand how Mr. Emerson could see them in the enchanting part of bird song. Ye banks and brides, O oh bonny doon, how can ye bloom so fresh and fair? How can ye chant, ye little birds, and I so weary, so full of care? No dictionary can define for the student this most masterful contrast of English tongue. No grammar or rhetoric explain it. No eloquent master develop it. He alone can know and feel its full force, who, though life may have given to him the darkest sorrow, knows by experience of the caroling of birds, of flowery banks, of chattering brooks, and of carpeted meadowlands, stretching to shaded nooks in the hillside beyond. A large part, not the larger part, of our literature can be understood and appreciated only by him who has been properly prepared to study geography aright. How many men and women, how many students, read such literature only as words? This body of literature is to be studied and classified and known by authors as literature proceeding from a knowledge and love of nature. End of section 20